Yay, we are Yay, live. We're live. <laughs> All right. So uh, we are live with the second annual. I guess this is two. It's been, we're, this is two. So it is now a second annual. We, did, we didn't know if we were going to do one this year, but we snuck it in right under the wire. Second annual online writers convention. I haven't talked to you, Nick, in I think like a year <laughs> after talking to you for literally every day for like two months to get this thing started. So like, how crazy. you been, buddy? I love your beard. I, thank you. I've been doing well. Uh, hanging in there. Wordsmith Writing Coaches has been uh, doing some some different things, more and more stuff online. I I hesitate to mention it to you, but I I have a YouTube channel that actually has videos on it. Nice. And you know, I have gonna, that, that's what the thing you were doing last time, like a year ago. You wanted to build it up, so you've been doing that. So there was like a a thirteen month hiatus, which I apologized for in a video. Like I actually posted a video saying you know, I'm not sure how well this is going. So, and then 13 months later, I started posting videos. So I've got like four new videos up there and I've got four more in the pipeline. Nice. So um, as a matter of fact, I one of them should have posted just yesterday. I did the thing where you can <clears throat> schedule it to post later, which cool. is the first time I've ever used that tool. So I am still very, very new to the whole YouTube platform. So I'm still learning, but if anybody wants to go and like watch someone who is an old hand at many things that have nothing to do with video, <laughs> making a fool of himself on video. That's me, but I'm having a great time doing it and awesome. I'm keeping my videos short so I don't bore people. So Wonderful. there's that. I love it. I love it. I love it. So um, uh, let us talk about today. Uh, cause this is a little bit different than last time, last time. Well, it's kind of the same and kind of different. Like we have a definite theme this time. Last time was kind of, uh, soup to nuts, like from start from like your idea to your book to like delivery of your book. It was big. It was big. It was, it was awesome, big. but it was, it was exhausting. Yes, <laughs> we started with like, so you've got this idea. What are you going to do with this idea? How do you develop this idea? And we went all the way through the entire process to like, great now your book is published how do you now what do you do and first year and we're going to go over a little bit of that uh so, i mean we're going to come at it differently but some of the things that we talked about in the first online writers conference we're going to go over again but we're going to go over it in in greater depth and more detail and i'm really looking forward to to all the things that we're going to talk about today and the things that we're going to learn uh from our guests um yeah so today is going to be much more focused on like launching your book so if you want to hear about uh uh making your book we had a very lovely, the day one of our writers conference last year was all about like idea through delivery of like the actual manuscript. And then day two was kind of about like after your manuscript kind of getting ready, doing PR and a little bit of stuff. But like, yeah, well, once we, you've written it, like the, right. like the first day was all about how do you just, just write it, just write the thing make right. the thing finish the thing how many people russell start i mean in your experience i can tell you from my experience because that's like they call me when they fall into despair they start writing a book they want to write a book they've got a dream to write a book and they start writing the book or maybe they can't start but they don't oh my gosh how many people have a dream of writing a book and never actually write the book very so, a lot a lot a lot a lot a lot so that so, that's so the, the first that's, day was all on that yeah but that's that so today we're we're gonna make an assumption that like you've written a book like you've written a book you've kind of like you've got a cover you've got a blurb you've got like a, a, the look inside and you're like ready to be like all right i'm a couple months out from launch whether it's on kickstarter we are going to emphasize kickstarter here and my, and mine and monica's new book uh, crush it on Kickstarter. Not sorry. That's not the name of the book. That's the name of my course. <laughs> the name of the book is get your book selling on Kickstarter, which you can get at kickstarternovel.com. Um, but we're going to kind of, the thing about Kickstarter is it's kind of another way to launch a book, but like most of the prep work is very similar. Um, you don't so much have to, you have to do a little more work to get people like amped up for Kickstarter specifically, because a lot of people don't know what that is. 
but like a lot of the prep and a lot of the everything is the same but we are going to go specifically through like building a page on kickstarter developing rewards and and some things but this and I, i'm hour, not even sure if everybody understands all the things that go into launching a book in general much right. less launching it on kickstarter so i think it's going to be good that we go over all the things yeah, absolutely. So um, the first hour, we're going to bring in uh, my wonderful uh, writing partner for uh, for this book, Monica Leonel, who is also the publisher of the series. Uh, and we're going to talk about prepping a book, like prepping a, a book launch. And then uh, we are going to talk about, I got to go to the page because uh, I got to find who we're, who we're talking to. Uh, uh, I, I had it pulled up and then I accidentally deleted that page. Uh, so oh, the second hour, we're going to bring on, um, my dear friends, Krishan Keller Hanna and RJ Blaine to talk about sort of building a campaign page and they've amazing on Kickstarter. Um, they use it in very different ways. So we'll talk about that. Um, and then we're going to move into, uh, uh, talking with my dear friend, uh, Desiree Duffy, who's. But Nick's Nick and my dear friend Desiree Duffy and my friend Melissa Storm Yay, about sort of preparing for the launch week because that's the most important sort of that's like how you know your book's going to go well is sort of how well it goes how well your first week goes kind of determines a lot it's not everything it's not like a, a lost cause if you don't launch well but if you if you launch well it's going to do a whole lot to to do it because it probably means you've been prepared properly uh, and then um, Monica's going to come back with Nick. And uh, we're going to talk sort of about maintaining momentum. So Nick's Nick's going to be with us the first hour, and Monica's going to be with us the first hour, and then uh, I, they're going to go away because I planned this the last minute, and uh, <laughs> they're going to come back on for the last hour and join me about about building momentum. Uh, but uh, I think now, but I, I think time. Monica and I are going to be quietly in the background watching and listening during the second and third hour. I know I'm going to be taking notes. Because I, mean, I you need, are, you are I need more to than know welcome. You are more than welcome to stay. You and Monica can stay for as long as you want, but like you are not committed to staying for longer than like the two hours that we're here. So now um, I'm going to bring on Monica because enough about talking about like what we're going to talk about. Um, we're going to talk, bring on Monica and talk about preparing for a book launch. Boop. Hi, Monica. Hi, how's it going? Hey, Monica's here. It's going so well. Now we can really get started. Oh, <laughs> yes. Monica's here. Okay, we're uh, good. <laughs> I guess we just kind of jumped in, assuming that everyone knows who uh, Nick and I are. But maybe, Monica, uh, introduce yourself, then we'll do Nick, and then I'll do a in little introduction at the end, and then we can start uh, start talking. So, Monica, tell us about yourself a little bit. Sure. My name is Monica Leonel. I'm probably best known for my series called The Productive Novelist, which um, kind of like you were talking about just now, takes you step by step through like outlining, um, writing faster, writing habits, um, you know, editing, publishing, all of those things. Hello, Jillian. Um, so, so great that you're able to be here. Um, so yeah, uh, that's, that's kind of my core series and it's sold about 60,000 copies of, over probably like five, five plus years. Um, so now Russell and I have a new series called Book Sales Supercharged, which is where our Kickstarter book falls. It's um, called Get Your Book Selling on Kickstarter. The series also goes through getting your book selling on a lot of other platforms as well. So like there's one that's like Get Your Book Selling on Amazon. There's one that's Get Your Book Selling on uh, Apple Books and so on. And so we're trying to do a deep dive into each platform. And the Kickstarter one, um, we wanted to really celebrate the um, that particular book. Uh, we have five other books in the series already available on retailers, but we wanted to celebrate the Kickstarter book on Kickstarter. So that's why we are um, doing the Kickstarter, which is going very well. And I'm sure we'll, we'll chat about um, some of the stuff around that during this. Uh, but yeah, it's at kickstartyournovel.com. And awesome. uh, just quickly, like these are all the books that we have. So like while, well, Monica has, I help with some of the books. But, <laughs> he helped with like, many of them. <laughs> but Monica, Monica has, has developed like basically all of, if you want to sell on something, um, except maybe uh, subscriptions, like, like Patreon, uh, we have, there's a book for it. Oh, I'll yeah. bet that's coming. Monica, yeah, could, I, I would love to be. read your book about <laughs> subscriptions. Yeah, uh, I, I'm, I'm getting a lot of questions these days about, um, you know, should I publish on Medium? Should I publish on Substack? 
And of course, you know, there's the always the questions about Wattpad, which might be the right publishing platform for you if you really don't care about making money. Maybe Wattpad is for you. I don't know. Well, there is a book on fiction apps. Mm -hmm. There's not. Yeah, there is. Yes. Uh, 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 the, the other thing, me and Monica, I've been meaning to talk about off uh, off camera because I've been getting a lot of questions about specifically Patreon and Substack yeah. and all of that stuff and where it fits into this combination yeah. of things. But like, that's a story for another day. So um, Nick, do you want to talk a little bit about who you are? Yeah, so my name is Nick Nelson. I am the catalyst and the head coach of Wordsmith Writing Coaches. Oh, look, I'm wearing the shirt, Wordsmith Writing Coaches. I need to get a better camera so you can read it. <laughs> but um, so I, <clears throat> Wordsmith Writing Coaches started out in 2004 um, as a service for people who were writing their doctoral dissertations and having trouble uh, with the dissertation process and finishing that. So, so we started out in the academic world and uh, some of our academic clients were writing um, uh, trade publication books on the side, either nonfiction books or um, writing a children's book series that was you know, inspired by their doctoral research. And so they, I, you know, they didn't know anybody in the publishing world and they loved working with us. So they came back to us and said, hey, it's not academic, but could you edit my children's book for me? Or could you edit my, my how-to book for me or whatever? So we started doing book editing and we thought, well, since we're editing people's books, we should probably learn about this whole book thing. So, um, and also I myself, at that time uh, was also a, a freelance uh, author. Uh, I wrote a lot of magazine articles. I've published, oh my gosh, more than 150 magazine articles in different places like Forbes and Business Insider and Huffington Post and, uh, and you know, odd little places too, like um, the um, LA County Bicycle Coalition and um, stuff like that, city gates. <clears throat> so, um, so, so I knew a lot about the, and I also, I had run magazines in the past. So I, and literary magazines and things. So I understood that side of thing, but um, between 2006 and 2016, um, what Wordsmith Writing Coaches, we learned a lot about the book publishing industry and, and what it means to, to write a book and how to, how to tell your story well and publish wisely. So that became our slogan, tell your story well and publish wisely. And if you're having trouble doing that, we can help you. Awesome. And then I am Russell Nolte. I am a US Today bestselling author who's raised over $250,000 on Kickstarter is the thing that I'm most known for. Um, I've been a full-time author since 2015. I've done a lot of courses through my old site, The Complete Creative, and me and Mo and uh, late last year, uh, me and Monica talked about sort of incorporating a lot of my old teachings and old courses into her new series, uh, Book Sales Supercharged, and I loved the idea. I've never had, I have two nonfiction books, but like they're kind of these all-encompassing things, and they've never been these sort of hyper focused places and also i've had a lot of courses that uh, are very expensive and i've never been put into like book form because i'm lazy and uh i have a lot of stuff going on and so monica said i can take kind of all of these hundreds maybe thousands of hours of things that you've accumulated over the years plus like new pieces of writing that you're doing and videos you record and like kind of put them into pieces of my series and so they'd be available much more targeted to the people that need them. And I thought that was a great idea. Monica, to me, is uh, the foremost expert in like book and like in like make in, in, in fiction and like nonfiction publishing and like this series of like, here is here is all you need to know in this like long series of everything. But like you can just pick out the things like what I love about her books is is like you want to learn about how to be productive and like how to be more productive or write 5,000 words an hour or, 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 or a day. You're like, there's, there, there it is. And like, there's no fluff of other stuff. It's just like that 
thing. Whereas a lot of people have said of my work before, like, I just want to know like about Kickstarter, just stop with like, I, I don't want to read the whole book. I just want the Kickstarter book. So I'm super excited uh, about uh, 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 get your book selling on Kickstarter. Which... Well, and I, I just need to interrupt you for a second there. Uh, just uh, another bit of context between me and Russell. Since 2015 or 2016, I've actually referred. I I mean, if you're here because you're following me, you know I talk about Russell all the time. <laughs> and I, I re recommend his books and courses and things uh, because he does these, these you know, deep dives into things. But he also does really broad, like, like here's the whole caboodle you know, summarized for you in, in one giant piece well, that yes. maybe is a little too broad. So. <laughs> but so we have, we, so I think uh, the, the thesis statement that I'm making is that we're making is like, we know about book launches. Monica has launched an infinite number. Like we tried to, to, to put this, uh, we had did a video yesterday and we tried to like figure out and it was just, just like, it's too many. It's just, it's a lot. It's, a, <laughs> it's, it's way more than I can think about right now. Mm -hmm. um, right. Yeah, definitely. I think between books and courses, like I, I, I know I have um, over 40 books and, and I write fiction as well. So some of that is on that side. And then, gosh, I don't even know how many courses over the years or like, you know, and it's then you kind of like consulting or like right. whatever. Yeah, we've done a lot. We've done a lot of launches. Is the point. Yeah, a lot and, of launches. And yeah. so by, by the end of this, hopefully you'll have a good sense of like what it takes to launch a book. And again, just if you have if you have questions, uh, please put them in the comments of wherever you're watching us and we will do our best to answer them. I only ask you make it relevant to the hour that we're talking about. So um, if you have about preparing your book launch in any respect, we're going to talk about the launch week a little bit later. But if you have questions about preparing for overall a book launch, then this is the time to ask them. Um, I'm going to throw it to you, Monica, because you we you just did this like literally yeah. this week. We did our book, uh, 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 Kickstart Your Novel on Tuesday. It's uh, uh, at, to kickstartyournovel.com. We, we launched it on Tuesday. And so can you talk a little bit about like the pieces that you put in place before you launched a book and sort of like yeah. the best practices? Yeah, I mean, I think like just speaking broadly, when you're thinking of a launch, you really want to know like two things that helps you create the third thing. And so the, the first thing is that you need to know um, what the trajectory of your launch should look like for the platform, for the platform's algorithms, and um, just like what's expected. So like on Amazon, you know, you want like seven days of um, consistent sales at like about the same level right and so then you can scale up and down on those specific numbers so maybe you can only do 50 sales and, and we'll, we'll talk about how to figure that out maybe you can only do 50 sales a day that's that would be a lot by the way um you know and then when you look at kickstarter um that was that, that was a piece that i did not have that russell like knows extremely well and he was able to give me exact numbers that we needed to hit and so once i understood that then I understood the trajectory of Kickstarter as well. So, um, and so you want to know like, what does that curve look like? You know, if it's a, if it's on a retailer, it's probably sales that you're looking at for Kickstarter. It's specifically, um, you know, we, we talked about the backer trajectory and then we talked about the, uh, the money tra trajectory. Cause those are the two metrics that are going up. So then the second thing you need is you need to know all the sources of traffic, like uh, relevant traffic, I guess, that you are going to send to this launch um, and, you know, roughly how much those things are. And so we talk about this in our book. Um, it's called the five, it's 5B five times three, um, which is the one that I did for uh for like retailers, but we kind of translate it to the Kickstarter book. And so the five B's are the things that belong to you. So this would be like, you know, like your, your current email list, like your Facebook friends or, you know, whatever social media you have. So you want to like, basically what we're going to do is make an inventory of your traffic. So it's like things that belong to you, things that you want to build. You're always going to build something during a launch. Um, you should always be building something during a launch that is going to support your career and support your next launch. Um, and Russell's really great at that, by the way. Um, I know from talking to him about his Kickstarters, they're always building something bigger. Um, and he's always building for the future. So um, belongs to you. Uh, 
I talk, said build, borrow is like who you're gonna who you're gonna cross promote with, who you're gonna swap with. Um, buzz is really about like any sort of vi viral triggers or you know psychological triggers that you can add to it to create excitement. Um, again, Kickstarter is a, a great place to learn to understand buzz because I think on retailers it's a little bit harder um, to really understand like what is buzz and then um, it would be thing then the last B is buy. So things that you would buy, like advertising, um, you know, paid newsletters, advertising, CPC clicks, whatever. Um, but basically, those are the five Bs. And so you would look at your launch. Um, so you got to know the trajectory, like how many sales do I need at this hour, this day, blah, blah, blah. And your goal is to match your traffic. You make your inventory of your traffic to the launch and come up with some sort of schedule. Um, to match that. And that is your marketing plan, your launch plan for the platform, for the project and whatever. And then I think like Russell said, um, you know, the, the, the thing that Russell told me was he said, you know, for this Kickstarter, because this was my first Kickstarter. And, you know, we talked yesterday about like my fears and stuff. So you can go look at that video if you want. Um, but yeah, when we did the Kickstarter, it was like, um, I mean, he basically said, like, we're going to know how it's going to go regarding the trajectory once we launch. He's like, we can't know anything before we launch. Once we launch, we'll be able to see, like, are we hitting this benchmark? Are we hitting this benchmark? And I think every book launch is the same. So you just want to see, like, are you hitting the benchmarks? And then um, if you're not hitting the benchmarks, that's when you start to look at your traffic and, you know, your traffic sources and you readjust. And so you like start to move stuff around in your schedule as your launch goes. So that's, that's what I would say is like the pre-launch, um, pre-launch schedule or pre-launch prep. Um, that's the most important thing to do. And then, you know, the other pre-launch stuff is, um, probably what we'll talk about for the rest of this, which is like, you got to like go and do all the work now. <laughs> like once you have that schedule, you got to like, okay, now you got to write the sales page. Now you got to do this. You got to do that. So. Well, Nick, all of that made sense to me, but this is my world. <laughs> uh, you are, you are not the mar a marketing like head. So I'm really uh, not. <laughs> how much of that made sense to you? And where can we, uh, where can we expand out? Because like, I think there's so much, there was so much good in there in five minutes that it literally could be an hour that we expand out just on that. So like, so like, what do you got, Nick? Uh, I, how, how, I, I was, I was how taking notes. Oh, and nice. also if you out there who are listening, uh, yes. didn't understand part of that, then like, please, this is the time to like ask the question so that we can expand out. We don't want to like, you could literally spend your whole pre-launch period just doing this part and like, mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 yeah. and it would lead to a way better launch for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so one of the reasons I'm here, Monica, is because I, I, I know a lot of facts and stories about marketing, but I am not a marketing guy. Um, so um, I am here to represent all of you out there who are really struggling to just understand exactly what Monica just said. So, <laughs> so, so one of the challenges that non-marketers like myself have is that uh, there are certain words, like terms that are used that like those are common words in English and we don't know exactly what you're talking about, okay? So things like <clears throat> sources of relevant traffic. Now, I have hung out with, with uh, Russell long enough that I've learned a lot of these words, words like trajectory and sources of relevant traffic and, and you know, cross promotion and psychological triggers. Like, like um, so just, you know, maybe TMI about myself. I'm not neurotypical. And so um, in my world, when people talk about psychological triggers, we're talking about something that we really need to avoid. And, um, you know, I have four things that I absolutely need to keep out of my life as much as possible, right? But you're not talking about that kind of psychological trigger when you're talking about building buzz. These are like positive triggers. But let me, let me just, but before we get into those details, um, one of the most important things that you said was you talked about having a trajectory and then you said it so quickly. I think people may have missed it. <clears throat> there's a trajectory and then there's also a calendar. 
-hmm. that you that you talked about. So yeah. tell us a little bit more about the difference between like like I can help my clients come up with a good trajectory, but then figuring out the calendar, that's when I would have them call Russell. So help me help us understand yeah. that. Yeah. Um, okay. So I don't know, Russell, if you want to, if you're okay with us, you know, sharing. Yeah, just do it, doing whatever. Numbers. I mean, we can, we're, we're, uh, I mean, the more that we share, I believe the more people hopefully will want to buy the book. So like, yeah. let's, uh, okay. let's yeah. go deep into and, whatever and, you need to right. do. Well, and we'll and, and may I point that. out that Jillian St. Kevin <laughs> actually wants you to say it all again, because she's taking notes and there are gaps <laughs> oh. in her noting. So, so yeah, well, I mean, can I talk a little bit about the trajectory yeah. of a Kickstarter yeah, yeah, launch please, generally please, at the please, beginning? Please, yeah. And this is most launches. So Amazon mm -hmm. is a little bit different, uh, but most launches, if you do, you're going to have a really, uh, the, a, a huge amount of the traffic is going to come in the first two days. So traffic being people coming to your page, like, because when you launch a page, everyone who's excited for it is going to go. And nobody has ever been to this page before, except for like the, the few people that like are looking at it beforehand. So you are going to get all of the people that are super excited, all of the buzz that Monica talks about before the launch are all going to slam at you at once. And how and and the algorithm that Monica was talking about is kind of how any AI, how any website will like determine whether your campaign is worth pushing or not. Mm -hmm. And Kickstarter has a lot more uh, manual uh, manual uh, triggers to, that people can use to push it than most places, but it still has like, if you shoot up real quickly and if, and like you're, if there's five, 200, if there's a hundred uh, books and you can launch past 80 of them at the beginning, people are going to be able to see your campaign before scrolling very much. And it's going to sort of have this benefit of moving you further and further and further up. So you have this big smash the first couple of days where your campaign's going to go and go and go and go. And you hope a really good campaign will keep that momentum for five days. So mm -hmm. our campaign has kind of maintained momentum for uh, already. And we're hoping to keep it going further than that. But like to me, you can you can maintain it real well for five days and after there it's kind of like fingers crossed but what happens after that is your campaign will settle at a place and the higher that it goes up the more people are talking about it, the more people are backing the more excited people are over the campaign the higher you will get per day so like let's say if you raised a thousand dollars the first three days you might only tr be tracking at maybe making twenty dollars a day in the middle of that gap but if you're making $10,000 the first few days, because there's just more people talking about it, there's more interest, there's more excitement, the tail ends up being higher. So you might be making $100 a day. And then there's another gap. There's another bump at the top. So what you're trying to do those first few days is get as many people excited as possible so that when you settle down into sort of, they call it the, um, uh, the, the dead zone, it settles just as high as possible. And then you get a big bump at the end too. So does that make sense, Nick? The dead zone sounds horrible, but so <laughs> it, it does make sense. So I just want to like recap something that you said <clears throat> in the way that I understand it. So if I'm wrong, guys, jump in and tell me I'm wrong, right? But <clears throat> one of the reasons why um, Russell and other people use the word trajectory to describe this is because it's not... It's not like Russell is saying, oh, you should do it this way. This is my plan for you. What Russell is saying is, is this is a pattern that is common to Kickstarter campaigns. Mm -hmm. Like, in other words, if you, I, oh my gosh, like I'm not an expert here, but I've taken Russell's courses and, and read his posts and everything. And so I just like tell people, well, Russell says, but I've, I've told my clients over the years uh, when they say, oh, I'm going to do this on Kickstarter. I'm like, okay, great. Step one, take Russell's course, which they don't do. And so I have to try to explain it to them like second or third hand, right? So, so I'll tell them, you got to do all this prep work ahead of time so that you can start well. And they, they don't do it. And so they, but they think in their minds, well, you know, I see this thing where it's, you know, big first day and then it levels out and then maybe there are some spikes at the end if you do it right. And they think to themselves, well, I'm going to do my Kickstarter differently. 
I'm just going to go ahead and get started and then tell everyone about it. And my Kickstarter trajectory is going to look like this. It's going to start out with no one knows about it and then people will discover me. And then I'm going to make my goal on the last three days. And I tell them, that's not how it works. Like, that's, that's not, like, you can't make up, like, th there's going to be a pattern to this. And so what Russell is saying here is that there's a pattern. So if you don't do the prep work ahead of time and you open with 30 people, like if 30 people is the first you know, day and it tails off to like one or two people discovering it over the next five days, it's like you have, you've set the momentum of your campaign very low in the very beginning. And it's going to be difficult or impossible to change it after that. But there's a second thing going on here, I think, which you can correct me on. The second thing is, um, so you're talking about triggers. I wanted to just bring this up and have you guys talk about this for a moment. Manual triggers is the word you used. And I know that there are also automatic triggers. So what I want people to understand is that, um, so, when you're doing this launch, there's you, the person launching, and hopefully you've got a team of friends or people who are you know on there with you. Woohoo. And then there's all these people who you're reaching out to with your launch, but there's a third party in this, and that is the platform itself. So for example, when you're launching a book on Amazon, um, you're doing the launching, you're trying to reach the people, but Amazon is watching an algorithm at least anyway, yeah. is watching. And so Amazon is looking to see whether certain interesting things happen. And the algorithm will, like if you do certain things in Amazon, you trigger certain responses automatically in the Amazon algorithm. And it sounds like there's also an automatic trigger on Kickstarter where like you were saying something about if the, for the first day, the first five days, like, the Kickstarter algorithms will watch that and say, oh, holy cow, this had a lot of traffic. And then Kickstarter, independently of whatever you are doing, Kickstarter will be like, oh, we should show this to people who are interested in this category because it's it is it's a likable thing. We should show this. We want people to like the things that we show them. And here's a thing that people like. We should show it to people. Is that accurate? Yeah, I would say that's accurate. Um with then the I, I want to learn more about the manual <laughs> triggers because okay. I just described automatic triggers to you guys. So but manual triggers, I'm more, but anyway, yeah, but go yeah. ahead, Monica. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean no to. worries. Um, yeah, I would say that's, um, that is that is pretty much the idea of what we're talking about with the caveat that Amazon is way better at algorithms than any other platform on the planet, basically besides Google. So Amazon's algorithms are very sophisticated. Um, you look at like, Kickstarter's algorithms or, you know, Apple Books algorithms, there, there's like a lot more manual stuff like kick, like um, Russell was saying. Like with Apple Books, for example, there's a lot of merchandising that they still have like a team doing. And it's kind of the same with Kickstarter, which is a good thing in that, um, so, so there are probably some algorithms, but it's a good thing in that, you know, you can kind of um, build relationships with people, you know, people on the platform, like other creators on the platform, you can build relationships uh, with the platform itself, possibly. Um, I know you can do so at Apple Books. I know Russell has done so at Kickstarter. And that can be really helpful to you to get visibility within the platform. So, yeah, but Russell, that, Russell will have to talk more the, the manual well, to, stuff. But to move that with manual triggers is the automatic triggers also are, like the reason that the automatic triggers exist is because they correspond to manual triggers. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if you launch and the first day you made $5,000, like people are going to say, oh, wow, people like this campaign and be more likely to buy your mm -hmm. book because there's more people backing it. Also, if you can, so like if there's a hundred people backing, generally there's very few that are like, like it's, it, 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 most people are at the bottom. Like, 60 or 70 people are kind of like in the like in the same range maybe 80 or 90 people are kind of in the same range and like there's a very few people that are bumped at the top and your goal is to bump to the top because ma the manual trigger without even putting any of the buying or scarcity or any of that stuff just saying oh like you already are ahead of these people who are raising 500 or 200 or whatever dollars just by bumping you up 
like you're going to be ahead and your people are going to see you first. And that will create a virtual sales, virtuous sales cycle where more people are going to back you, more people are going to find you. And all of those manual. Uh, so that is one manual trigger of just success. Yeah. Breed success. Breed success. As, yes. I was going to say as, that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, as, as, as kind of like trite as it sounds like it's yeah. true. It's true. Any the, 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 pro, the, the, the thing that we struggle with, speaking for all the people in the comments here, the thing we struggle, like we get it, success breeds success. So like, I want to find the button labeled success and go, yeah. push the button over oh, and over again. Kind of one. There is kind of there one on Kickstarter. One. There is yeah. kind Tell of one. Tell me all about it. Okay, so there. Be, when you when you launch, you want to talk about the pre-launch page? Are we on the same page? Like that's what we're that's that, yeah. that's what I was thinking. Is that what you're yes, thinking? Yes, go go to the pre-launch. Uh, go page. for it. Go for it, Monica. I've been talking too oh. much. Um, okay, so we did the pre-launch page. Um, so the, and this is a new newish feature at Kickstarter, as I understand it. Again, this is my first Kickstarter, so I didn't really know. But um, you know, we actually so we kind of um, didn't do as much as we could have during the pre-launch, which was just. I, it was basically like I had never done a Kickstarter before. So I didn't know like all the things we could do. Now that I know, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do like really, really, you know, I, I'm going to do better next time because I understand this. So, you know, I think your first Kickstarter, well, well, we will give you the, you know, you'll have the book hopefully. Um, so you'll know some of the stuff, but this, knowing stuff is not the same as doing it. So right. there's that. So, okay. Yeah. So yeah, the pre-launch page is like, um, Basically, you get your uh, you get your project approved, and then they give you a pre-launch page, and people can get notified uh, when the Kickstarter is live. And what that does is it actually sends emails to the people who are um, following your page. It sends them at the beginning, it sends them at the end, and so the more people that you have with that early notification. The better. So I think we had, you know, around 150, 175. Um, now we're around like 250 because you you can actually get notified throughout the whole campaign. So any anybody who hits the notification button on our page now, uh, you will start to get emails at the end when it's uh, closing. And so that so I mean, we can I'll just throw this in here. Um, most platforms they only have like the beginning of the launch. Um, Kickstarter is unique in that it also has an end of the uh, an end date. Um, so there's like some cool algorithmic stuff that happens at the end as well, um, where most platforms would only have the beginning. But yeah, yeah, so basically, you know, when I talked to Russell, he was like, seeing our current results, seeing like where we ended up with like very little marketing that we did, he was like, we could have easily had double or triple that. And I was like, Ugh. like, I, I knew I was like, man, I see now, like, and, and that amount of people could have possibly doubled or tripled our campaign. Like, that's yeah. that's like how because, powerful it was. Yeah, because the more people that start at the beginning, the more people yeah. are. So, like, basically, you get a little page. It's a page on Kickstarter that says, like, basically gives the, a picture, gives the little, like, one one sentence description, your little log line, and then it says, notify me at launch. And, like, you click, the, and the more, and if you get, like, I this is colloquial and just from like looking at some campaigns, but I've seen enough to say, uh, to say um, like, if you get 200 people that follow your page, you'll probably raise about 10 grand to your campaign. If you have a hundred people, you'll raise about five grand in your campaign. Like this is not like, I've seen people with 50 people that raise 10 grand and people with like 200 that raise less than 10 grand. But like for me, for like the campaigns that, I talk about, which is like, you're not going to have a ton of like super high end stuff. You're mainly selling books and like some, some extras in the books thing, like roughly 200 will be $10,000, uh, a little more in comics, a little bit less, depending on how many bet your back catalog is. Um, but it, it's a pretty good thing. So like there literally is a magic button that says, okay, like if I get X people following my campaign, mm -hmm. assuming that I'm not just begging them to follow for no reason, right. I'm actually getting people They're to follow my campaign yeah. who are interested. Like, and I can spend a month getting a hundred people. I should make, you know, four to five grand over the course of like a month. Again, these are not like guaranteed results. They just mm -hmm. are my one person launching a bunch of campaigns, colloquial information. Now, if you do a bunch of content marketing and PR, I have had campaigns that had 200 followers that made 20 grand or 30 grand right. because 
just it's that successful like 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 there's just there's so much press there's so many like i've been on, was on so many podcasts and like i i was able to like get featured on like big 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 uh, uh pages for that kind of book like i just made way more um but yeah. Uh, you know, if you're not going to do a lot of PR and probably your first campaign is not going to have a lot of press unless you already have a big back catalog, you're probably going to be doing this yourself. Um, you know, if you can get 50 to 100 people. You should you should be in good shape to like at least raise your the, the money for your campaign uh, for for like for like producing the book. Um, so, I mean, I would say like your first campaign, you should try and get 100 people to follow. And that to me is like if there's a magic button, like that's the magic button to say, I have this many people. It means that I did. And it also means I did a lot of marketing activity. Like I did, like I send people to the page. I got them excited. I built an email list. Like I had this, I, I did all of the things to like generate buzz. So I'm in a good position. If you only have 10 or 20, you may have been like one post might have gotten you 20, but if you did a hundred or so you yeah. did, yeah. It's just a, it's like you, you've, marketing yeah yeah for sure so we've got several questions that i want to make sure that we we ask about them I and one of them is just talking about like because we're, we're talking about how do we prepare ahead of time for a successful campaign wicked tree press asks how far before the campaign begins should you activate that pre-launch page yeah monica how early before a campaign launch that pre -launch page? <laughs> because if you do it six months ahead of time everybody's gonna forget about it right so this is where Russell should murder me, basically, because <laughs> I did not get our I didn't get our pre-launch page up early enough. I was um, for whatever reason he advised like at least a month in advance. I didn't get it. I think it was like a week and a half to two weeks in advance, which I thought was great because I didn't fully understand the importance of it. Mm. So this is just a tip. You should always listen to Russell. <laughs> do exactly what Russell says if you can. But um, so I have yeah, a schedule so, of like what you do every week. Yeah. Like if you start four weeks out, like mm -hmm. I have a whole thing of like how yeah. over four weeks you can slowly roll. And we over like the course of one week, we're trying to do everything oh that like i usually do in a month and i was like this is we have to cut out like we had to cut out like two or three emails in this, the sequence that we yeah, normally yeah. do yeah. because i was like oh it's only two days left like we can't send this page out because like anyway so um yeah, yeah. I, I recommend a month we, yeah we so a couple, couple other right. questions i want to address uh i want to answer devin buddy's question uh myself and you guys can comment on it if you want he asks how well does this translate for first-time authors that are publishing and then someone else asked would you say it's beneficial cj i've said is it always beneficial to launch your book on kickstarter okay how well does this translate for first-time authors that are publishing first as a writing coach, let me tell you, one of the most common, almost ubiquitous um, myths, uh, false, false, but very intense feelings that new authors have is they feel like you work, 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 you finish the book, and then it has to be published. I have to publish the book now. Like it's like, I can't, I can't wait. Slow way, way down. Just hold on a second. Think about what you're trying to accomplish with this book that you're publishing, okay? You may finish your book at, at let's say you finished your book January 1st. And like you finished your book last January 1st and you just haven't gotten around to publishing it yet. And you're just hearing us now. You're gonna go out and buy their book. It's gonna take a little while for the book to get to you. It's still in the Kickstarter campaign. But um, you know, you're learning things right here and just take some time to put into practice the things that you're learning here. Um, you know, if you don't have an email uh, subscription list, you know, start one, give yourself some time to, to, to figure out this other side of things, okay? You don't have to, just because your book is finished now does not mean you have to race to publish it. Just slow down, think things through, this is the whole point of publishing wisely, okay? Ask yourself, what are your goals? And publish your, even starting from your first book, try to publish it in a way that will reach your goals. And if, oh, that, so means if that means taking six months 
to carefully incrementally build these things that you that just don't exist in your life that's okay it's your life will not end if your book is published six months after than you thought you were going to publish it yeah let me uh, sorry uh, I mean, let me take this from devin and also incorporate cj who i, I know pretty well um most authors who are first-time authors are not rapid releasing or doing most of the things that are required for an, for you to do really well on Amazon with your first book. They are usually uh, not publishing uh, like the kinds of books that are going to go bananas on kicks on, on on Amazon, and they don't have their second book or third book planned. Uh, most authors release one to two books a year. And um, Monica, you can uh, you can uh, you can feel free to correct me, but like those kind of launches are going to bury you in the Amazon algorithm. Like they just you're not going to be able to get one book that sells really, 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 really well and keep that momentum going for a long period of time, likely on Amazon. Um, however, you can publish very well on Kickstarter, one or two books a year. And then we bring those to Amazon. And because you are going to be making more money from less people, so uh, like you, instead of making three dollars a person, I we're making right now twenty nine dollars a person. We just there's more ability for you to earn out how much it costs to make your book on Kickstarter. And if you aren't doing five or six books a year. To, or you're writing off genre or off or 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 you have you're not writing on trope or on market that I would say yes you all I would always want to launch my book on Kickstarter because it allows me to make more money from less people and then go into my book launch like profitable instead of in a hole and, and have to spend so much extra money to find uh uh to to to, to get to run ads, to find the people that like my stuff. But I don't know. What do you think about that, Monica? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I, I think Russell is, um, yeah, it's pretty much, you know, what I would say as well. I mean, you might be a unicorn who can do well with one book on Amazon. Um, but the algorithms don't really favor that, uh, because they, I mean, it's complicated basically, but they let's don't assume they, you're normal. <laughs> yeah. I, I would say like, I would not assume that you are a unicorn. Like that's, that's the thing. Like I, I know a couple unicorns, but honestly, you're probably not one. Like that's just the truth. Um, and I hate to say that to people, but it's like, you know, most people who are successful, especially long-term, they're writing in series, they're writing in long series, they're writing to tropes, they're doing ads. Like, I mean, they're doing a lot of things to reach that success and to maintain that success. And um, those are things that you'll, you know, like Nick was saying, like you want to learn those things over time and give give yourself the time to learn them. Um, you know, because I and I, I think like something, you know, like I've been publishing since 2009, um, it's 2021, <laughs> like I'm still not, you know, always where I want to be. And so, if, and, you know, I think Russell, you've been publishing for a long time too. And, um, you know, I don't definitely know not where I want to be. Yeah. I don't know about you, Nick, but, um, you've probably been at this for a while as well. And so I think just give yourself time and like be compassionate towards yourself because there are a lot of moving pieces and there are a lot of things to learn. So and well, can I, I just add that one, yeah, oh, I want, well, can I, do you mind if yeah, I? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Right yeah, yeah. on Monica's is Kickstarter is a very forgiving platform. Like it, they like the people are very kind. Like they they are going to let you test out like 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 uh, uh at like if your copy doesn't work or your image doesn't work or like if you like screw up like Amazon is 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 buyers like they expect the finished thing to be perfect. Whereas Kickstarter, the community on Kickstarter, they're backing projects. That's how we say backing and not buying. Uh, it even says that, that when you back a project, like the rewards are not guaranteed. Like it's it's built for people who are at the early stages and want to find new things and know that new things sometimes are like broken or they're are, are not perfect. And they uh, it's very forgiving. And so Kickstarter for both um, Devin and uh, CJ is just to me, I like launching on Kickstarter because it's like I'm going to test all of my copy. I'm just going to be able to test like whether it converts, whether people like it, whether people hate it. 
like what people are saying. And then I can use that on Amazon or massage it on Amazon or, or all the other platforms to be better. So I like Kickstarter because it is very forgiving, but also that it will give you an email list. Like, oh, it, like you have to ask people if they want to join your email list, but it will give you a list of buyers who have bought your book. And it may only be five, 10, and probably be like 20 or 30 people, but like, it'll give you a group of people who are actual buyers. And if anyone who's launched on Amazon can tell you, like Amazon don't doesn't get buyers give you on that. Amazon. They don't give anything. Oh, sorry, Nick. No, they don't give you bad. anything. <laughs> no, so I I know I'm glad I'm glad you went first because it it sets me up perfectly. I just wanted to make a suggestion. Start on Kickstarter for all those reasons that that uh, that uh, that uh, that Russell just said. Start on Kickstarter, launch it first, work out the kinks and stuff, and look. However, you judge your success of your Kickstarter launch, um, you can then start over with a fresh page and launch it a second time on Amazon. I mean, just because it's out there on Amazon, it, you people do soft launches on Amazon all the time. I mean, you when you do that, you you can't take advantage of the uh, the automatic triggers that 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 Russell was talking about earlier, you know, like if you, you know, you launch a book on Amazon and then within a certain number of days, you launch your next book. And then with a certain number of days, you launch your next book and then you can keep yourself on top of the new author thing. Like you, you, you're going to be sacrificing all of that, but you know what? You're probably not going to hit all those algorithm triggers anyway. So you might as well launch it on, on Kickstarter, learn a lot of things, you know, add some people to your fan base, whether that number is 10 or a thousand people to your fan base, you're going to be adding someone to your fan base and then start a brand new campaign for officially launching it on, uh, on Amazon. See how it goes. Yeah. I mean, it also allows you to like launch it because like the first 14 days or 30 days are the most important parts. Like it allows you to build for me, like you can look at my campaigns and see the God's Earth Chronicles have only four books out of seven. And there are going to be four books until the uh, out of 11 when I launch the rest of it, uh, because I want to build a back catalog so I can slam Amazon and get the most out of those first uh, first uh, first weeks. But I want to. Uh, I want to uh, go to a couple of other questions. Just like when you say first day you launch your campaign, are you talking the Kickstarter launch or uh, I'm talking about a Kickstarter launch, but literally we're talking about like any campaign. If you're launching on your site, then like that first day, anything, the first day is going to be the freshest day where no one has seen it. And is the day, really, that's the day where the rubber meets the road, where you're like, okay, I only got 10 sales. Like I am woefully underprepared for this launch. Or if you got a thousand sales, you're like, wow, like this is really hot. So like the, 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 or an Amazon launch, like the first day is kind of like where you get all your preset pre-orders. If you've done a pre-order thing. So it's where the rubber meets the road of that first day. So I'm talking about any first day page launch in here. Um, uh, all right. Uh, this is, I think for me, uh, Gabriel asked, I found you via a giveaway where you had to follow to enter. Um, I use uh, King Sumo, and this is a great way. Uh, viral giveaways, we're not talking about that. We haven't talked about that yet, but a great way to get people excited is to launch a viral giveaway um, where you're giving away um, not your work. So this is the trick to viral giveaways. The giveaway is no one cares about your work, but they do care about, like, let's say your book is about, like, a female uh, vampire slaying, like badass, trying to like stop the apocalypse. Like maybe you give away like a huge Buffy giveaway, a Buffy <laughs> stuff, and like those people then love Buffy. And like if you target your Buffy giveaway to readers who maybe like Kindle or like whatever the the triggers that you're going to use, use this only Buffy novels or like this only is Buffy this is a Buffy novel. raffle. This is a Buffy sure. raffle. You're you're yeah, not so, giving everybody the Buffy gift. You've yeah, you're you've spent two hundred dollars on Buffy swag, and yes. one per out of all the people who sign up for your email address, someone is going to win this Buffy bundle right, exactly so like those people then all love buffy and like maybe you get a thousand people or 500 people who love buffy and now your goal is to take those people who signed up for your mailing list and say um okay 
Uh, if you love, you love Buffy, Buffy, here is why. <laughs> so, like, what the, the mistake people make in this is they usually just say, oh, you love Buffy, so you're automatically going to love my stuff, and they don't do anything to warm up those people. Mm -hmm. You have to say, you love Buffy. You want the Buffy lover to love your books. And so you have to bring them on a journey to show them why yeah. they should love your books in a way that's not going to be mm -hmm. like annoying or insulting to them. That takes place and it takes time, which is why when someone says, oh, I'm going to launch this giveaway like the day before my campaign launches, I'm like, this is terrible. Yeah. It's a terrible idea. Like you need months, at like, least yeah. like a month, but like more <laughs> at least like a month, three, yeah. a, more like the longer time you have it, the better to get people excited because then you can give them like behind the scenes things. Yeah. You can give them the first chapter. You can do all of this stuff to be like, hey, like you said you like Buffy. And I'm just, I'm my thesis statement is if you like Buffy, you like my work. And here are all of the emails and here are, here's my evidence for why. And you're going to, and then the other mistake people make is saying, I got a thousand subscribers. So they're a thousand fans. And it's like, no, you got a thousand subscribers. <laughs> Maybe you've got 20 or 30 or on a really great giveaway, like a hundred fans who like are your people, but like people, because I used to do these giveaways a lot and you know, the people get like a list of like 5,000 people. And I'm like, that's, that's a hundred maybe on a good day, like fans of your work, but you have to work them and massage them and the mistake people make is so the short answer is uh, I use, I use King Sumo uh, or raffle copter or gleam. I like King Sumo. It's my favorite one. I think uh, uh, they have a, 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 a one you can do on, on uh, online and one you can do in an app. But it's a great, it's my favorite way to build a list quickly. Um, uh, uh, but you have to be willing to do all of the work and show your work for why they should like you and make a compelling case. Because otherwise they will not, they will unsubscribe or they will just tune out. And you've got to know your audience. Uh, because if you do a Buffy giveaway and your book is actually, um, you know, more like, uh, oh, my brain's not working. If, you know, your book has vampires Richardson. and vampire hunters. Yeah. And your your book is actually, it's really more of a police procedural with vampires. Then the Buffy people are not going to like your book. Like you you have to. You, you have to understand who your audience is and you have to understand where those Venn diagrams overlap. Which like goes back to what Monica was talking about earlier. We, we've only got a couple of minutes, so I want to yep. make sure we get all Carry of on. The, yes. the things. Um, one, uh, Monica, you want to talk about this one? Okay, uh, just, yeah, just digital items. Uh, sorry, I should probably read this out loud. I would like to just offer digital items in the campaign for fiction for a sci-fi series. Is that okay? Or do you think also a paperback or hardcover book should be offered as well? Thank you. Um, yeah, so Megan, I think um, I do think that print books. So so I do think it's fine if that's what you want to do. Um, and, and Kickstarter is a great place to experiment, in my opinion. Um, so definitely experiment with formats. I, I The way I understand it is that print books are the most popular format on Kickstarter because of, you know, the comics uh, industry and because of, uh, children's books and it's just, just all sorts of reasons. Like people on Kickstarter want a physical product. They want to have something mailed um, to them. So I I think that that, that I would do I, and, and what we are doing and what we always do <laughs> um, and what Russell always does is we do the print, you know, the print book is kind of like that $25 tier usually. And then, you know, the digital book is maybe like the $10 tier, $7 tier, whatever you want to um, do somewhere in that like $10, one to $10 range or five, I guess five to $10 range. Um, and that's for like a single book. And then you start to go up if you have, like, if you're doing the first four books in your series, then you start to kind of move up in the, the amounts for the tiers. <laughs> what would yeah, you add, so Russell? <laughs> I would say that Kickstarter was founded pretty much on the idea of physical products, like just whether that was a drone or a board game or uh, I don't know, like a thing, like it was about making a physical good product. And so it is very much a physical good heavy space. Um, that does not mean I have, I have plenty of people that, uh, that buy the, uh, the I, I, uh, I have a friend, Ryan, um, Ryan Lindsay, who only does digital campaigns because he lives in Australia and he doesn't have any way. Mm -hmm. So he, but they're very small, like they're very small comparatively. If you're doing a digital only campaign, 
then there are some things you can do to make it really attractive, which is like to offer audio commentary, which is not a audio book. I'm saying you actually are opening the book and you are like doing audio commentary on like different scenes and different pages, not every page, just like interesting things, just like a director's commentary. And you would say, okay, I'm moving on to page 37. Like I'm moving on to page 53 and like, here's an interesting thing about like this scene and how it worked and just the behind the scenes stuff. Uh, digital prints um, are, are a great way as well. Um, audio books. I probably, if I was doing a digital only campaign, like I would definitely like try and do audio books. Cause like that, that's, that's a way to jump the people wanting an audio book is a great way to charge $20 for an audio book or an audio book and ebook thing. It like will immediately add some value to that. Um, uh, yeah. To just, just you want to you want to give people like more for the digital campaigns. Now I would I would I would I would, uh, I would say look at uh, you can offer a digital signature on like the PDF. So like five dollars might get you the base PDF and ten uh, a base the base book, and then ten dollars would get you like a signed PDF. And like you're signing one PDF, but you're still signing it. It's still a special kind of like unique thing. Maybe you do an exclusive cover for just the Kickstarter digital. Maybe you add like a bunch of back matter content, but you're doing a bunch of extra stuff digitally. So I would not just say, here is the book as you can get it on Amazon and digitally. Like one of the things that's great about is you're you're signing it, you're signing the book. Like the book is signed, like it's been touched by you, it's been signed by you, it's been packaged by you. So people are, people. that's a thing that people want is access to, yeah. to, to you. And, and that's really part of the ethos of Kickstarter too. I mean, I've been a, a backer on Kickstarter for, oh my gosh, since it began. And one of the important things about uh, Kickstarter as a platform is that people expect the Kickstarter edition of whatever it is you're making to be different from the retail edition. If, if those two, th I mean, the only people who can get away with not doing that are like home electronics people or whatever. But, um, but it, it, this is your opportunity to make something special and unique and unusual for the first people who back you on Kickstarter. Because, you know, once your Kickstarter campaign is done, as most people do, your book will then become available on, on Amazon. And you, you want to make it so that the, the people who backed you on Kickstarter can look back on that that 30 day, 15 or 30 day campaign and say, yeah, I was part of that. This, this is part of, of how you create a fan base out of interested people. Because interested yeah. people, you hold their interest for a little while and then they wander off to something else that interests them. So you have to change that person from being an interested person to a fan. This is one of the ways you do it so that they can look back on your campaign and go, man, it was great being a backer of that campaign. And look, I have, you know, I bought this for my friends, but this is the Kickstarter version. This is the Kickstarter edition. Right. I mean, I've got board games that are Kickstarter edition board games that have pieces in them that are not retail available. You cannot find them anywhere at any price, except on eBay for people who are selling out and <laughs> selling their Kickstarter swag on eBay. That's the only place you can find this stuff. So go ahead. Yeah. So Russell, we'll you do this okay. very well. Yeah, we're getting to the, the, the last end. So two more oh, questions. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, we've only got a couple more minutes. So are there certain projects that do well on Kickstarter? Horror, sci-fi, fantasy are the best genres. Nonfiction is pretty good because you can add courses and stuff. Um, uh, there's not any rule. Like my friend did a, a, a one for, you're going to hear her uh, RJ next hour. She did a, 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 a paranormal romance campaign and raised $32,000. So like, it's not that you uh, you can't do like anything but like the, the biggest genres for like just people finding readers like just coming in like looking for projects are horror fantasy and sci-fi can um, i add though yeah. that i have seen a lot of because romance authors are always at the forefront of marketing um i've seen you know a lot of so yeah like um rj was doing like a different format so really anybody could do that um that type of that style of campaign and we talk about that in one of our videos if you want to um check it out later whatever it's kickstartyournovel.com slash youtube it's in one of our videos uh, where you can and, and she'll be on in the next hour as well to talk about it um 
but yeah, I think um, I've seen like a lot of like romance book boxes, which is like book boxes are super popular in romance right now. I think that Kickstarter is a great place to do a book box because there's so many like physical pieces and you're like, do people really want this or are they just like, do they like want it, you know? Yeah, we're talk definitely talking about that with uh, with uh, RJ and Krishan because Krishan does that uh, the book by the gift boxes and stuff for her books. But yeah, I mean it's not just books; it's also adding being additive. But this is, comes brings me to the last question, uh, which is: Is there any way to do this without having to hold stock in your home and ship out everything on your own? Uh, yeah, this is the harshest yeah. I'm going to be all day. If that's how you want to do it, don't use Kickstarter. Just don't. Like it's not worth it. Like it's about providing a a, a, a unique. Uh, experience for your people, for the people who care about you and care about you the most, uh, uh, and and like who are willing to pay a premium for your books. Like if you're not willing to take books in and then like sh spend a day shipping them out, like just like don't even bother doing it. Like it's it's more work. Like Kickstarter is more work than doing Amazon. That is why people pay a premium and you make more money for doing it because like it's a pain. It's a bigger pain than Amazon. Um, it's also why people are like, that's why people go to Kickstarter to like get a special experience. And if you're not willing to provide that experience, uh, Kickstarter is probably not for you. Yep. So yes, you are going to be shipping stuff out of your house. You can, I mean, look, like big campaigns, like <laughs> or shipping board, it out of somewhere. Like, like those big I mean, board game hire, campaigns, yeah, like, like, hire somebody. like but those big board game campaigns, like they'll have a fulfillment house that does mm -hmm. it. And like, yeah. mm -hmm. I still think you should go and unless you're doing a $50,000 or a huge campaign, like you still want to touch the book. Like, like people, I know this is weird. Like to say like people want the books, to, but like they want the personal experience. They want the bookmarks or the prints or whatever you're going to add. Like they want all of that stuff. But yeah, um, I, I mean, like, I have a couple friends who do like tarot decks or whatever, and like, you can just hire people to pack your boxes. Like, if that's what you want to do, like, okay, you, you do have to sign sign all the books yourself. Like, there's like some obvious things you do need to do yourself, but like, hire somebody if it's like such a big deal. Or just and, what and I would remember do is to say, add like, the cost to that to the money that you're raising. Yeah, like, but, do so like, I would think say, this like, all through really ahead of time. Yeah, if, if you really don't want to, um, if you really don't want to ship it, I would. If you really don't want to be to take the pain of sitting down and doing the shipping, I would say like, pay your neighbor or a friend like twenty dollars an hour to like come over and pack your books for you. It's going to be cheaper than hiring a fulfillment house anyway. Like, just I literally, um, I'm, I generally don't do this because I, I, I want to get it out as quickly as possible. But like, I have literally right now like 20 boxes of just stuff waiting for the books to come in fulfillment i could easily like message a friend of mine or put on kickstarter or put on facebook who can i bring on right now like who is interested in making a hundred dollars tomorrow to help me pack books um so like if you are like physically unable to pack books like which is you know not an insignificant amount of people like have somebody like come and bring the books in so you can just like stack them on a table so all you have to do is sign them and then pack them away but that signature that you are getting like that they are getting is like the reason they're paying a premium for the service and and that experience is what you're providing to them so i understand that you may not be phys you may be physically disabled or like in a way that uh, does not allow you to pack boxes and that will be my recommendation. If that is you, you can still use Kickstarter, uh, hire somebody, go into Home Depot and like bring somebody who's like, I know you're not, you're a laborer, but like, can you pack a box? And like that, that is a way that you can kind of do the same thing. But as Nick said, bring, uh, like make sure that add that to your costs of the campaign. Um, and, uh, on that note, I'm going to, uh, uh, I'm going to let uh, these two go. I will bring the next person on. Uh, RJ is going to come on, um, and uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll see Monica and Nick in a couple of hours, okay. and we'll let them say goodbye before the end. Yay! Of thanks, everybody. Bye. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much, everyone. All right. Uh, before I bring on RJ, and hopefully we'll have Krishan on here uh, soon in a couple of minutes. Um, uh, I want to answer this question about shipping from New Zealand is prohibitive. This is one reason why my, um, why my, uh, my, my friend who's in Australia does digital only. Um, however, 
uh, you can, um, you can, um, uh, uh, if you have a friend in America, you can ship them book plates and have them like pack it. If you, if you know people there, you can, um, you can uh, hire a fulfillment house to do it in America because most, most Kickstarters in America, um, you can offer uh, another author who may be in America and doing a Kickstarter or UK to like, like my books come still from Ingram. Uh, you can, um, you can, um, uh, so you can ship from Ingram to like America at like someone's house in America and then just ship book plates to like the person who is, um, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to the, the, the backers themselves. Um, or you could have someone else to do that for you. But there's all sorts of options, um, in that respect. Certainly if you are, if you are in, um, in, uh, in, uh, a place that is prohibitively expensive, uh, to ship, from uh, uh, that is one way that I would do a digital only campaign uh, and just try and, and, and figure out if you could do some cool options or uh, try and do a swap with people in um, in, uh, in, in, in who are, live in uh, in North America or the UK and then say you'll ship their like New Zealand Australia rewards for them. Um, and I'm just going to quickly message. Actually, I'm going to bring on RJ right now, and then I can quickly message Krishan and see if she's there. Um, and I want to meet. I want to meet her kitty. Hello. Hi, RJ and RJ's kitty. Zazzle. Which, <laughs> which, uh, which kitty is this? This is Zazzle, the beguiling tyrant. Um, she Lovely. is something else. Uh, she is the instant I sat on my bed because this is the quietest room in my apartment right now. Um. Yeah. Hi. She wanted this. She just came yeah. on the lap, and now she just wants attention. Uh, she learned that when my foot was bum and I was in bed, if she joined me in bed, she would get attention. Um, yeah, we have a dog like that also. Who? Yeah. I can't get into bed now without the cat showing up within thirty seconds, going, "Oh, it's attention time." And, yep, um, uh, that's very that is a very relatable sentiment. So, um, RJ, why don't you tell people about yourself? Uh, well, I'm a herder of cats, as evidenced here. I have a second cat. Her name is Princess. Uh, I have a spouse who I kicked out, or, or more accurately, I don't want to sit here and not listen to YouTube or stream or anything while you're doing your convention. So I'm going to go run errands. <laughs> and then he yeah. went out apartment sniffling. And it was pretty funny. He was just screwing with me. Um, I write urban fantasy and paranormal romance. Um, I'm doing very well. <laughs> yes, uh, you showed me your uh, you showed me your uh, your your back end yesterday. It was yeah, uh, my very, back end yesterday. It's really very, very impressive. I don't think I'm gonna hit USA today. Uh, the competition looks pretty up there this week, but yeah, I got it's. It's lovely because, like, I'm, I've known you for a long time, and like, I remember you before your first like successful USA Today run, and like the all of the not successful USA Today runs, and now like them. now that now that the expectation is like USA or bust every launch, including full price, it's like it's so gratifying to see like how it, like just a couple so of years. Could... Every time the past four releases have been close, but no cigar. I'm yeah. like, can I have the freaking cigar already? Come on. <laughs> How many times do I have to get within 100 to 500 sales of hitting list before yeah. I actually you know, get lucky and hit the list? Right. It's what's so, wonderful yeah. to see, though. Okay. So I'm going to bring on Krishan now. Yay. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. <laughs> As you see, you? I almost didn't make it. You almost didn't make it. I actually, I messaged you on, I, I took the opportunity of RJ introducing herself to like message you and be like, are you coming? But you were here and then you yes. were here. Magic. Yes. I was sitting up here like, oh my God. Um, a few computer things, a, a few timing things where we're good. Who's the kidda? Uh, that was my kitty Zazzle. She's just running off now. I was like, yes. 
Yeah, he, she got she got what she needed, and now she's just running away. So, Krishan, introduce Hello. yourself to us. Hello, all. I'm Krishan Keller Hanna. I am the creator, executive producer of the Shaman States of America Universe, which is about 36 titles over five authors. Um, I also am the creator. I'm actually the owner and operator of Camel Sugar Evil, which is our marketing branch, which is everything that is not a book concerned with Shaman States of America, the Alizar Universe, and um, excuse me, the park universe, all their merchandise goes underneath there. And that's um, a little bit of both of those is how I got into Kickstarter. And I I write monster hunting stories with my friends, essentially, and make yeah. it. Yeah, and I, uh, <laughs> me too. So like, I'm very, this is like, I feel like I'm in my element now because like, this mm -hmm. is the things that I, I'm talking to authors who do the things that like, and love the things that I love right now. Uh, so. Say hi to Willa. Oh, I love that pin. That's such a great pin. Okay, so you guys each use Kickstarter in kind of a different way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'd love for you, uh, well, before we talk about uh, like actually building a page, let's uh, start with RJ and then we'll go to Chris Sean and just tell us a little bit about your previous experience on Kickstarter and how you've used it successfully in the past. RJ. Um, okay, well, at first, the first crowdfunding platform I actually used was Indiegogo because at the time, Kickstarter didn't like Canadians. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll start on Indiegogo. Um, I had like a lovely sewage flood in my basement. And well, let's just say money wasn't good. So I was like, okay, let's try it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, my debut had some help from Indiegogo as well. It was very, very simplistic. Um, it was just enough to cover editorial and, and stuff like that. Yes, Kitty, hi. Um, I haven't actually failed a Kickstarter yet. Um, so my Kickstarter experience is a very weird compared to most people. Um, and I always set up my campaigns where I have super cheap ones, but most of them are for the fun stuff. So I always had higher level tiers and those really paid off because they were almost all profit. Uh, so I could do campaigns with 30 backers. Um, I have my editorial costs covered. I have my cover covered. Um, fulfillment would be easy because it's only 30 people. Mm -hmm. um, and so I always kept it in something I could reasonably do by myself with no help. Um, so every time I started up a Kickstarter, I was like, can I actually fulfill this on my own? Um, and then, oh, he's showing the, the recent one. Um, that devil thing um, is the loss of my sanity. <laughs> so we're sitting there there are like 106 backers which is approximately twice the number of backers i was expecting at the end i'm like i'm not telling anyone this exists anymore because i don't want any more backers no more please <laughs> it was, it's the opposite problem most people have 100 right. backers roughly 300 dollars per people so like this is one of the things that are but people always ask kind of like how you how you can do campaigns and i thought this was a really smart you're like I don't want to do trade I paperbacks. Do I, I, was like, like, I don't I, want to do them. Like, if you want trade them. paperbacks, like, here, like, they it's going to cost this amount of money. The they know I do not want to be doing this Kickstarter. <laughs> like, they flat out know I hate running these things. Um, I just got enough <laughs> people asking for them. I'm like, okay, screw it. I'll do it. Fine. You've, you've talked me down, finally. Because I don't go to a lot of conventions. I do not sell signed copies of my books. I only give away signed copies of books as giveaways for current fans. So getting a hold of a signed copy of one of my books is kind of difficult. You either have to have back to Kickstarter, gotten lucky and gotten a giveaway, uh, had a child who had a birthday and messaged me begging for a glitter bomb, um, or something similar to that. So it's very rare for me to actually sign a book at all. Um, I really liked how you used that campaign. Um, yeah. I want to get to Krishan for a second because I uh, just, uh, we we went through your, one of your old campaigns, uh, your old campaigns, uh, both of your old campaigns actually in a previous video that we did. Uh, so yeah. if you want that, you can go to, uh, you can go look at uh, Monica's playlist. Uh, but I do really love this campaign and how you use kickstarter to like build out the worlds of your universe not yes. just book wise but really like seemingly yes. like the goal is 
I want to give other stuff that are not books. Yes, absolutely. And that was that was the goal, and that was the dream, the fantasy. Just that I not only did I use the beauty bubble campaign for those who don't know, this is my cozy mystery um, universe, or part of the universe. I used Kickstarter as an entry, not only for Caramel Sugar Evil, which was the swag that surrounds the um, Shaman States of America universe, but also to go into another genre. Because if, um, for those of you who've read Shaman States of America up until Beauty Bubble, it's action adventure, a little bit of intrigue and political and monsters, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes. This is a very, very different, like, this kind is, of series, which is great because, like, 40, you know, a 45 you year think, old woman. Yeah. Well, you know, people say, like, don't do other series, like, like, like stay with what you like, don't expand out into other stuff. So this is a great way to use Kickstarter to be like, no, I want to do cozy mysteries. So here we're going to test it out and see if you like it. And if you like it, like, awesome. Yeah. And that's exactly what I did. I, um, I wanted to get into a new space with the Cozy Mysteries, 45 year old, a retired police officer whose dream was when she retired to take over the soap shop in her neighborhood. And then the body started hitting the floor under weird circumstances. And oh, is that a monster? And it was great. And it made sense. Also, I used this campaign to learn Kickstarter. Yeah. I did this as a part of a class I had taken. And the one thing about this beauty bubble one is they didn't offer to go to the class. They said, don't offer anything other than the books. And I tested that and I used that um, to see how I felt about doing anything more than just those books. This was a lot, right? Yeah. And I found that I loved it. And then later on, when I fulfilled, um, when I fulfilled, I also made a box that had soaps and that had um, wax melts in it. And it had a couple of enamel pins because that's my love. You know, I love the, a good enamel pin. I know, me and you both, me and, me and you both. <laughs> and a postcard. Now let's take that over to War Priest, which is me introducing a new author to my original universe. And I wanted to expand that out and see if there was a market for something that wasn't cozy related because those are two very different. Um, yes, the Immortal Phineas Gage. Those are two very different audiences for me. And um, Well, I'm sure after this, you also got like little email lists of like, hey, look, these people like cozy mystery. These people like, uh, like, uh, like monsters and these people like both, which is my favorite part about Kickstarter. Yes, it is. I um, I find people I wouldn't have normally found just running ads on Facebook or Amazon because what I found in my research was a lot of my fans, they're like me. They're not really communica communicative on social media, right? They read and they watch TV and they do other things and they consume media that's specific to their taste. And they go to Kickstarter, like I do, looking for new things. And I have found my people through Kickstarter, which is the reason why I've um, dedicated now four projects to exclusively be launched on Kickstarter Wonderful. starting next year. Absolutely so you've got it. someone that hates Kickstarter, someone that loves Kickstarter, mm -hmm. and me who teaches love Kickstarter. It. So like, it's like the whole thing. So, okay, let's get right. into like building a page. Um uh, I, I think there's three sections about Kickstarter, really. There's rewards, there's the the, the, the text, and there's the video. I mean, there's like imagery and no other video. stuff. No video. But, <laughs> but yeah, like I see that uh, one of the things I always tell people is to make a video, but RJ didn't make a video for her $32,000 campaign, and Krishan did not make a video for her... Uh, second campaign. For, for her second campaign. And so like... I want to just talk about how to make a video quickly, but like, I wanted you to, I really, we're going to pass by the video pretty quickly because it's clear that you can make a successful campaign without making a video if you want right. to. Uh, but so, also that, that picture there uh, on both of ours tells you everything you need to know, truly. Right. And that's right. what the video is there for. It's to, it's to engross um, our guests into this word that we're creating and inspire them to let loose some of their money, money dollars to make this campaign go. And if you can do that with a striking still shot, 
which I'm more, much more, um, I'm much more better at doing than yeah. <laughs> making a video. Let's be frank. I just took a slice of my cover and threw it up, and went, yeah. okay, that's a day. I mean, right. Both, both really effective. So quickly, yes. uh, there are three parts to a good video. If mm -hmm. you message me after this, I will give you my, 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 my. Uh, uh, PDF of like how to make a good video. The first is the intro. Intro, 10 to 15 seconds. Hi, I'm Russell Nolte. You may know me from this stuff. I'm here to talk about this video. Every little, every one I've done ever is like roughly this thing. The second part is about a minute. It's the introduction. It's, it's the product demonstration. Uh, how, to, how to get your book selling on Kickstarter is like this book. Uh, here's Monica's bio. Here's Russell's bio. And then the third part is another minute. It's the plea, 30 seconds to a minute where you say, Here's why we're on Kickstarter. Here's why your book is awesome. See you behind the backer wall. And if you look at our campaign that get your book selling on Kickstarter at kickstarternovel.com, you will literally see the simplest formula that you could possibly have for how to have a successful video. Uh -huh. um, I, kick, having a Kickstarter video uh, generally increases funding by like 20%. It, but like I get, like you've seen multiple campaigns that don't have videos and are successful. And I have seen many campaigns that are not that, that, are, that are successful that don't have videos. The key is exactly what Krishan and RJ said, having a killer campaign image. So can we talk instead of videos about how to pick a killer campaign image? RJ, you want to go? Mine's simple. Uh, in my fan base, they love two characters above all others. The picture I picked was of one of those characters. Fire-breathing unicorn who eats meat. A lot of meat. Uh, so I just went with what they like. I know, okay, this is a striking image. It's my one of my most prominent cover arts. Let's just put it up there. People who know my books will see that and go Billy! And then click. Um, which is what I want. I wanted my readers, my established readers, my hardcore fan base to come to the Kickstarter and give me their money. Mm -hmm. Because they've been going, let me give you your money, money. And I went, okay, give me the money. This is the, that's the relationship you want when you are building a Kickstarter as an author. You want to build a relationship with your readers where your readers are going, can I give you more money? I, I haven't given you enough money. I feel I've gotten too much for how much you charge for the book. Mm -hmm. That is the connection you need to forge if you really want to make a good Kickstarter without having to do any of the work. Um, my, I'm going to be flat out honest. My Kickstarter took 30 whole minutes to set up start to finish. That includes the tiers. I knew how much shipping would be because I had a book weighed. And I went, this times this plus, okay, base dimensions, plugged it into USPS. Okay, it's going to cost about this much. Did for the various countries for the ones I did allow international shipment which is very few uh and went okay how much is oh my god it's 70 dollars to ship those many books <laughs> yes, oh, it is. it's like it is. 200 to ship the whole kitten caboodle or something like that it's yeah. ridiculous but it's also 54 books yeah so yeah. um i'm like i mean, okay, we, I mean you have a 1500 dollars pledge to it costs you 200 300 dollars to get it shipped that's still like a lot of that's still a lot of profit yes it, it is yeah, it yeah. is um those those 10 backers paid for the entire campaign. That's it. Those mm -hmm. 10 backers paid for production of the books, the printing of the books, the cover art fees, the Ingram edit fees, the Ingram setup fees, because I'm going to be paying that out of pocket because I get five a month. And this is a lot more than five a month for books. Um, yeah. And I flat out warned my backers, the, the May deadline is idealistic we're expecting later because my designer's computer went poof so we're already late because she can't design anything right now and i'm like i don't care that's fine yep. i'll just i'll just notify them this is how this works they know i'm doing 54 books right, uh, right my right. the the main thing with my kickstarter is that when i went in i knew here's the goal and it was a small goal it was like i needed 5400 dollars or something like that I just wasn't doing that many books by myself. Right. Um, but the big, the key thing with the Kickstarter is you have to be selling something people want. Mm -hmm. if you, it doesn't matter how nice your video is, how pretty your backdrop image is. If you're not selling a product people want to buy, people aren't going to buy it. Right. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about your publishing career and your relationship with your fans before your first Kickstarter? Because I think this is something that they will need to know as well. 
Um, sure. I, I would love to know that too. That's. I started my career as a de developmental editor. Mm -hmm. So I basically helped other authors write better books. Yes. When I started, I was like, okay, I don't have any of this money for this. I live in Canada. I am unemployable. Help me, help me. So my first Kickstarter was really just a bunch of authors who were like, oh, well, you helped me and you only paid me to, or you only charged me $200 for 200 hours of editorial work. Mm -hmm. I'm going to back your project. Yeah. So they just, they paid it forward after I, you know, I paid it forward to them and they paid it forward later to me. Uh, so mostly it was actually from professional contacts who were like, oh, I want you to, to succeed here. Uh, I'll help support your first mm -hmm. uh, Kickstarter. Um, Kickstarter without a fan base is really hard. Yes. So if you don't have a fan base, yes. you don't start in Kickstarter. You're not going to hit your goals. Um, you need to get yourself out there in a way where readers know you and want to help you. It's a personal relationship. Mm -hmm. Unless you're selling dice that have liquid glitter inside, and then I don't care who the hell you are. I want those dice. I, I, I supported that campaign. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I have six sets. <laughs> six, six sets. Oh, so, uh, yeah. I mean, so... You, I you have characters have... older than you, honey. I have... <laughs> I have a lot of dice up there. Oh, yeah, yeah. I have a lot yeah. of dice, but I got six sets of those glitter core dice. And yeah. my husband's like, what is this? And I'm like... Clear core dice. And that's his own question. About $500 I shouldn't have been spending. Yeah. Well, you are, you, are, you, are a, you are a dragon. You are a dragon hoarder. So um, I, this brings us to a point that I, I mean, we, it's not, it's not the, the, the point of this thing, but like, whatever work, I, I wanted, it's really important to talk about. And like, uh, I think that my first campaign was so successful because I literally spent two years showing people the book and getting and, and, and bring people and bring people and going to meetups with like other authors and other creators and showing them what I was doing and like building relationships with them. And like, eventually they were like, okay, I know this book. I like this book. Like, I like you, I'm going to back the book. I'm going to share the book. I'm going to tell other people about it. And like, it was, it was 160 or so people and we raised like $5,400, which doesn't seem like a now in comparison, but like I spent a massive amount of time, even before I had a book done, just, building community and showing like I was a member of the community and like I was somebody that had good taste. I was somebody that like was nice and wrote well and like, and like, ha and like could produce a book. And then I finished the book and I said, and here's the book it's done. Like you don't have to like guess if a book is good, like here is the book it's done. Like you can just see it and like, you'll know it's good because you have read the whole thing. And once you've done that, like you, it's still not easy to make a campaign, but like once you've done the work of getting people excited and that they know you can deliver something, mm -hmm. it makes them so much more open to give you money for a thing, especially. And I think that is where Kickstarter is the special secret at like the beginning, because you're like, I'm going to take a chance. Like I'm not going to Amazon and showing you that like, and like putting it in front of people who expect the book to be perfect. Like I'm coming here to like a safe space and I'm going to get all your emails and like uh, the book is done. I need a little bit of help to get it over the finish line. And now it's, now I can do it. Um, and that Michonne. was, and that was the reason why I asked this question um, before, because there's a few things that are needed when you're thinking about video versus the, um, Splash image. Number one, do they know who the hell you are? Because in the cozy space, they didn't know me. So I introduced to myself, right? I talked about what Shama States was, who I am, what the beauty bubble is, and what they can expect from me. In, in um, War Priest, these were my peeps. My peeps knew that I was going to have another series that was around the time of Curious Case Files that was going to be more action. And, and so it was easier to communicate that. All I had to show them was um, the picture, 
which is Phineas Gage. And if you guys are familiar with history, Phineas Gage was the guy who shot a pipe through his head and ended up living another 12 years. And I just added, he could also see monsters and he went to fight them. So the image of Phineas Gage, automatically recognizable. You know what you're looking at. The eight stars across the forehead, that's Shaman States, darling. And then I gave you the name. And you do need a relationship with people to be able to do this. And I didn't even consider a Kickstarter until um, I had three series done and a mailing list that I talk to regularly. <laughs> well, I can say that I didn't special. have any. I didn't have any of that stuff. My first book that I ever did went on Kickstarter, uh, but I did spend a lot of time at the beginning showing people. And I think you're right. Like both of you had campaigns where like you were going to like your core audience. And I think that you need a, a video less when you are like saying, I'm here, I'm, this is for the people that know. They're in the know, like some maybe, I, I did a campaign last year that like, I literally didn't even want people who were on my, in my list. Like I did a book that I drew. I did a, drew a book called How Not to Invade Earth. Invade Earth. <laughs> and I was like, I literally don't want people who don't know who I am. I do not want this to be their first introduction to me. Uh, it's a, I think it's a fun book. It's a good book, but like, I don't want, I, I, you got to know that I know how to make a book before, you know, this book is a book that like you will enjoy. And you've got to know like my taste and my sense of humor. So I ran that campaign for five days and I was like, you, five days, you can't like get out. You, you can't like, it can't get, it can't get much further out than like the people that already know me. Um, but on th like this book, they get your book selling on Kickstarter, like, uh, we're trying to get the people that know me, but we're also trying to get out to like rando people like with this thing who is, mm -hmm. who are like, who need an explanation of who we are. And like, we're welcoming brand new people into the fold. Some of which are not so pleasant and some, and most of which are a hundred percent are so lovely. And that is, I think where you really need a, like a video to introduce me to you. Um, uh, so let's all great points. Let's talk. Uh, let's talk. Uh, Krishan, you get you you can pick. You want to start uh, talking about like the page, or you want to talk about rewards? Actually, can we jump in and answer this question very quickly? Yeah, which one? This one outside of a mailing list? Are, yeah. Are good. Oh yeah, I put it up there, and I totally. <laughs> I, I, I put it up there to remind myself because like it was a good cue, and then we did. Right. Uh, so outside of a mailing list. Um, uh, what are good ways to point people to your campaign? Um, let's say like outside of a mailing list and like a subscription, like Patreon or like other Kickstarters that you've done, like outside of the bubble of sending an, a piece of information to someone's inbox, how do you get people to your page? Krishan. I sponsor podcasts. <laughs> That's great. Shopping States of America presents. I have sponsored radio shows. I have um, sponsored crypto zoological podcasts, uh, true crime, and uh, more than a few um, tin hat um, podcasts. <laughs> because there's a level of conspiracy theory in Shopping States of America, because only 2% can see monsters, and there's some who are sensitive and are like, Did you know that there's monster? There's groups of three. Have you ever seen a group of three out in the field? There's a monster nearby. Those are monster hunters. And I literally wrote copy like that. <laughs> and for more, more music styles, I would find podcasts that play the music that my characters would be more in, most into, and I would advertise on it. And it has done a lot to introduce folks to me and me to them. And I now integrated as part of my launch campaign as well. Yeah. Anything else that you do? Nope. Yeah. All right. Cool. RJ, how about you? I did not email anybody. I did not use my past Kickstarter. I did not tell my patrons about it. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be honest with you about this, RJ. I saw your campaign like months after it ended, and I was like, I was. I was, I was looking for a, a, an example of a previous campaign, and I was like, wait, what is this? Wait, thirty-two thousand dollars. Wow, I've it never heard of this at all. Sweetheart. It only ended September 30th, so it's okay. You only missed it by like nine days. Right. Yeah. Um, but I posted to my blog 
Uh, the cats run the blog. I sometimes show up, but I posted to my blog. I posted to my Facebook. Uh, Twitter got auto posted from my blog because I'm lazy as fuck. Uh, and it got auto posted to Lincoln. And uh, that was it. That's all I did. Uh, I went. Uh, I went to where my fans were. My fans are on my Amazon page, which shows my blog. Uh, they are on my Facebook. They are on my BookBub, which ends up going on my Amazon page to my blog. My blog is how I reach people. It posts to Amazon, so new readers see what's new. It posts everywhere, and uh, the the hardcore fans just subscribe to my blog and get an email. So it's kind of like a newsletter at the same time, except for they get everything. Those are the people who want everything. If I have something to say, they want to hear it. And so I make sure my blog gets all the important data. My Patreon, um, they may have found out about it at one point because I do a little newsletter every month to my Patreons as written by the cats. Um, Zazzle typically writes them. Um, but they weren't the they weren't the audience for that one. They have their own thing. The, the Patreons are in the digital stuff. This was mostly physical stuff. So um, I go to where the, like, the physical people want the physical stuff. So I showed it to them. And I went, okay, you know how this works. This is how this works every single time. You have 60 days. You are in or you are out. I am not repeating this shit again. Um, a liar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, yes, here I am repeating this shit again. Um, but it's after it, the campaign ends, so like you don't have to worry about more people yeah. backing your campaign. Yeah. Uh, so I will uh, come at this, I suppose, from like the teaching angle because the thing that Krishan and RJ both have are devoted fans, and they spent years, year. I mean, like, I mean, me and RJ met like doing like builders in like Facebook groups. And then like, it was like, we've been doing marketing together for as long as I've known art. So yeah, probably the same seven years that I've not, uh, Krishan, uh, similarly, like we do, we've done, mar we've, I've done marketing with her. We yeah. did, a, we did our USA Today run together. Yes, we did. Um, like we, we have been doing this to building audiences together for a long time. And whether yeah. you're launching a book on Amazon or you're launching a book on uh, uh, launching a book on Kickstarter, but especially Kickstarter, like the more you can not just have a community, but a community of people who know you right well mm -hmm. and like trust not just you as like a human, because this is the this is where most people get it wrong. Most people are like, oh, I have so many friends who like like other authors who are friends, and they're like, yeah, but will they vouch for you? <laughs> like, will they, like, do they like your books? Like, do they know you can write well? Like, have you ever launched a book before? And so like, I think that the secret to this panel, which we weren't going to talk about marketing on this one. Cause like specifically these two people, like, like already had it, like they're not at the beginning of their careers, but no. what they do show is like, you have to have groups of people who don't just know you and like you, but they, and not tr and trust you, but that trust that you will make a good thing and are willing to take a leap. And even if you're like, and, and that doesn't mean you have to have done 10 books, but you has to be like, man, like they're so close. Like, I know, like, I believe in this person. Like, I believe that they're going to make a good book. Like, I believe in the product and I believe in them. And like, I've never seen the book before. I haven't seen it yet, but like, man, they're so passionate about it. Like they talk about it so well, like, like this, like they write so eloquently on Facebook in all in the Facebook posts or like their comments are so astute about other, th whatever the thing is, they're like that they, they believe in you and your ability, not just you as a human. And so yeah. that is when they're going to say, all right, on faith, I will give this person money. And, 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 and especially like, uh, Kashan's when she did the bubble box, like I've been like, those people were like, Kashan's never done a bubble box before. I don't know what this <laughs> thing is, but like, I trust that, that I, I think this is a cool idea and I'm going to trust that she knows what she's doing and can deliver this. Right. I have a point to make, uh, yes, regarding about authors, uh, and this is really important. If your author friend isn't willing to put this on your cover, you don't ask them. Right. You don't. You don't they come right. to you. They mm -hmm. come to you. She offered. Um, I've never asked for someone to go endorse my book. 
and right. and she came up to me and went, "Can I?" I'm like, "Yes." <laughs> All right. And doing one more thing, I'm like. It's, it's the same thing with your friends who are not writers. Uh, like your friends are your friends and they love you, but are they willing to part money dollars with you, yep. for you? And that doesn't and mean are they they some aren't. And yeah. that doesn't mean that they are a bad friend. They just want to spend their entertainment dollars somewhere else. And you well, know this. the script for you yeah. all. Do not ever make somebody your friend expecting or wanting their money. Yep. Yeah. They yes. will know. They know you're a predator. And that yeah. when you, your only interest in, in being friends with somebody is to get their money or to get their endorsement, you are a predator. Right. You and that's very, to be yeah. a friend. And that's very different than the relationship we have between our guests who come to our Kickstarter and us. The agreement walking in and coming into Kickstarter.com is you exchange some cheddar for a product. We yeah. all know this. Yeah. And then yes. and that dynamic is very different. And so it isn't sleazy when you're asking for money in Kickstarter because we all walk through that door with the same expectations on how this works. Yep. Yep. And the same thing with like your mailing list or mm -hmm. like if someone's walking through the door and saying, I'm interested in the products you sell, like you can sell them, like you can tell them you're, you have products. Like that's yes. why they're there. You know, like, you know, and you don't always have to have a product to sell. Like you might spend months just saying, just like talking about, I don't know, like, cool books or cats or whatever but or where like, you voted <laughs> yeah, but like but like there is an intrinsic the reason i love mailing lists is because like there is an intrinsic you are here to hear about my products like at some level like you're here for my writing like like we have other relationships like i can build i can talk about i just did a, a whole series on like depression and like anxiety meds and i'm finishing up this tuesday but like you're here for the books. Like that's why you're here. And the rest of it is so like, I mean, social media and all the other things, like I like going on guesting on podcasts. I like, I really love hosting conventions during a Kickstarter campaign. As you can tell, this is the second one I've done in the last two months, because then you can bring on all your friends and like, they can say how like cool you are or how you are just by association. They could like, kind of endorse in a way like the thing and 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 you can also give them promotion like it's like a, this like kind of big party thing that you're doing together and mm -hmm. like uh i think that that is a great way like being on other podcasts doing all this other stuff but the more you can do to show that you are the kind of person who will deliver a great book the more likely someone is to back your book yes yes um okay so we've got Little less than twenty minutes left. I think we beat that the beat that horse uh, 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 back to life. Uh, so uh, rewards, Sean. Rewards. All right. Let's talk about like how you stack rewards and how you make cool rewards. And again, if you have questions, let me know. Um, I I do the I do something a little bit something for everyone. I have a digital box. I have a happy mail box, and I have a book box. What's right? a Happy Meal box? Okay, happy. Uh, let's start with the digital box. The digital box is exactly what it says on the tin. Everything's digital. All the wallpapers I give you, all the short stories, all the the prints, they are digital, right? And you get them into your you get them to your inbox the day we fund. Period. All right. The Happy Meal box is something that I picked up from artists or from YouTube and Instagram where they do stickers and a postcard and a number pin. Um, and it's really stylishly packaged and it's fun. And it's usually something that you would get monthly with a different theme. But I do this for the campaigns to showcase the kind of work that I do and the kind of things I do with Caramel Sugar Evil. And that's usually a mid range. And that's still for someone who wants physical things, but wants to read it on their e-reader. And then the book box, it's the book. It's the physical copy of the book. And do you have like a combo? Like you can get like a book box and the merch box together? Well, the thing is that each one builds up on the other. So when you get the book box, you get everything. Nice. And that's a cool. nice $50 package I put on there. It's one of my most popular ones because people really do want um, my um, paperbacks. And... Um, for those who don't have a lot of cash, they can still get all the good stuff and then they can do add-ons. And then after a few months, I put them in my shop. 
Yeah. So I, I I have so much to say about this, but RJ, I want you to, to talk about rewards too. Um, my rewards were very much set up to, I'm feeding them what they wanted. They asked me for X. I gave them X. Uh, I just, the only difference in my rewards was one book, two book, three book, four book, five book, 10 book, this series, 50 books. series the entire <laughs> thing. And then I added later on because I did drop cards in a previous campaign and people really liked them because they're collectible. So they like having the card and it, they're digital readers. So they want something but they don't want the books so little credit card thingies they can keep yeah drop like cards drop cards they're great. they're great i love them yeah they're fun um i have a licensing issue which i can't fix until my designer's computer is back online so i have two sets of drop cards i have to wait to order but um i added tiers with drop cards for people who wanted digital please give me digital so i basically went to retail gave them a small discount from retail um, and then made those cheers. Uh, and the whole kit and caboodle, which is just everything plus cool swag. I'm getting some custom swag made just for the 11 people, 10 plus myself, because I want my own swag, damn it. Right. Um, and I am friends with uh, someone who does business uh, figurines. Mm -hmm. So I ordered off fuck ton of business i'm like okay dude hook me up i want to put in my kickstarter and he hooked me up uh so now everybody's getting some form of business with their order if they got business? it is the rainbow um oh, i'll take I have a picture i have pictures let nice. me find one i just had to scroll through my photo gallery here on my phone because there's no easy way to it is a metal so it is a metal with some very unique properties when it iodizes. Yes, there will be a replay. Uh, uh, so uh, don't worry about that. Go to the same link and you'll be able to see the replay. Uh, which one do I want to share? I'll uh, well, show you the wolves. No, open. This is Bismuth. This is yeah. a pair of, of wolves. Oh, uh, nice. nice. Um, yeah. Those are going to be going to a new home in the campaign, I believe. I don't know if I kept them. I kept some of them because, oh my gosh. Uh, I love great. this stuff. Um, you really are just such a dragon. <laughs> this is definitely going to somebody in one of the upper tiers. It's a panda bear. Nice. So the nice thing about this is uh, you guys both kind of have the same uh, idea uh, or a lot of the same ideas. So the first is like stacking books. Like I also think that the best thing you can offer someone who's coming to a campaign about books is books. And then if they want more books, you give them more books. Mm -hmm. And then if they want more than books than that, then give them all of the books. I have an all in tier on my campaigns, uh, which is usually all of the hard covers that we have in stock. Uh, and it's like $500. And you're like, here's all the books. Like here's the books and then all of the digital books. And then here's all the pins. And then I have merch. Uh, I've tested a lot of merch in my life. Uh, the best merch is pins because they're generally, for me, they're generally pretty cheap to produce and people will pay a good amount of money for them. Uh, prints and other stuff are like they're great things that I get in like small quantities just to fulfill Kickstarters and stickers mm -hmm. and stuff. But like I, I always do an exclusive pin on our campaign because like people people like pins and they'll pay like twenty five dollars for a pin for like one pin with like digital rewards. So I always do like a digital tier, which like is stacking like there's one book or two books or five books or you can buy like old old um, old tiers like old uh, other series. You could buy that series. You can stack all the comics together, all the novels together, all the everything together. Um, same thing with 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 uh, with the physical books. And then I have a merch tier. And then uh, for this campaign, we also have like a consulting and courses tier. But like basically, you want to have it like people are. A, I have found there are some people that are combined, but like many people are like I am a pin person. I'm a merch person. I'm a book person. I'm a digital person. And like, yes. then, then at some point they kind of merge together and I'm like, okay, like if you spend $50, you get all of the little prints and stuff. And you get like, like the books and all of the stuff and they all kind of like merge together and then tear up from there. So I think that is great that both of you did that. And both of you proved out my point quickly. Uh, anything to add, we only got a couple minutes, anything to add uh, about kind of how to, make the 
creating of the text of a page less like cumbersome or more streamlined or any tips that you found in like that respect? Tell a story. Tell the story. Tell the origin story of this project. That is, um, they came from a distant planet and they crash landed here. And I'm talking about that dramatic. Use the splashy fonts. Keep it tasteful, though. And make this very cinematic and inspire not only the confidence, but also the excitement. Um, I actually started, if you look over on the Phineas Gage or the War Priest one, I started with a limerick that tells you everything you needed to know about the character you were going to be meeting. Actually, the plot of the book, honestly. Yeah. And, and then from there, I just told the story about how me, a, a, a current screenwriter and a college professor out in the East Coast came together and made the series. And it's interesting. And I tell you what you're getting as part of that. And I just kind of leave it there, but make it a story. Have building action, climax, resolution, ask for money. And then me, uh, I learned how to market for an adult entertainment company. Uh, which means you have approximately 15 seconds to close the sale. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and people decide like that, the first image, and basically you have their attention for 15 seconds. If you don't say why they might want something in here, that's it, that's mm -hmm. all. Uh, so what I do, I just get to the chase. I'm like, boom, okay. Here's why I'm here. Here's what you get. Have fun. I don't care if you want to buy or not. Um, but I just give them the relevant information and I let them decide for themselves. Um, because I'm doing it to my fan base, I'm not using that Kickstarter to get new readers. I have much cheaper ways of getting new readers. Uh, Kickstarter is the most expensive way to get new readers I've tried yet, honestly. Um, it just doesn't, for me, it just, it's not worth the stress, the headache and the investment. Mm -hmm. I can spend two bucks and get 10 readers doing other methods, Facebook or Amazon or BookBub. Um, BookBub being the most profitable of the lot. Uh, yes, they are very good. Yeah. Uh, I do ads on BookBub too. Works great. Mm -hmm. um, my latest release, I did three prong or just going, Psh, okay, we're just going to hit up all the ads groups. Let's do it. And then I walked away like no stress. I'll just look like, okay, here's the book. Go buy it if you want it. <laughs> I don't care. I mean, I do right. care, but it's like in, in terms of stress levels, right. I have no chill. It's like, it's like, whatever. Okay, I'm here. This is it. Go play. If okay. the cover, the description, the rating didn't catch you, that's fine. Go find a book you'll like. Yeah, uh, you know, you do, but you do, uh, you do put your, your very good blurbs in the on the page and like that sells yes, you like your blurbs sell the books like i mean they the sell job. they sell tens of thousands of books a year and like that's uh, the job of the description though yeah um, so like i, I, well, I think that my description ain't selling it i've screwed up and that's on right. me not on any mm -hmm. single reader that ever comes to my page it's on me yeah, um, a lot of the i think a lot of pages tend to meander around like I'm this person and like I had soup yesterday and like then like after five <laughs> paragraphs you're like what what is the like I literally I because I mean this is a thing that I've been doing the past week is literally going through campaigns with like with like Monica and people and like I will literally sit there and be like what did I read what did I like not in that way just like I literally get to the middle of the page and be like wait I just read five paragraphs. I have no idea what the series is or like why I should care or why I should buy it. And like, you know, if you're really good at writing blurbs, uh, like the blurb at the top is great. Like it's a, like, it's the, it's the best way you can put like both of you, you um, uh, RG doesn't have it quite as high uh, as, as, as Krishan does. But for me, I found it in the last campaign. I like did uh, like, uh, do you love this? Do you love mythology? Do you love like fairy tales? Do you love magic? You're going to love this book. And then I literally just made the description, uh, put the description. And then I put covers. I put the covers of the series in there. And I kind of like, and then I expanded out from that. But as RJ said, like, you got to hit people first. And one thing I really like, I have RJ's campaign open. I also saw this on your campaign, uh, Krishan, but because RJ's open, I'm going to say like, what I like about your campaign is you literally break out everything in like, image 
and then a title, and then you talk about that thing. Mm -hmm. And the other yes. thing that I see people doing and Kickstarter is, and if you go back to look at Monica's, the one that I did with Monica, uh, the first one I did with Monica, where I was actually going through the campaign, she did this, where you muddy the page with just everything is kind of a mishmash of like, I'm Russell and this campaign is great. And like, we don't want, and like you, you, you have like five mission statements in the beginning and throughout the campaign, instead of oh, yeah. being able to say, oh, playing with fire. That's what I want to learn about. Uh, <laughs> Storm call. That's what I want to learn about. Oh, the titles the I want to know what's included in the book. Like you leave it, you make it easy to scroll through the campaign, hook them, say, I'm interested, but I need to know X thing. And that's how I think about a page. It's like, here's the hook. And then people are going to say, okay, but like, how much money do you really need? Uh, what books are included? Uh, what is a book box? Like what book boxes are there? And then you are very, you very, both of you are very good at breaking it down so that if I only need to know what the, what the titles are, I just, all I have to do is scroll and it's very easy to find. Mm -hmm. I don't trust, I'm going to tell you the truth, I don't trust a Kickstarter campaign that has more than five paragraphs, truly. I'm like, it has to be very, very technical, or you have to be explaining something very, very new to me. Um, and I'm going to amend that and talk about books. Sorry, like comic books, books. Um, I don't need more than five paragraphs on your page. I need you to go in, do your job, get out, and ask me for my money. And um, so I. It's funny because you have way more short. than five paragraphs on your page. I didn't write it. <laughs> no, that's not true. I didn't write it, but we had to add additional stuff. This is really funny. Uh, right before I started my Kickstarter, I was looking at Kickstarters I shouldn't have been looking at. My husband's home. Oh, um, hi, hubby. He's uh, he's putting groceries away. Um, and there was one Kickstarter. My rule is, if I have to scroll for more than three or four scrolls to figure out what the hell you're selling, I'm out. I'm yeah. out. I don't care what your video says. I don't care what anything is. Mm -hmm. I have to scroll and scroll. And The only exception I make for that is the Bones miniature ones. Because yes. I want to know yes. what those um the, the little expansion thingies you get when you unlock with my stretch goals yeah but that's but that's different though you're telling them what they get for their money yep. that's not like that's I'm like five paragraphs of soup yeah i'm looking for chicken salad it. and i hate when i have to scroll past 10 paragraphs of this stuff doesn't matter it's not helping me find nope. out what the stretch goals are i read the first paragraph and i scroll down to the bottom almost every right. single campaign now because mm -hmm. i want to see the cool stuff and I don't want all the stuff that'll make me no longer want to buy their product. And I try to put a graphic. I just try to put a graphic down there to tell you what you get in, the, in each thing. That way, See, uh, you don't have to, have to read. Well, I, 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 I disagree with that <laughs> statement. As, as, as anyone who's looked at any of my pages will know, because they go on forever. I will I don't, agree. I don't read them, Russell. I'll just I, go find the tier I want to buy and I'm done. I, but, I, but, I, but, I just but he, So here's my done. theory. So here, here's why I do this and why I try, tell people to do this is, and I've seen this over 18 campaigns, is like, is like the reason my campaigns are so long is because every campaign that I don't add that thing, there are people that that, 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 that that complain that I don't add that thing. So I am agreeing with you that the, that five you have five sentences to get me interested in your campaign. Yeah. That where I differ is I think that like there are people like when I did my Obsidian Spindle Saga campaign, there were people that really wanted to know about the world. There were people that really wanted to know about the characters. There are people mm -hmm. who really wanted to know about where the series will go or how the series goes. And so I made sections that were very delineated for each of those people that want that. Because, yes, some people just want to read the first paragraph and then go down. But some people are like, I don't know what this campaign is like. What about other books? So I have a big section for other books at the bottom of our campaigns, which is almost longer than the rest of the campaign, which is with like Ichabod and Katrina and yeah. Pixie Dust and these books you can get samples of. And like- Yeah, I just go to your tiers and look at what I want and then I just ignore the I mean, rest. You, <laughs> because you I got, was but, I, and, and, but, but like one of the things that I think is different between my campaigns and your guys' campaigns is I spend a lot more time trying to get new people to my right. world. That is than, correct. That so is like, absolutely correct. So with Krishan and RJ, if you're trying to just have a campaign for like your fans, I agree. Like I think my How Not to Invade Earth campaign was real short, was the shortest campaign I ever did. Because I was like, I've, if you're here and like you don't, you're not already in, like just go. 
Just, please, yeah. like, I don't want this to be the first introduction to me. But with other campaigns, like with our Cthulhu campaign, I am trying to find as many people as I can who have never heard of me before. And that is where the difference kind of lies. There are a couple of uh, questions from Brian. Uh, yeah. These are more comic related questions, but um, we can all. I also do and, comic. We also yeah. do comic Kickstarter. Uh, so. We have um, about four minutes. So mm -hmm. um, I hear variants and collab art pieces with other creators uh, work as well. Is this something a first time campaigner needs to push for and how important are they to the campaign? And then, uh, and then this one is I'm good to. Uh, we can go, uh, 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 from what I understand, it's good to hook a reader immediately, but if you have extra things, the last five paragraphs, the reader only indulge with that when they get cooked from the get-go. We've already kind of explained, yes, that is, yes. That is a yes. That is a yes. That is a for, yes. For minimum, you have, a maximum, you have five paragraphs. You probably have one sentence. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Like, you literally have 15 seconds. People make their decision on buy typically within 15 seconds. They go, oh, I'm interested. They keep reading. Oh, I'm out. That's it. Yeah, yeah. You have 15 seconds to pitch and, and convince them they want to stick around. Which is um, why the video is always 10 seconds. Here's right? what I have. Here's what. Here's why you should care. Here's what I have. And then the pitch in. Because if you can't hook them by that, then there's nothing. Oh, um, your splash page should have your visual language on your splash page should be on target, on point, and eye-catching. And I'm going to jump right into this question, Brian. For a first-time campaigner, I would see if you could partner and collab with folks who have already done Kickstarters or someone who has names and they have a, a, an audience as big as yours so you can cross-promote. And those things are really great for comics. I work, I do a lot of Kickstarter campaigns with Console House School Productions and um, pulling in guest artists for variant covers and being able to interview and talk to them during our kickoff and during the interviews that we do during our campaigns has been phenomenal. And not only that, but the more you have these kind of things, the more people want to add, which only increases how good your next campaign becomes because usually comic campaigns are usually an issue or a trade. I'm going to kick it back to Russell for the rest of that. Yeah, I don't like variants. I don't like any of that stuff for first time campaigners. <laughs> I, know. I, I know. I think, well, because they add expense and variability to a campaign. Like, I think that um, you you can, I mean, I've seen people do just bananas with these variant yeah. covers. But like, for me, I want to keep my campaigns as small and, and contained as possible at the beginning. Because if a book doesn't sell... Yikes, I don't want to have to spend a thousand dollars on one variant cover. Like that's a lot of money to spend for like one thing. So mm -hmm. um that being said, they work a lot. I'm not the guy to like come to to say like do variant covers. Krishan li likes them. I I I dislike I them, but I dislike them because I want you to be able to get if you if you're if like I don't want you to add a thousand extra dollars to a campaign for something that is not going to actually move the needle. So like Krishan said, like it better be someone who's already on Kickstarter, who has success on Kickstarter in the Kickstarter community to like mm -hmm. is no as is, is known to and you can literally go on these like Kickstarters and see like the variant cover level and say, "Oh look, seven people back this campaign and spent $500 to get that variant." Okay, like this is probably a person who, if I went off to them, they will return money. So before yes. you do this, don't just go to like Neil Adams or somebody because like he might not be relevant to Kickstarter backers, even if he's like, right. so you want to make sure that they are relevant. Like someone like yeah. Scotty Young or like the, the campaigns that like fund a lot, like Sora Song, like those people who like right. bring in a lot of dough on the Kickstarter platform. Those are who I would go to. And sometimes you can get you're going to get them for way cheaper than like Neil Adams or Art Adams or someone like that. And and they, while those are very relevant to to bookstores, they are probably they may not be relevant. They may be, but they may not be relevant to people in the comics community who are on Kickstarter, which is who you were trying to get to buy your campaign. But yeah. I'm always wary of people who do like a lot of variants because that is just so much money on a product that you don't know if the product is good. And if you run the campaign, you also don't know if the book is good or like just the variants were good. So like, right. I, I want to know that the book is good before I expand out. And I would also put the variants at the higher tiers or a stretch goals. I never did a variant that wasn't, that was below the 50 buck mark. Seriously. 
and our stretch goals are usually because our ask is is rather small. It's usually not until like thirty five, four thousand dollars that we offer them if we have all right. a. All right, RJ, last word because we got to get to the next thing, and then tell us where you are, where we can find you. Krishan, we'll come back to you. Everything mm -hmm. should be at the bottom here, and it then is. we'll get out of here and bring in the next guest. For authors, uh, I know in a previous uh, thing, someone said to do Kickstarter exclusives for authors. Don't. Don't do that. Um, it will cause you so many problems. If you want to do some Kickstarter exclusive, grab your pin, sign it, and draw a picture for your fans. They will love that, and it makes it unique. Mm -hmm. And it because you're drawing it yourself, even if it's a smiley face or little hearts or something like that, is a personal touch from you. Because of the costs of book printing, because of the cost of the updates to Ingram, because of the cost for things, um, unique Kickstarters are bad idea. So if you do want to do something unique, Ingram does allow you to put a custom page in. Take advantage of that. Yes. But don't shoot yourself in the foot realizing, well, okay, I did a Kickstarter earn this much and boom. Um, beyond that, um, variants can be fun. But don't go broke making them. Don't go broke making them. That's why, like, for print books, it's a very bad idea for a lot of people to try to do variants on a novel. The expense for getting the cover adjustments to get the interior adjustments is insane. It, unless you are able to put down $20,000 for a print run from China and have room for 5,000 books in your, in your garage. Most of us don't have that. Right. Um, and Kickstarter needs to be accessible to you. So make sure whatever final product you're doing is also the final product going into production. But if you want to do something special, that's where stickers, um, book plates, art you draw yourself come into play. Um, that's how I make mine unique to Kickstarters. I'll draw pictures inside. I don't usually draw pictures inside my books. Uh, so the Kickstarter cool. people get little unicorns and things like that where the non-Kickstarter editions don't, or I will number them. That's All right, we got to get out of here, RJ. So where can All we right. find you? I can be found at the sneakykittycritic.com uh, on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, Kobo, Apple Books. Just search RJ Blank. And Kashan. I can be found at shamanstates.com and caramelsugarevil.com and on Instagram and TikTok as Caramel Sugar Evil. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for coming on. We are going to run straight into our next thing. Go and read. Uh, RJ and Krishan's books because they are amazing and I love them so much. Bye, everyone. Bye. Hi, Desiree. How is France? Hi, bonjour, I should say. It is very well. Thank you for asking. Uh, so uh, RJ is joining us from, is it, are you in Paris right now? Oh, where in France are you? I am actually in the central Loire Valley in the land of castles. I just went to Chambard today and Chevenry. If you know anything about castles, Chambard is this, it's this huge, ginormous hunting lodge. And Chevenry is this Renaissance castle that's very feminine and very pretty and everything. So that, that was my day. It's 11 o'clock at night here. So if I'm a little, if I'm a little loopy, that's why I'm just a little bit tired. Uh, wonderful. And, and Melissa is joining us from a new place as well that she has not been for very long. So uh, hi, Melissa. Hi, bonjour also from Nova Scotia. Ah. Uh, it's 6 p.m. here and I just moved last week from the U.S. to uh, the Picto area in Nova Scotia. So I've got some French happenings as well. This is a very multicultural broadcast here. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, I love that your post uh, about where you're moving is like I live in. You said something about like living in the town that I write about, like living in a town that feels yeah. like a town that I write about. So, um, uh, how about we start with uh, Melissa and then go to Desiree? Uh, we talk about who you are, uh, uh, kind of your bona fides and 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 about you, and then we'll go into launching your launch, having your launch week. Yeah, absolutely. And this is the first time uh, people who follow me are going to hear my Canadian accent because I picked it up so fast because <laughs> I already had a Midwest accent and I have my puffy vest. So I'm full on Canada now. I'm a New York Times bestselling author. I have four pen names, uh, Melissa Storm, Molly Fitz, uh, Mila Riggs and Ash Eschler, which is launching this coming week. So I write women's fiction, cozy mysteries, urban fantasy. Um, 
and I own Novel Publicity for almost 11 years now. My staff is at 13. We help authors launch to list constantly, enough sales to hit USA Today. We run ads, Facebook ads are my jam. Um, also, I, I specialize in brand strategy, so I meet with a lot of authors to discuss what they could be doing better, the best way to launch for them, changes they should make, um, as well as writing on my own full time. So I live and breathe this world. Yeah. And uh, I, I know I know your books best as uh, the kitties and the Molly Fitz books. And I remember yeah. one time I looked at I, I was scrolling through Facebook. And I was like, someone took someone took her idea for a cup. And I was like, oh, no, 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 that's her. That's her. That's her. that's like that. That's that's that's. Yeah, the- it was a it was a review blurb I'd given another author because um, I was a fan of hers. And then I ended up writing her ads as well. And you're like, somebody stole this. I said, no, I did that myself. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I have a lot of fun. Um, I like to tell people who aren't in the author space that I'm a professional crazy cat lady. Cause that is literally what I get paid for is writing wish fulfillment, talking cat books. That's wonderful. Uh, Desiree, how about yourself? Oh, I love that. I love that. Uh, my name is Desiree Duffy and I founded Black Chateau, which is a full service marketing and public relations agency that specializes in authors and books. I also founded Books That Make You, which is a consumer-facing brand. It's a website. We have social media. And we have Books That Make You Show, podcast slash radio show. And then uh, so, uh, last year when COVID hit, we founded The Book Fest, thebookfest.com. That's ours. And much like what you're doing right here, we, we have a, a conference and it's coming up very shortly. And that's giving a, a, a voice and being able to help writers learn craft. We do panels like this and conversations as well. We have a very um, reader focused programming as well. We do day one for readers and day two for writers. So that's kind of what we do in a nutshell. Yeah. Did you, you had Danny Trejo do a reading last time, right? A few months, your last one. Yeah, he, he did it twice. Actually, he did it for the very first one, just kind of on a lark, kind of being silly. I thought it would be cool to have, let's have somebody read Goodnight Moon at the end. It's like a good night story for all the attendees. Who would be the most ironic person for that? Danny Trejo. And I asked him and he said, yes. So the very first one, he read Goodnight Moon at the end. And he has a cookbook out, a really great cookbook about Los Angeles. And anybody who knows Los Angeles and knows Danny Trejo, you know, he's got Trejo's tacos and all of that. So then have a donut shop now too? Yeah, donut, donuts and tacos. That's that's Danny Trejo's jam. Um, and actually, he's got a memoir out out now too. So he's 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 foraying into the the bookish world, so to speak. Awesome. Okay. So uh, first off, I will tell everyone if you have questions about we talked two hours ago, kind of about a couple of things to like get prepped before. This is really about like prepping your launch week and making sure that you hit you do things well to to start strong so you can continue strong. Um, if you have questions about that or launching books, really anything about launching books, I'm going to open it up a little more uh, to this uh, to this panel. Um, I've used a lot of Melissa services over the years. I've talked to Desiree a lot over the years. I've been part of her book fest. Like if, it, like, if there are two people that know how to launch books well, like it's these two people. Uh, and I think I want to start just kind of with an open-ended question about like, what do people get wrong about launching a book and like what are the things that they absolutely need to make sure they launch well Uh, melissa let's start with you and then we'll go to desiree i think the thing i see both new and experienced authors get wrong the most is the brand statement um it's not just you know marketing buzz speak it's really important um authors will come to Uh, marketing people all excited and say, hey, I've written a new book. It's a paranormal romantic suspense with reverse harem, Christian, whatever. And it's so many things that authors a lot of times think that by giving a muddy brand statement, you're reaching a wider audience, but really you're proving your book isn't really for anyone. Um, So use that pre-launch period, even if you don't do a pre-order to test your cover, to test your blurb, to find your categories and keywords and know so that when you launch, it will, it will roll, be like a rolling snowball rather than waiting until launch to find out that you've gotten it wrong. 
Yeah, Desiree, can you uh, just speak to that or anything else you want to add? Yeah, I, I underscore actually the example I like to give is something along the lines of they've written a mermaid romance western space opera yeah. and they think it's so cool to mash up the genres. But the thing is, is that the readers are audiences and readers of genre fiction read that genre because they want to know and trust that genre. Somebody reads romance because they want that cozy romance or they want that cozy mystery. There's expectations. So when you start mashing things up, you know, I see this a lot too, is they've almost got a thriller, but then they let the ending go. And then they're like, oh, it's literary. I just wrote something that's literary fiction. And it's like, you know what? Literary fiction mm -hmm. is wonderful. We've all read it, we've all studied it, but it kind of doesn't sell that well. So if you really want to sell books, you probably want to go on the more genre fiction side. Um, so I just kind of want to underscore what you just said there. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing to answer your question, Russell, that I see authors get wrong the most is their timing. Every week, and I'm not exaggerating, you, you hear me say this at almost every event I speak at, I get the call or the email where they're saying, I just launched my book and now I'm ready for the marketing and PR. And we can help them, but there were so many things that needed to be done pre-launch. And there's things that need to be done three or four months out that is almost like that's that's the the you know oh darn it we got to get rocking and rolling moment even before that if they don't have a, a platform by platform I mean website social media their email list all of these things in order you know launching that book and then trying to catch up on the marketing and PR you're, you're just setting yourself up for failure unfortunately yeah I want to dig into that because you know I think the thing that I wanted to tease out about this hour if nothing else is like launch week is like the three months before you launch a book or the week before like I mean I, I have like a year out before I launch a book that I'm like planning these things but I usually really start like three months before a book launch to like get everything prepped and get every the excitement and I always tell people like man that's that that launch is won or lost like the way before you ever hit the button. So could you guys talk a little bit about, you would talk um, Desiree about um, like working four months, uh, like three to four months in the future. Could you talk a little bit about like what you're actually setting up in those, in that time before a launch. And then I'd love Melissa to, 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 to add into that, especially talking about how you refine all of these like keywords and such so that they actually work. Desiree, yep. let's start with you. Sure. So from a very brass tax point of view, advanced reviews are one of the main marketing tools that you, you're going to have. And if authors have ever wondered, how, how, do, how do they get that blurb on the back of the book? How do they get advanced reviews that hit the second the book comes out? It's because they're sending out ARCs or advanced reading copies or what's also known as galley copies. So we like to send that out. We have our own team of book bloggers. We use a lot of the tried and true services in the publishing world. NetGalley is not a big secret, but the reason you're doing that three or four months before the book comes out, and trust me, that's what all the big publishers are doing too. And actually they'll even be on there even more than three or four months, but you have to give people time to find the book. And by people, I'm talking about book reviewers. These are librarians, book bloggers, journalists. At one point, they're going to want me to do PR for them, but if they don't give me the chance to you know, send that out to the journalist. Now, again, I'm just kind of, you know, I'm, I'm backpedaling as fast as I can. So those advanced reviews is one of the cornerstones and it's going to affect that book launch all the way down. And then some of the other things are the press release. We like to do it six weeks before the book launch. And that's something that gives us a strong PR push because once we have that press release, then we're pitching and we're pitching media interviews and articles there's an SEO aspect to it too. If we're putting that press release on a wire service and we're getting articles out there and there's backlinking involved, we're really building up momentum. So we wanna do that with enough notice as well. There's some media outlets. It's not unusual for me to be booking interviews three, four, five, six months in advance. Now, if I'm doing any kind of advertising, depending upon what that advertising is, if it's something traditional like print, I might be doing that several months in advance. Maybe I want to put somebody in the IBPA uh, bookstore catalog, in the title, something like that, so that they can get seen by 
bookstores. Who doesn't want that? Well, I need to book that space. I need to get the creative to them in advance. And if I'm doing anything, and Melissa, you mentioned the USA Today bestsellers list. If I'm doing anything along those lines too, if I'm trying to hit, whether it's USA Today or Amazon, and that sounds and feels so good when you can say you're a number one bestseller, right? Well, I'm buying ads space for that. I'm going to third parties. We've probably all heard of, and if you haven't, start writing it down. Fussy Librarian, Books and the Bear, Book Bub. All of these places are advertising, but some of them will book far, far in advance too. So if you can't book and plan and strategize, and those are just a few things, I, I don't want to take up too much time. If you can't do that in advance, then you're just setting up your book launch to kind of just flounder. Huh. Melissa, you want to add to that? Yeah, um, so I'm a hybrid author. I have four books with Kensington Publishing, and then the rest of my catalog is indie, as well as I own two small presses. So I kind of have experience from both sides as an author, as well as from the publisher side, as well as from the marketer side. And I really specialize in advertising. Um, so most of my clients are indie or Amazon imprint published. And um, it's not uncommon for me to put a book up months in advance of even starting to write it just so that I can see how the public reacts to the cover, the title, the blurb, the series name. So I can start testing and optimizing so I can start serving ads to build up those pre-orders. Then when launch week comes, I can turn the budget on like a faucet and just hit those insane sales numbers. Um, if you don't do any of that pre-work, it can be really frustrating um, coming into a launch and saying, I have $500 a day to spend. For example, if you're doing a very big launch, but not knowing who to target, that money burns up real fast. Um, so for me, um, it's just so important to be able to have the clients at least a month in advance of launch to start slowly rolling out those ads so we have everything tested and ready to scale. Um, I don't worry so much about press releases and book clubs and things like that. That happens um, on the trad side for me. And it feels really good because, you know, I am in magazines and print advertising and it's so cool. But at the end of the day, my money comes from being an indie author. Um, so running those Facebook ads and making sure my Amazon page is poised to convert, or maybe in this case, your Kickstarter page, it answers all the reasons why someone might browse away without investing, without backing your campaign. You want to straight up tell them why they need this and answer every argument and seal that sale. And you don't want to be doing that during your launch week, um, especially if you're doing a series, first in series, that number one book launch will set the tone for the rest of that series life, no matter how long it is. I'm writing book 15 in a popular series right now. And far and away, my bestseller, where I make most of my income, that was my first time hitting the USA Today list back in 2017. And that series just continues to chug along because of word of mouth, because I have the audiences down, because I have the branding down. And if I hadn't done that, I would not be able to pick up and move <laughs> and live my dream life in Canada. I'd still be tolling away and working long hours. So one of the things uh, I, I met with a marketing team for upcoming was I'm, I'm taking uh, this big series uh, from Kickstarter once it's over and I'm going to like do a big launch push on it. And one of the things that they were saying was like, I want like the shorts, like a short story in the universe, you know, uh, like four months before, because like, I need to test the audience. I need to like, make sure that like, we have the right, that the right people coming for the ads. I, I, we need to like, make sure that like people can tell us like what they like and what they don't like. So like, we can change things if you need to. Um, and like, I, I, just to underscore to, to underscore your point, Melissa is like they like these things don't happen in a box. Like they happen, they build over time. For to bring this back to Kickstarter, I always tell people to launch to have their campaign ready a month before, but at least two weeks before, so they can send so they can send an email to their list, and like the you can say like my the email is always like, "Can you help me?" And it's like 
I'm about to launch this campaign. Like I'm doing my last checks. Like, can you just look through and tell me if I've missed anything or like, if you hate it or if you love it or like whatever. And like, I judge every time I get like 10 comments that are like, you should tweak this. I get people that are saying you can, uh, you, you know, you forgot this or like you, I, I don't understand this part. And like, it's building the campaign to be better. And I'm only able to do that because like they are doing it before so that when it hits everyone, like it's ready to convert as many people as possible. A really good example is the launch of Kindle Vela recently. I had a book ready for that and I anticipated some of the concerns. I said, this is kind of confusing, these coins, these crowns, this is very different. So my team and I set up a reader's guide walking you through every step, exactly what you needed to do with all the links. And I had that ready to go for emailing my list. And then I found out all the other problems. So even if you're really savvy and can anticipate what those questions might be, there's nothing like a live test. Um, you know, I, I got to know that people in other countries can't access this. People don't like the slow rollout and why this wasn't a fit for my readers. And I wouldn't have thought of all of those because I'm not my full audience and I can only anticipate to a degree. So that launch data, that pre-launch data is so, so vital. Yeah. And like it allows you to be able to to act nimbly later as well. Whereas if you're getting all of that data while a lot of money's on the line, exactly. like, like you, you can't. I mean, I, I hate feeling flustered. Like I hate feeling like I'm not in control and a launch even the best launch ever on some level is like, you're, is, you're out of control. Like there's a, there's an out of control element because it's readers who have to buy. Like whenever you bring in other people, like there's an element that's out of your control. And so part of planning the launch week for, for me and planning all of this stuff is really like knowing that there are unknown unknowns and, and, and trying to pull out as many of them as possible and then being ready with sort of an arsenal of stuff to move nimbly. Um, Desiree, do you want to add anything to what Melissa said or I said? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think you guys are making some really great points. My business is maybe just a little bit different. I don't necessarily do Kickstarter campaigns, but I think there's a lot of crossover and a lot of the same things that we're saying is, I, I think the main point that people can get is just plan ahead, be prepared. Mm -hmm. And get feedback too from others, you know, and even going way, way, way back before them, you know, make sure you have beta readers and the right editors. The last thing you want to be doing is sticking a book out there. And I'm not even so much worried about typos. I, you know, I see um, manuscripts that people are, are publishing that probably should have used a decent content or developmental edit. So just kind of thinking the whole thing through because I, I just see so many people that want to rush. They want to be that self-published author or that published author. And then, you know, they go back and they have to do things over. And it just never works well when you do it that way. My animals are going crazy. <laughs> I mean, I love it. You put a cat on your shoulder and you were talking and I was talking to you and we didn't get a chance to get introduced. Like who are the, who are the, who are the, is there a, that a puppy in front of you now? This, this is Sky Princess. She's a four-year-old chihuahua. This is my ah. soulmate. And then our hairless cat Monty is the one who's just being insane. Um, Ma Monty's got a personality. Yeah. Montreal. Yeah. Our Canadian boy. Um, yeah, I, I love the different perspectives here because Desiree does more PR. I do more ads. Russell does Kickstarter. So we're all in a different space. Um, but I will say that no matter your path to publication, you have put in the hours. Um, you ha A lot of authors will save money for a very long time. Say they want to do a big launch to the top 100 of Amazon or to the USA Today bestsellers list, or they want the special Kickstarter badge or they want to get attention of uh, the reviewer or the publication they want. They save, they work for that. Don't waste your time and money by not doing just a little bit of work up front because $5 a day for like a month is can be enough to really test your brand and get to know those issues so that when you have all those eyeballs, when you launch and you, the algorithm is primed to push you up the charts that you're doing it correct and you get the maximum... Oomph. 
Yeah. Um, okay. So I want to sort of flip this. We talked about the, 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 like the biggest thing that people, uh, 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 should avoid, but like, what are some of the coolest things that you guys do or like that people should be considering that maybe they don't or that, uh, they do. And it like works like all of the time or most of the time, uh, mm -hmm. Molly, uh, Molly, I'm with, uh, Melissa, uh, let's start with you this time. Yeah. Um, something I tell authors a lot is when you're presenting your book, your ad, what have you, um, your newsletter, sign up, anything. Um, a lot of authors focus on what is it rather than, than how will it make me feel? You don't want to tell them the, the brick by brick plot or this is this character, this is that character. They know each other this way. Focus on how the reader is going to feel what the experience will be like and what they're left with at the end of the book. So not necessarily giving spoilers away, but a lot of my blurbs tell you almost nothing about the story. And it's just word after word about how they'll feel. And that sells. <laughs> Boy, howdy, does that sell? And you want everything about your book, the title, the series name, your author bio, even to tell the reader how they're going to feel. Um, and what the experience will be like, even between my brands, I have urban fantasy, cozy mystery and women's fiction with inspirational tones. They're all me. They're all honestly me and how I am, but I'm selecting different parts of myself. So with the cozy, I talk about Sky Princess and how I talk to her and it's like she can talk back and that's true. But for Melissa Storm, I focus on being a mom and liking emotional fiction. And for urban fantasy, you know, I focus on more of the magical element and just imagination. And they're all honestly me, but each one is telling the reader what to expect from that side of me. And that sells much better than saying, you know, this is a story about a dog. She's small and black. Like, that's not what you want to do. Yeah, I have so much to say about that, but Desiree, I want you to be able. You you look like you were nodding your head quite a bit too, so I want you to add anything that you oh, have. Or yeah, yeah, right. We're all 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 on the same page at this point. Um, I was just gonna say, for me, it goes back to the foundation of your branding and really thinking about that. And it's similar to what Melissa was saying because it's about your brand is about what it what's in it for them in a weird way. And I like to really dig into the brand. And a lot of authors are like, what are you talking about? I'm an author and I want to go sit in the corner and don't look at I'm not me. a commodity. Uh, right. And they don't understand that if we're going to get those interviews for you, there's going to be some kind of story behind the story. We can find it. It's there. Uh, an example I like to use, I recently had a, a poet come to me. She had already released her poetry book. And if you can imagine the world of PR Poetry is probably one of the hardest things to pitch to get somebody interviews talking about their poetry, right? And I spent a little bit of time talking to her about her brand. And she talked about how when she wrote her poetry, it helped break her out of her PTSD, her stress, her anxiety. She developed this philosophy that we all have these gifts. Her gift happened to be hurting cats. No, I'm wrong. It wasn't hurting cats. Her gift happened to be um, writing poetry and that it's hiding behind our fear. And if we break through our fear, that's where we find our gifts. And I'm like, that's powerful. That's a heck of a message. And so using that, we were able to formulate that into media pitches. And we got her talking on health and wellness type shows, on shows where women wanted to talk about, you know, overcoming stress and anxiety. There was lots of verticals, lots of ways that we could then pitch that message and it just took a little bit of digging into what the core of her brand was, which was really the core of why she wrote that book. I love what you just said, because a lot of people think that like defining the brand is limiting, but to, but it's actually freeing because suddenly, you know, when I talk to authors, they're always like, well, I write a mystery book so I can go on mystery podcasts. And I was like, OK, but like, what's your book about? And they don't know. And you're like, well, maybe you can go on anxiety podcast or maybe you can go on like there's all of these worlds that open up to you and also targeting options that like might open up to you if you can if you know the core of the story and who will like it and how to twist it to like move people in different pockets of the universe um i want to come back to something that uh you said though melissa because you were talking about um 
I don't even remember what you were talking about, but it was about, uh, oh, it's about blurbs, the, the blurb on the page. And like people, the, the number one thing that I tell people about blurbs is like, you're saying the what and not like how it makes you feel. Like no one's favorite anything is like anything about the artist. Like it's always about how the artist made them feel or had them overcome a thing or like is tied to a special event or some piece like that. Um, uh, or like, or like caught the moment of the time that we're living in, like Squid Game, just like it, it, did, it did something that connected people to the world at that time. And it can, and like, it's a well-made show. Like it's as good as any other well-made show that came out, but like, it may have a little, be a little bit better or worse, but like, it just happened to hit that moment. And I think it's so important when you're doing your PR or you're planning your launch is like, you don't want to give the farm away. You want them to, you want to give enough information that they're like, I want this. I want to open the book. Like, I want to, I always tell people like, what is the least amount of words you can tell me to open the book and read the first chapter? And that's the minimum that you, like, you don't need more than that, but that does mean you have to convey the feeling in a hundred words or less. And yeah, so not only telling them what to expect, but um, answering any reasons they would have to turn away. And I was stalking your Kickstarter, Russell, because I know you're really good at it. And I always see yours and think, how cool, um, but how not me? <laughs> I'm going to try. But I was looking at your Kickstarter launch course and I saw the nice charts you had. And that's exactly what you were doing is showing hey, this is the information. Hey, yes, this is covered. So that people who were trying to convince themselves, most people try to convince themselves they don't want to buy this thing. And you were answering that each time you shared a new figure or went into something new is actually, this is why you should. Um, and it's the same with fiction. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, we're... I'm going to ask again to ask questions because like, this is like the key, like the book, like we're talking about the book launch right now. Like we talked about the book launch before, but like, this is like how to plan for the, the launch. So I think we've talked a lot about before the launch. So like, I'd love for both of you to talk about the actual week itself. And like, you've hit the launch button. Like, what are you looking for? Like, are you tracking metrics? Like, are there things that you were always doing that you're never doing that people are thinking too much about? Or like, uh, Desiree, let's start with you this time and then we'll go to Melissa after that. Okay, sure. Um, well, during the week, during the couple of weeks leading up to and around the launch, um, that's about the time we're usually doing an online book tour. And there's a lot of strategies behind that, but that's where there's a lot of book bloggers that are talking about it, doing... Um, doing posts and interviews and, and such. And it's it's highly strategic during that time. There's some SEO benefits to it and it's creating a buzz and getting things out there. Um, doing contests, even just online contests, book giveaways. You do builders, Russell, it's very similar. Actually, Bree took some of your builder courses. So things like that to really just make things bubble up. Obviously, you're, you're amping up your social media during that time. Um, making sure that within your newsletter, your newsletter should have at that point, and that you probably already talked about this, so maybe I'm just being redundant, but you should be, you know, engaging with the people that have taken you on this journey, hopefully strategically planning exactly when you want them to buy. The more narrow you can focus them to buy, the more chances you have of hitting bestsellers lists. And if you are doing advertising, and I'll let Melissa kind of jump in on here too, you know, you're advertising, the best way I like to strategize it overall is not necessarily just getting that spike. You know, if we want to get you to bestseller status on Amazon, it's not that hard in the fact that we just have to hyper target those advertising, those, those ads during a very specific time because Amazon's going to rank on the hour basically. But what we'd like to do is we want to trick Amazon's algorithms just a little bit because we want some longevity with that. So it's Amazon to start with and give it a boost. We can introduce a book for maybe an introductory price of 99 cents, but then we start doing some other ads so that if you think of your ads on a, on a line graph, you got the spike, but then after that you have, I'll go this way, after that you have almost like rolling, a rolling roller coaster 
uh, of ebbs and flows because you have different advertising campaigns. And as you do that, then Amazon and some of the other uh, retailers too, they start picking that up and they'll start serving up your book more. So there's a few strategic strategies like that during the launch and the, those couple of weeks that can really benefit you. Awesome. Melissa, uh, you want to take that from an ad perspective? Or any perspective. I mean, you you have you're so prolific. You're so you have such a wide breadth of stuff. But you know, we're talking about uh, exactly. You, we were start talking about it, and then Monica asked the question about it. So it's yeah, yeah. Timing. Sky Princess and I would love to add to that. Um, so a lot of writers folk, um, with launching, they think of reader acquisition, finding new readers. But equally important is reader retention. Even if you only have ten loyal fans for now treating them well so that they remain there and that you can grow is just as important as finding new people. So one thing I always do with launch every single time is for the first three to seven days, depending on the brand, my animals are getting even more, they're very excited about this tip. Um, <laughs> I'm excited about it too. I get it. It's a tail wagon tip. Yeah. Yeah. They're all going nuts. Dogs are chasing cats. It's happening. Uh, <laughs> the first three to seven days, depending on my brand and how big it is, I will do at least a dollar off. And I call that fan pricing. I remind my fans, first of all, if I have it on pre-order, I'll have it a dollar off. And then when my newsletter goes out the first time and when I post on Facebook the first time, it's a dollar off. As a way of rewarding my fans for getting it right away. And that also helps boost it up the chart. So then reader... Um, acquisition becomes a much simpler thing because it's a lot easier to be visible when you're rank 1000 on Amazon versus rank 100,000. So I bring the loyal fans in to build a base from there that helps ads go better. Um, usually I will reach out to my ARC readers, my advanced readers. Um, oh, questions. Uh, advanced readers, uh, usually only a few days before launch because um, they'll know a book is coming and they'll be ready for it. I find if you give a book too far in advance, it gets pushed down the pile. Um, so I get a nice handful of reviews from just really doing it last minute for my super fans. Um, also on day one, I have, I made a spreadsheet at one point that I shared in a cozy mystery course I taught and it was about 30 steps. I had a spreadsheet of 30 steps in different categories and now it takes me like an hour to go through all these because I kind of have the formula. If I'm doing a standard launch, it's very easy to run through. And even if I'm doing a big launch, it's the same steps except for more money. So I will apply for a BookBub new release for less if I am writing a cozy mystery or women's fiction because it does really great for those genres. It hasn't been as good for urban fantasy for me. Um, I'll do the fan pricing. I'll be ready to send out a newsletter during launch week. Arcs a few days ahead of time. Um, I also have fun things like a messenger bot and a reader app that, that come into play, but are more about just novelty and getting people to remember me than actually selling books. Um, but when it comes to ads, if I'm trying to hit a list like the USA Today, I think I've hit that eight times. I will bring BookBub ads in really hot and heavy early on, um, especially targeting Nook. I have a lot of readers on Nook more so than Apple for my genres. Um, and I hit uh, Facebook ads really hard to serve to Amazon. And even if I'm not doing a big launch, if I'm doing a low budget launch, let's say I have book two coming out, I'll link to the series page on Amazon I'll be promoting book two, but that also means somebody who hasn't read book one yet, they'll get book one on that page and they'll be able to buy and start there. So it's kind of like a double campaign, reader retention and reader acquisition for that series. And I find I get a lot more mileage out of that, a lot more bang for my buck. Awesome. <laughs> I, I think that we need to, uh, I, I want to clarify, because I know why you will target Nook and other like retailers, but like, I think if you're doing a USA Today bestseller run, like it's important to, like most people probably don't know why that is the case, why you have to target multiple uh, places instead of just having everyone buy on Amazon. Could you, could you explain that a bit? And then uh, Nick asked, uh, how do we know how to space out our advertising so that the spikes all hold up the conversion numbers in that first week? So you're not getting like a huge spike on like yeah, Monday yeah, yeah, yeah. and then it. 
Yeah, that's like the book bub problem that a lot of authors, um, oh, I got a book bub for the series that really needed it. And then it just goes into oblivion right after. Um, so if you're trying to hit the USA Today bestsellers list, um, it's different any time of year, depending on who's launching, what's going on. Um, but you can't only have Amazon sales to qualify for that list. A rumor that has been circulating for a long time is that you need 500 sales on Nook and or Apple to qualify in addition to having 5,000 plus Amazon sales. And that's not true. I've hit with as low as like 130 on Nook. Um, it is more expensive to get a Nook or Apple reader than an Amazon reader. However, they're much more loyal and more likely to read through your whole catalog. Um, so it makes the higher CPC of BookBub sting a little less. Um, I know RJ, who was just in, is fantastic at BookBub ads. She's so good. Um, yeah. Um, Amazon, uh, I run all kinds of ads. I try everything. And if I see a dip, I switch platforms um, or I'll switch KU to wide and back again, just so that there's always something new to be promoting. Um, in terms of avoiding spikes, if you're testing in advance of launch and you have, you know, your audiences, you know, your best copy, you have your blurb title cover series name optimized. There's no reason you ever have to fall off. Um, I have a book that's been hanging out between rank 100 and 500 on Amazon for probably five or six weeks now. And this book is four years old and it's just hanging out there. It just stays there because once you figure out how to get it there, you can keep kind of lowering your spins because at a certain point, the Amazon algorithm will help you. You'll get in more also bots. So if you start high and then start slowly lowering back down, you should be able to, to maintain that rank if your ads are working well, because Amazon in particular will look at like a two week performance. So when you're on day one, you have 13 days of nothing plus day one. So you just want to keep it going strong so that it averages out over the 14 days. And then it's not super hard to stay sticky. Um, if you can keep putting a steady budget at it, you just have to kind of test slowly lowering it to get to that comfort point. I, I don't know if you still offer it, but you used to have uh, uh, BookPub and Amazon and Facebook courses that I took and that are great. Okay. Uh, I don't know if they I don't know if they still exist, but like if they do they still uh, exist, I sold that business to a very good friend of mine. It's your author engine. Alana Terry now has it. She has all my backlist as well as courses from her. Oh, that's and why I keep getting her emails. Then. Yeah, <laughs> we do a Patreon together as well, where um, we each do a weekly short um, instructional video. And then we do two webinars a month where we deep dive on a topic like Bofo or Facebook ads. Awesome. Um, so yes, they still exist. And also my company, Novel Publicity, offers all these ad services with me or with one of my other team members. Awesome. All right. Desiree, we just spent a long time dipping in on like advertising, but I would like to know, I mean, I think that Nick's question is, is probably to me the most, the most important question to know, because like, all right, you get a book bub, you're going to hit, you're, you're going to like, likely you're going to like spike. Like, I mean, it's kind of hard to not believe like you're going to spike. Like you can, it's real hard. It's, it's real easy to, uh, to like show somebody how to like get there and back down. But like what? can they do outside of advertising to like keep people getting interest over like not just the day of launch, but in the weeks and uh, in, the, in the many weeks after that? Oh yeah, that's a great question. I think, well, maybe I'll just segue into PR a little bit since that's a little bit more, more me and you guys have, I feel like we've advertising, advertising, advertising. So I, I think that's where a lot of the public relations can come in and be helpful. And nowadays, the great thing is that we have podcasts and we have people that are taking really deep dives into the topics of books and authors. You just didn't have that not too long ago. So don't discount booking yourself on different podcasts, especially if they fall really nicely into your genre. Because, you know, a two, three, four weeks, heck, five months, five years, even after the book is out, you can find your fan base in these wonderful little communities. And that's what I feel like podcasts really can be. 
because they're hyper targeted. You mentioned, you know, people who like mysteries or true crime, you know, true crime so hot right now, you know, so using those PR moments, those interviews and such to kind of keep that messaging out there. Um, and I you mentioned it before, I think keeping contests out there. Um, and if you do have a series, you, you talked about it a little bit, Melissa, I think, you know, once you have several books in the series, that's a real fun point to go back and promote that first book, especially if they really are serial and you have to read one after the other. They're not just, you know, books that are similar because then I mean, you can do stuff with that first book where you're virtually giving it away. Treat it as a lost leader. Give that book away. That's a, that's a strategy that people have been using over and over again because people are so much, oh, people need to buy my book. You got four books. Why not give away the first one? Because then they're going to want to read the second and the third and the fourth. So those are just a few kind of random thoughts there. Well, I love what you said about series. And one of the things that I think that people discount a lot when it comes to like launch or, or anything really when it comes to, to authorship is like, God, they just discount their backlist. Like, mm -hmm. like, like they, they, are, they are constantly working on like the new book without doing any service to the thousands of dollars that they spent making this, the first book in a series or like the other things or packaging them together or doing anything like that. So how do you, how do you maybe use your backlist to like help with a launch of a new book? This is not going to be a, a newbie question, but like, how, how are you guys incorporating like just the whole catalog into what you guys are doing? My, uh, oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say really quick from PR. I'm just going to speak about PR and not yeah. talk about advertising. Yeah, 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 from, yeah. from PR, I love it if they've already got a book out and they've got a forthcoming book. Then I can even start pitching them and doing things a little bit in advance because they've already got a book to talk about. And if they tie together really nicely, it's just a really nice, smooth segue from one to the next because then you're promoting the one that's already on the market that people can buy. And then you're pre-promoting something that is hopefully already up for pre-orders or is coming soon. Well, and you do a lot of uh, like list, like people, like putting people, uh, um, it seems like a lot of your authors, like they'll be on like a like a top 10 mystery novels that are out in the next month. We do like, listicles. Yeah, 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 which is a great, I mean, if someone's already got a book, you can keep that going for like a long time. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna say two things there because you, you, you're getting me excited. I'll talk about the listicles a little bit. What that is, is you've seen them before, the top 10 books to bring with you to the beach, best books to buy mom for mom's day, best books to give for the holidays. We do listicles and we do native advertising. What native advertising is really quick, advertising meets PR and you've seen these before. They're like advertorials. You're on MSNBC or Fox or pick your flavor, whatever news lifestyle site you're on and you'll see sponsored posts. We do listicles. So those articles appear, but we're advertising them. And that's a great way to drive traffic. And I won't get into the benefits of that because you can just imagine we're driving traffic to Amazon. I, and I assume you're retargeting like from that. those too also, right? Yes, yes. And then you just, you get your sales funnel going and it, it, can, it can really be a, a beautiful thing. I just wanted to throw in something because you talk about backlist books, the stuff that's going on on BookTok, on TikTok right now with backlist books is kind of amazing. I don't know if you've talked about this yet at the conference, but there are books that are four or five years old and all of a sudden they're hitting bestsellers list and the publishers are scratching their head going, why is this five-year-old YA novel hitting the top? And it's because of the community on BookTok. So I just kind of wanted to throw the BookTok ball out there because I think that's something really new and exciting and fun to, to talk about and think about as authors. Awesome. Uh, Nicholas has, uh, I think like I should just bring, bring Nicholas back on because like he keeps having these he questions. So many good uh, questions. He does. All right. So uh, advertising and PR are different. Neither of them seem predictable. How do you choose what to do and when to schedule it? And then he asked, there's the second part of that question is, or is the only way to do it to just to do it? I have comments on that. Yes, so I'm it. big on measuring ROI. I use scribe count. Um, if you're only in Kindle Unlimited, you might use book report or reader links. They all kind of do the same thing where you can put your books, you can organize them by series, by genre. Um, I do a lot of translations, so I'll also look by country. 
Um, but what I'm able to do is each day go in and say, okay, this series made this much money and I can look at it over time. Okay, the baseline for the series is I'm making this much money. And then I'll pull a lever. So maybe that's doing some traditional PR. Um, so can you tell what baseline is quickly? Like just like, like just the average of what you're seeing that that book sells without like you without having advertising to of anything. Yeah, you know, without advertising PR, anything, without sending a newsletter about it. And then if I want to know the effect, okay, I'm going to mail my list about this series and see what happens. Give it a couple of days. I'm going to run ads on Facebook. I'm going to change my budget. I'm going to change my audiences. I'm going to start Amazon ads. I'm going to do a podcast. Um, BuzzFeed just featured my book on a listicle. I just had a book bub featured deal. And you watch the pattern over time. Um, in terms of backlist, that's where a large majority of my income comes from, because with backlist, you don't get one opportunity to launch a book. With backlist, you've had many more opportunities to get it right. Um, so you can really get it zooming and ticking along um, where it's just making a lot of money while you still figure out the newer series and how to make them bigger. You have more books in your backlist. Um, like I said, I'm writing the 15th book for a series. My big money maker has seven books. And now four years later, I'm like, I just need to write another one of these. It's ridiculous how well it does compared to everything else. Um, but by watching it daily and really having a sense of the, the average of what that series is earning, um, the other the mistake that a lot of authors make is they'll look at it at the book level. So maybe they'll have a perma free book one and only look at book two um, or only look at the rank of book one, but you really want to study things across a series and then for your overall income, even beyond that series, if you have your back matter optimized. So instead of saying, please leave a review or please sign up for my newsletter or saying nothing at all, you want to sell that next book. Even if you don't have a next book in that series, make a bridge to some other book in your catalog and sell that one. Because that's one of the single best things you can do to really get readers turned into super fans and just devouring your whole catalog. Um, so you can absolutely tell what things are doing. With ads, it's a bit easier because it's a continuous thing. I'm spending this much a day. This is the change every day. The impact of a big PR event or a BookBub featured deal, it can be harder to track because you're more likely to see a spike versus, versus just like a step up. Yeah. Um, uh, but Desiree, it, uh, yeah. can we talk to Desiree about that for a second? Because like, I want to hear about like, what is the, like, how do you measure the PR? Uh, uh, like, how, is there a longer lead or like, how long does it take? You know, I know like for a mailing list, like usually 48 hours is like how long it takes. Like with an ad, you turn an ad, you turn an ad off and suddenly things go down or like, up. Oh, like, how do you measure this with PR? Yeah, it's a lot harder because you're not, it was ever, excuse me a second. Mm. Excuse me one second, please. Sure. Well, I will say uh, with Kickstarter, uh, it it's uh, 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 it. I, hmm. I don't want to put this with Kickstarter because, like, I, I'm back. Sorry oh, about that. Oh, thank I goodness. Oh, thank lost goodness. I did right not. <laughs> usually, usually I'm very. I literally, usually, have tooth falling out of my mouth. Sorry. Oh my goodness. I, I got no. a temporary on right now, so. My apologies. That's all. No, I no, it's okay. I, I'm usually very good. I'm pretty on my feet with this, but after three hours, I was like, I don't <laughs> I know, know like, how to. I don't know how to Russell continue Hang. this. Okay, so uh, so anyway, how uh, how 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 do you judge the ROI of like a, a PR? Is there a yeah, way? It, 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 well, it, it's just kind of you know knowing when you did a interview and seeing if there was a spike in sales or seeing if it impacted sales because it's not like advertising. It's not like you're measuring a direct call to action. It's not like you can see the click throughs from somebody listening to the radio, right? They're, it's not like they're on a website page where they're clicking through and then you can, you know, you can track that. So it is a little bit different in that respect. I do feel overall to kind of answer next question, I think, is that integrated marketing is where you have PR, advertising, marketing, branding, social media, all these things essentially can work together. And when you're, you know, if you're just focusing on the ads and you're not doing PR or you're not doing social media or you're not optimizing your website or your metadata, you know, you just kind of make those weak links. But if everything is working together, it seems like it kind of builds and you end up leveraging up and up and up and up. 
one thing that I will say also about PR uh, usually gets the short shrift when it comes to like doing marketing, but like when you're talking about the additive effect over time, like PR can be very powerful, but I, I never measure PR by like any single article that I do. What I measure it is like not rank over time, just like notoriety over time or, or just consistently being like, Oh, like you never know, like, Oh, I saw you in the New York times and like saw you on this website that I listened to. And like, you were on this podcast and like, and then I see an ad, like, um, I always, I, I, I say like, like PR helps lower the cost of ads because like, if you're more ubiquitous over the universe, then like, yes, some people will come to you. But what I find is so helpful about PR or, or being on podcasts and doing all that stuff is like, once people know that like, I'm cool, then when they see an ad suddenly, like, instead of it costs, instead of me having to serve that ad to them seven times, like they might buy after two times or one time or uh, without me even having to serve an ad. So it's really hard to know how, like, the oh, how much would this ad have cost without PR? Right, right. right. So it's, it's leveraging and it's building. And I'm just going to say one thing you can do is Google yourself, go into incognito mode, do that before, before you even launch the book. See what your SERPs are, your search engine results pages. What's popping up? What news about you? And then do it when the book launches. Then do it a few months later. That's a good way because if you are doing a lot of PR interviews and getting articles, that's going to start turning up in those search results. And then just piggyback, backing on what you're saying there, Russell, then that's going to help. If they happen to Google you, somebody who's about to buy your book Googles you, and then they see all of this stuff, it's validation. And yeah, so now that ad that they might have saw that made them do that, now it's a lot easier to convert. And what's interesting, look. yeah, uh, so I'm the ads expert, right? But um, there was a really interesting conversation when Monica shared the conference. Somebody came on and said, I saw Melissa Storm in person when she was here, and I want to come to this event. And um, even though I've used ads very heavily for my books in recent years, um, my author business and notoriety there is 100% PR based. I never run ads for my business. So I can definitely be living proof of the fact that be people do know my name. And it's because I do events like this, because I'm helpful in author groups. And none of that is advertising yet. I get business that way. And the same is true for authors. Just the difference is, is with business, you have higher, higher ticket, higher cost items you're selling with books. It's difficult on both sides because what's the maximum cost of a book you're selling like $30 hardback in extreme cases, mostly you're selling eBooks for, you know, the price of a copy. Mm -hmm. So it can be harder to track that, but definitely once your name starts to get out there and is familiar it makes such a big difference. Um, I definitely recommend that authors don't rely on any single method. Yes, I'm the Facebook ads girl, but I run Amazon ads. I have a newsletter. I do these PR things. Um, I have social media. I post about my pets all the time. Um, so it's, it's not happening in a vacuum, just like Desiree's mentioned ads and retargeting she does. So we each have our, our pet methods and our favorites, but we'd be lost in the dark without having more than one because if Facebook goes down, for good, what the hell am I going to do? <laughs> I need right. a backup. So I right. have that and I have that in place and it might not be my favorite and it might not be your favorite, but you definitely need methods to fall back on or to be able to build. If you, if you say, Hey, this is going great. I want to put even more at it. You need absolutely. to have that backup. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So we have a question for Desiree specifically. Uh, we're running into the end of the hour. I don't want to keep you longer. So if you could, Desiree, we're going to do a twofer. Could you talk a little bit more about TikTok, if you know it, if you have anything else to say about TikTok, uh, tell us where we can find you when you're not in France, uh, and then we'll go to Melissa for final thoughts, and then uh, we'll say goodbye. Sure, sure. Really quick, in TikTok, think of it a little bit less as a social media platform and more as an entertainment or a creator's paradise. That's where you get the dancing authors and the memes and you know all of that. So I don't say just go off on 
book talk and TikTok and start doing stuff without researching and really making sure that you're a creator that wants to do, be doing something creative. And the nice thing about it is within TikTok, the communities that spring up are very dedicated. Book talk, hashtag book talk within TikTok is exactly what I'm talking about. So if you go to book talk and you search hashtag book talk, you'll see all of these people talking. They're doing wonderful creative things. They're revitalizing old books. A lot of the genres that are popular right now are the ones, you guessed it, that appeal to people who are millennials and even Generation Z. It's romance, it's fantasy, it's sci-fi, it's young adult, lots of young adult, LGBTQ. And it, there's, there's just this overwhelming supportive environment. So if you're looking for something new and you're creative and you might want to do something fun, I, I suggest checking out Book Talk on TikTok. And during the Book Fest, we have two Book Talk influencers that are going to talk to us. They're going to talk to me and kind of give their insights to authors as they start exploring this, this new realm in social media. And how do we find Book Fest, which I will also be at? You, you are going to be at it. Yes, yes. You're going to be on one of our panels on day two, which is for writers. So day one for readers, day two for writers. It's thebookfest.com. That's it. My agency is blackchateauenterprises.com. And you want to see what we're doing on the consumer front. That's booksthatmakeyou.com. She also has a book called Obliette, too, which is quite... I it's very, uh, it's very good, but it's very uh, haunting, haunting, as mm -hmm. I think the word, I'm trying to find the right word. It's like, it's, like, unsettling is the bad version of it, but it's like the good version of like, that thing. <laughs> Thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. It is a huge compliment. It's hard because like when books are like, kind of like unsettling and like, like, like disturbing, but like in a good way, I, I don't, it's hard to be like, like, it's, it's like in the good way though, like, like go read it. Cause it's, it's great, but like, like it will horror. unsettle, it will yeah. unsettle you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, exactly. uh, Melissa, do you have anything to add about TikTok or uh, just Facebook ads or where we can find you? Uh, also uh, I will say that like the Molly Fitz brand, which I love is, le is not unsettling. <laughs> it's very cozy and like lovely. <laughs> and like, it looks like I looked at all of the dogs, uh, the cats you have. And I was like, Oh my God, I recognize all of these animals from my covers of your books. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, the hairless cat is because I wrote about some and then I wanted one. Um, so TikTok is really big for sci-fi romance. So if you write that genre, head over there. I can say as an elder millennial who's 36 years old, I feel so flipping old when I'm on TikTok. So I'm just going to stick to my old lady Facebook, but I have assistants who do the young stuff. Even though the same age as me, I just feel old. Um... In terms of where to find me, novelpublicity.com is my flagship business. We've been going since 2011. We change with the times, uh, staff of 13. Um, besides running Facebook and Amazon ads, one of my most popular services is people can just book me for an hour. And usually that entails, well, how can I make more money? What am I doing wrong? And then I rip you to shreds in a very loving way. Um, and we record it and we make an action plan. And I've helped a lot of authors that way. I love doing brand strategy. Um, and also, I can say that one of the authors that you've helped, I believe, was on one of the panels today, right? Oh, like, RJ? Right? Yeah. Was, what was, isn't RJ someone that you like? Yeah, we've, we've worked with RJ. She's brilliant in her own right. She's helped me too. Um, but yeah, she's one of the coolest people in publishing for sure. Uh, agreed. Um, <laughs> um also if you're looking for a small press publisher whiskered mysteries we do english and german trans uh english and german books cozy mysteries with animals and arcane city is our urban fantasy imprint um i write for both of those as well as owning them and then if you are a cozy mystery writer come hang out with me in maritime canada at cozy mystery con which is happening it's a brand new thing we're doing interest intake now um, but I'm super excited about that. Um, the Canadian accent. I've been here for one week. It's ridiculous. It's so ridiculous. Um, I know there are other places to find me. Oh, yeah, I have a Patreon. The Writing Cave with Lana Terry. We do a Discord and chats and um, how-to videos. It's the only place I'm doing regular video lessons right now. 
Um, and then my writing as well. And generally, I just try to post helpful stuff I find on Facebook, not as part of anything. I recently, you know, sold off a couple of my businesses to downsize and focus more on my writing. Um, but I'm all over the place. I'm easy to find. If you can't find me, ask Russell. He knows where to find me. Um, and hopefully he'll be coming out for Cozy Mystery Con when that happens as well. Oh, I would love to. Uh, okay, last question really quickly. We forgot to say, when is Book Fest? Oh, my gosh. October 23rd and 24th. And watching it, it's very similar to what you're doing here. We have it on the website, on an iframe. It's on YouTube. It'll be on Facebook. Go to doublefest.com. Sign up for email alerts, and you'll always be in the loop. Awesome. All right. I'm going to let you go to sleep, uh, Desiree. And, uh, and well, also, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you're going to sleep, too, Melissa. But uh, we'll let you get back I'm going to have night. dinner. That's awesome. been happening in the background. <laughs> awesome. Wonderful. Well, it was great to see you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Nice meeting you, Melissa. Thank nice you. Nice meeting Thanks you, Desiree. Me. You're like my other half. Yes, we'll we'll we'll, we'll chit chat sometime. Okay. okay. All right, and now uh, we are going to bring back on Monica, <laughs> and I promised I promised Monica and Nick again, and look, you get Monica and Nick again. <laughs> Yay! Here Hello, we are. Here we are. Uh, I, I told, I was saying in the last hour, I should just let you run that hour because you were like asking all of these questions, Nick. Like, and I was like, I'm just going to ask this one. I'm going to ask this one. I'm just going to ask this one later. Uh, there are a couple of questions, though, that I thought uh, we should answer. Uh, Monica, yeah. since Monica literally uh, runs the Facebook group for Clubhouse, uh, what is Clubhouse? Yeah. So, Clubhouse is, uh, it's basically audio only and you go into rooms. And uh, it's also, it's not really recorded. So that's kind of nice. So if you want to just, if you want to talk to people, but you don't want to like have it um, memorialized forever on the internet, then that's like kind of cool. So a lot of people are like, no, I want like everything I ever do to be recorded and people can find it later. And then some people are like, you know what, that's not what I want. I want, you know, some, I want, I want to, um, you know, have a network with people, but also, you know, have, have like my privacy or keep my search engine results clean or whatever it is. So people, um, so when, when it first started, people were doing stuff like this on it, like, you know, Hey, it's like the, like the three of us, we're going to do a, a talk, a panel or whatever. People can come up and ask questions. And I feel like there's been some other um, uses for it in the author community. So one of those things is, uh, writing sprints, like people go on and they do writing sprints together. Another is there's um, the Indie Author Conference. So like every morning, well, at my time, I'm in I'm in Central. I think it's at like 8 a.m. or 7 a.m. Like sometime that I can't make it, so I'm never at it. But they do a talk for like an hour and it's like, you know, 50, 60, 70 people that are all able to talk, like anybody's able to talk. And they just, it's just like a, evolving conversation so there's never a topic but it's like um hey you can connect with authors at this time so there's a number of different uses i haven't seen a ton of uses on the fiction side so if you're trying to find readers there there's not a ton of uses but if you want to get connected to the clubhouse community of authors you can go to you can go on facebook the group is called clubhouseauthors.com and there's about or sorry clubhouse authors there's no.com, but you would search for clubhouse authors. I think there's over a thousand people in the group now. So that will get you connected. Awesome. And you can also find our Facebook group while we're on there, the supercharged yeah. book. Uh, yeah. It's called, book. Yeah. I think it's called, it's called book sales, supercharged um, advanced book marketing. So it is on Facebook. It's a small group. It's on clubhouse. It's a bigger group. Um, it's like, you know, not a huge group, but it's a much bigger group on Clubhouse. Uh, and we're not, we haven't done much with it yet, but we intend to do more with it. Well, this is kind of the cool thing about this. And by the way, my goal was as was to get uh, by the end of uh, this stream to get to uh, 250. And uh, look, we went to Yay. about 250. We're at the exact Ooh. number that I wanted to get to by the end of here. Um Sweet. Which usually I would do, usually this would be the number that I would be wanting to reach with a four book launch. So we're doing this with mm -hmm. one book. And like, I'm very, very excited that like we were able to like get this. This is a very different campaign that we've, that, 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 uh, that I've run that I'm normally, uh, mm -hmm. that I'm normally used to. So yeah. very, uh, 
very happy. Um, of course, this is the last day to get Monica. So Monica's doing this thing that I absolutely do not recommend, but like she's doing it anyway. Um, uh, I told her, we don't do anything. About it. I was like, I was like yeah, don't Monica, do anything. what the heck? <laughs> so I said, don't do anything you have to deliver. Like, like don't do anything you have to deliver live. And she's like, instead of that, I'm going to deliver uh, six presentations live. And so this is the last day to get her early bird, uh, early bird perk for Facebook advertising, uh, and also qualify for all of the other ridiculous things she's unlaunching during this campaign, uh, which all tie back to certain books in the uh, uh, book sales supercharge series. So if you are, this is these are ninety seven dollars. They're going to be once uh, she does them, and like we're doing them for, she's doing them for free. Literally, if you spend one dollar she'll give you like $500 for free. Like I usually give a lot away on campaigns. Like this is way more than like I've ever given away in a campaign before. And, and <laughs> K Katrina's on Facebook saying, what happened to listen to Russell, Monica? You know what, he, it, 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 all, all the things that I didn't listen to him on, like always come up during these things. It's really like the only two things. Well, I mean, one was like preparation. So, but like the pre-launch page was the big one. And then the other was, this thing um because what russell normally does is he does uh books which makes a ton of sense for fiction so it's just like other fiction books that somebody would really love uh for so we were gonna do that for this and i kept having that like intuitive like i don't know this doesn't feel like it's gonna be sticky to me um and i don't i don't know why but um, so for nonfiction, I think that this actually makes a lot of sense uh to do like more of a workshop because i think a book is really hard to get into the hands of authors, like, especially if you are trying, you know, because Russell sometimes gives away 20 books as part of his, like, um, perks, you know, week to week. Uh, 20 author books is not, like, super doable in terms of, like, reading things. You know, it's just, like, a lot of overwhelm. Uh, so is, you know, six workshops so they're two hours each like that can also be a lot of overwhelm but it's certainly more like you know that's like okay it's a course like at the end you know when you get it at the end it's like more of a course and and i also think the price point um being higher is uh more important with nonfiction versus fiction so that was kind of my thinking behind it uh well, but one thing, thing that i thought you did was yeah, really ahead. smart was like you're tying them back to books that we've done like we did a facebook advertising book the the day one perk was uh amazon so mm -hmm. like you can literally in the book once you once we launch the book once you launch the book yeah can, like we're, we we have a book literally on right. facebook advertising like we're doing like we haven't written it yet but like yeah uh you know yeah well we've written parts of it but it's not like it's not like assembled and stuff it's kind right. of yeah, so there are parts to, to continue writing, but some of the books are actually fully written, and then some of the some of the workshops are just like sections of the Kickstarter book. So you kind of like the buyer psychology one. That's like, so all everything I chose was material I already had. So like I could literally, I, I am going to do some slides and stuff and try to be organized, um, but I could literally go on for two hours and just be talking about these things because you know, I know enough about it. So, um, yeah, I think it, it's going to depend on, you know, that's, I, I think that's really specific to a nonfiction campaign. I do not think it would work for fiction at all. I think what Russell does for fiction is like the ideal thing. Um, well, and do. I think you're not going to be able to do it for like 20 launches, you know, like if you're trying no. to, if you come back <laughs> for another, like, let's say we come back and do like, four more books in this series which we are not going to do like we're oh, not going to do that like this is this is the book we're launching <laughs> on kickstarter is, mm -hmm. like this is the only yeah. one but like if we were like coming to get a repeatable thing for nonfiction mm -hmm. books like the you couldn't you wouldn't come back and run like the same six things again and right. again and again like the the thing about doing the thing about what i do is i've run this is my fifth campaign this year like I'm tired, I'm tired. Mm -hmm. I, I told Monica, I was like, I'm tired. I can't yeah. like be as present <laughs> as I normally am. Mm -hmm. And like, if you're running a campaign every two to three months, like being live for 20 hours is a lot. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's a lot, lot of, of live stuff to be. So, and, and also just like, you're going to have people coming back and saying, I've already seen this already seen yeah. this so like what is mm -hmm. the benefit of me to do it again when you can b bundle in like the fiction books is like oh 
look, I'm not going to, I'm not like, I often have this many of the same books, every campaign. Like, you know, if I have 30 books, like probably 20 of them are ones I've used before in a previous campaign, but like new people don't have them. Or maybe like I put them not in the early bird perks. Cause like not everyone gets everyone. Um, but there's always going to be something that's like, oh, I want that book. Like, that's a new book to me. Like, that's a new thing. And like, I'm not repeating the same ones every campaign. I've got like a huge library of books that I can pull from. Um, so like, that is why, those are the reasons why I think it works for, 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 for fiction. But also it's like other people to promote my work, which right. is really why I'm doing it. Um, so I wanted to just circle back for a moment uh, to something you said earlier, Monica. This you know, I, it might have seemed like kind of a throwaway comment, but I think it's really important. Um, you were talking about how, you know, you know, what happened to listen to Russell? And, and you know, <laughs> Russell told you some things, and then oh. you were thinking about those things. And, you know, maybe, you, you, you know, things happen, life happens, you, you know, some things you, you meant to do, and it didn't work out exactly as you yeah. hoped. But then there are other things where you just made a different decision. And mm -hmm. what you said just now, because I wrote it down, you said, hmm, this, it just didn't feel sticky to me. So I want to hang on to that for a second, because this is one of the things that I, I want everybody who's watching this to have hope that someday they can understand all of this as much as you do and as much as Russell does and the other guests that we've had. And there absolutely is hope. And it's, it's that, you know, when someone suggests something to you and you have some experience with that and your, the experience that you've had in the past has calibrated your, your, your subconscious mind, your intuition so that you can, you know, when you hear a new idea, like the bells go off, like, Oh my gosh, that's perfect. Or red flags come up, like, okay, that worked for them, but I'm pretty sure it's not going to work for me, at least not in the same way or something. And the the I think that the key to um, to like learning the the key here is I want you to talk a little bit about how you made sure that you learned from your past experiences. And it would be great if both of you guys could talk just a little bit about that. Like, how did you, like for too many people, they just, oh yeah, I, I tried uh, Kickstarter and it didn't work. And then when I start asking my clients questions about how it didn't work, they can't tell me. And so, so how is it, like, what is different? guys, what did you do so that the experiences that you had actually calibrated your your mind and, and calibrated your instincts for this? Yeah, I mean, well, so uh, the one thing I do want to say is that, like, I trusted Russell a ton with this campaign. Like, we did, like, 95 to 99 percent. Like, like, if Russell said, like, run over here and do a cartwheel, like, I tried to run over there and do a cartwheel and do it, like, how he said and the reason why is because russell's system is like really tight and it oh it's it, really like, good works absolutely very 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 well and this was and i will say like this is it was real nerve-wracking because like monica is like a master marketer like she she <laughs> like worked marketing like her life was like marketing for like her most of her career so like having her listen to me was really friggin nerve-wracking because i was like what if this doesn't work and, like, and then yeah exactly you think to yourself like, what if Boy, we don't do I, it i said like, that really confidently i hope yeah. it works out yeah he, <laughs> yeah, he was so, really confident but yeah so like so, well i was confident outwardly but like inwardly yeah. it was like man i really <laughs> hope this works but like and like she was so like when we've done videos you can go to mm -hmm. uh think uh uh a kickstarter novel forward slash yes pod, uh, yeah, well, YouTube. It's like YouTube yeah. or something. And yeah, it'll like you give you see, a whole playlist of all of our videos so far. Including me literally spending like two hours going through and seeing all of the stuff and just having her change it. And like Monica was a dream client to work with because she's like, all right, I want to do this stuff. I'm going to do it. And I was like, God, I hope this works. God, I hope this works. <laughs> and then and like people, we talked about this in one of the videos, like, uh, uh, but like, it's not a, or like on a poster or something, but like, it was not a guarantee that this was going to work. Like Monica's never launched on Kickstarter before. Like this book series is not out. I mean, it's selling, yeah. but like, it's not 60,000 books selling, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. it's a book on Kickstarter for 
it's a book on Kickstarter about selling books on Kickstarter. Like, is it going to be a gimmick? Like, is it going right. to like work? Like, is anyone going to care? Like the author community um, is not supportive of Kickstarter in the way that they're supportive of Patreon or Amazon or any of the other things. So like, you know, Sadly for 10 true. years, I've been for five years, I've been talking about Kickstarter and like people have just literally tuned out, like sometimes, sometimes just like tuned out, cutting off and sometimes very rude, which Monica saw and sometimes yeah. straight up mean. And so mm -hmm. like, I, I, you know, I've had success on novels, but like, I'm not Brandon Sanderson. So like, what, like there were all of these factors that, um, you know, Monica's never written a Kickstarter book before. Like there's all these things. And Monica, a lot of her stuff is on craft. It's, it's mm -hmm. not as much on the sales side of this. So this whole series is like a sales. It's like, this is not like crafting or writing more or, or like writing faster or like, which is all marketing. To me, that's marketing. To me, yeah, like writing 5,000 words a day yeah. is marketing just like everything mm -hmm. else is because it needs yeah. to faster to market. Yeah. But like the thing that she's known for is not like sell, like like the sales process. So there's all, and I've never launched a nonfiction book before. Like there's not, there's not many nonfiction books that are on Kickstarter. So like, right. um, it's it, like none of this was a guarantee. It was like- exactly. So, but, but here's the thing though. So Russell, I've followed you for a long time and I have read your, I, I don't know how many people actually read all your emails, but I read almost all of the emails that you send. And um, I maybe read them a little bit differently because I'm reading them as a writing coach with my clients in mind. And so I take notes on what you write. I don't know if you knew that, <laughs> but um, so I know a little bit about how, like, you know, you started out with Kickstarter and you're like, you know, you, you, you studied the campaigns that worked and you tried to emulate them and some things translated really well and other things didn't. But, but the, the, the thing is that you, I saw you doing three things that many other people don't do with any of their marketing. And so this is very, important for Kickstarter, but this is important for every kind of marketing uh, or PR or whatever you do to promote your book. Um, you you did your homework ahead of time, obviously. I mean, that's why, if, look, if you're watching this, you're doing this, you're here watching because you're trying to do your homework ahead of time. So good for you, step one, done. But Russell would take notes on what he was doing and how he was doing it so that he could remember later what happened. And Russell pays attention to his analytics. Uh, so many of my clients don't even know like where to find analytical information. Um, and uh, at the end of it, when it's all over, the 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 natural thing to do was to go, "Wow, that was awesome!" and just you know fulfill your backers. Or if it if it failed, if it went badly, you just go, "Ah, well, you know that sucked," and you just go on to the next thing without debriefing with yourself. And go back over your notes and ask yourself, okay, so so this didn't go well. Exactly how did it not go well? And figure that out. Or wow, this went really well. What what was it that helped it go well? And I know that you go through this process, process Russell, because you talk about it in your emails. Well, so on top um, of that, I talk about it with people like Monica. Like Monica yeah. launched the world needs your book a couple of years ago. And like I don't know how many times I reached out to her about it, about and talked to her about it, but like a bunch. And Monica does the exact same thing. So everybody who's watching, take notes, pay attention to the analytics, and debrief with yourself when you're done. Yeah. With well, whatever you're doing. Well, you know, I think we did some debriefing kind of at the beginning too, where we were like yeah we should have like russell was like yeah you should have gotten that pre-launch page done and i was like yeah you're right like and, and the thing is like i mean you have to talk to people who um like understand it the, or who like can understand what you're doing like so like russell is also a master marketer <laughs> like um we you know and that's that's why like i i was good to implement his system because it's not that I am like amenable to people's systems. It's just that his system was right, like every step of the way. And that was something that I confirmed for myself just by like listening to him talk. And he would say like, oh, I do this because of this. And I'm like, you know what? You're right. Like, like, it's just like, 
Like, you're right. Yeah, that is the way yeah. we should do it. Like, it wasn't that I was, you know, just blindly following him. It's like he, yeah. like he was right every single step of the way. Um, even like the two, you know, the things that we, um, like the, the workshop thing, for example, you know, I, it was like, yeah, I think he's, I think this is exactly what he should do for fiction. And like, it works. But I was like the nonfiction thing, like the only difference is that I know how to sell the nonfiction audiences. Um, like I just have a lot of experience with it. And uh, Russell has a lot of experience too. But I have like my experience is just like um, really fine tuned. And I also know my audience is the other thing. Like I know my audience is not going to like go for a book like like they probably have like a bunch of my books already so that was the other thing is we were going to use some of our books and i was like you know all my like a lot of my people they already have the books like that's not what they want they want like more time with me or you know they want like yeah. this sprint with us here um which a couple of the people uh that bought the whole book series they're doing the sprint with us here um so it was it was like um that was part of it too where it's like yeah, maybe for like Russell's audience, a bunch of books would be great. And so maybe we missed out somewhere there um, where like we could have used my books to like get them in. Um, but I knew my audience was not going to be as into the books like they either, they either had them or they had already been offered them and they didn't take it um, when they were offered, you know, like a bundle or whatever. So that so it's like I just think that uh, in terms of learning, I mean, I think I think having the two, you know, two people on the campaign, like we, we talk like kind of every day right now, because we're talking about this campaign and we're like, what's going, what's going well, what's going wrong. And I, I also think that like, there, there has to be a level of like willingness to um, receive that feedback, you know, because mm. I've, I've also like a, a lot of people aren't super willing to look at like what went wrong that's very stressful for them yeah whereas yeah. like like i think both russell and i are like no like let, like we want to know what what went wrong yeah. we want to well, like it, have it takes a certain amount of courage right yeah. it, it takes a certain amount of courage to go okay that was bad let yeah. me stare it in the face and figure it out well and also surviving the failure like i did a video it's funny we talked about failure because like i literally 10 minutes before i got on the air 20 minutes i sent her a thing about like what if we fail and like i think it takes like me i failed a lot of nonfiction stuff like i'm not good at selling nonfiction, and part of this experience is like monica is good at selling nonfiction, and russell is good at kickstarter but like I had to take what I knew about Kickstarter and like, it's her campaign. Like, I know I'm a co-writer on this campaign, but like, even if you watch the old video, like I, ha I, I wrote it and then I had Monica come in and like, say, no, that's not a good question. Like, that's not good. Like, she was on the phone with me as we were doing it. And she's like, yeah, my audience, like that, that's not good. Like I was, it's too direct. Like, I tend to be like very direct in the things that I say and, Monica, uh, like Monica is more delicate in the way that she, 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 she says, not that she's a delicate person, just like she, the words that she says, just like, she, she, maybe she, a little more, more diplomatic. <laughs> yeah, okay. Dip, diplomatic. Well, like, well, like yeah. It was about like melding the, it's like, okay. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the perfect thing is like the first three questions. It's like, here's the three questions. Like you have to have three questions. Like that's how I always do campaigns, but like, what the questions are was like 10 minutes of this video trying to figure out and rework it and then like when we left i said i this is the best i can make it and then she went in and like fine-tuned it again and we did it again off camera mm -hmm. awesome yeah exactly mm -hmm. but you asked the question about like how your question was like how do you like something about like how do you like how do you make learn this happen? Yeah, like, well, you so, learn by yeah. So like, there are three kinds of learning, right? Like, uh, uh, and the, the you know, there's audio, there's visual, but like most people discount like kinetic, and I am a kinetic learner. Like, I'm not saying everyone learns, but I have very hard times with like courses and things like that. Like, I just say, all right, whatever. Like, I'm just gonna do it. Like, I I, I like the courses, but then I'm like, I'm just gonna cool. This is the steps. Like, I'm just gonna go and mess with it and like fail a bunch of times. But like, I think that you have to not just be willing to fail, but you have to have variants of failure. Like Monica and I and you, like I've done consulting and I've done coaching and I've done apps and I've done all of this stuff. And like, I've tried all of the things and like, 
I think that I know who I am and Monica knows who she is. And like when something is wrong, we just have worked in the business for so long. It's just so long and so not just so long, but just so long in so many ways. Cause there's some people that like have the one book series and they're like, I've got 50 books in this series. And like, I don't know how to do anything else, but write this series. But like, I know how to write this series. Um, but like, and like they have their own gut for like that thing, but like part of being open to new experiences or trying Kickstarter or, or is like being able to say, I've tried this and this is why it failed. And like, it, I know that it failed in this way because I saw this failure this time, this time, this time, this time, and this time. I didn't just try it once. Um, what I generally do is I'll like, I'll try and I'll fail and I'll be like, hmm. I wonder if it's for this reason or that reason or this reason. And then I'll like go and just like run headlong back into failure again and be like, Oh, that's why. Or like and a lot of times, like, I'm just not ready. Like I'm not ready to put, um, in fact, the main reason that I like, I, 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 I agreed to, to have Monica integrate the books together is I was like, I don't have the time, the energy or the inclination. And like, that's why it was failing. Like it was failing, not because it wasn't great. Uh, cause it is, like it's because I wasn't willing to put in the effort that Monica is for this part of the business that she loves so dearly. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and yeah, so I've committed like probably, well, I mean, many years of my life to this, but um, this past year, especially like I've been really committed to this series and it's, it's a lot, <laughs> but, but I mean, you know, I'm kind of like, well, we're going to finish up this series and then I'm on to my fiction series. Um, you know, kind of like in that transition space because we are giving, I mean, this Kickstarter campaign is giving it a really big push, but yeah, like it, there's like speaking and, you know, like we're both speaking at 20 books, for example. Um, and that's something, you know, Russell. Yay. Yay. That's no small <laughs> thing. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, but I mean, you know, Russell wasn't like, I think like you you weren't planning on doing that like you're doing that for this campaign but like this is the thing that i've been doing like for like a year plus <laughs> where russell has you know russell's been working on this fiction and stuff like that which is um yeah it's, it's just like a time thing so but, but i just also I just like, summarize like this else. a little yeah oh, so I no, go ahead like, go it, ahead it helps to have somebody else but it's very like yeah, i've done a lot of partnerships and i swear to you like i mean our partnership is good nick but like it's kind of like a one and done like we've been me and monica have been working together weekly for like a year and like this is yeah. like the easiest and the best partnership i've ever done because like we both are deferential to the other one yeah. we've both done a lot of stuff and we've known each other for for I don't even ever. It feels like yeah, forever, like years. Like, like years. <laughs> and like we've watched each other's careers go. And like I remember when I was when I was looking to sell the company, like Monica was one of like the top three names that came into my head of who I would like to 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 to, to, to shepherd it because we just even though we talk differently and we do different things, like the attitude that we had was very collaborative. And also we kind of had like many of the same courses and ideas and just things. And so like I, I was done with nonfiction like last year around this time and like Monica working with Monica and watching her. And we, we had like a year before we had this campaign to like really, be, and I was, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, a wary dude. So like, I was like, I love Monica. Like I signed these contracts, like, yeah. God, I hope it goes well. And then I, I just <laughs> saw her for like a year, like integrating stuff, like getting stuff together. And like, sometimes it would go slower or faster than I expected. And yeah. sometimes we would leap forward, but like it took, you know, by, by, by being able to integrate in the way that we are. And one of the main things, one of the things that's really helpful about this book, this book specifically, the, the kickstart, uh, the Brazilian book on Kickstarter is like, we are debriefing all of the time because it's part of the book. Mm -hmm. Like, part, like a big yeah. part of the book is Monica going through and like talking about every stage of this campaign. So like, we literally are building debriefing into it. And often mm -hmm. I'll, that's so I will important. text something to her or like message something to her or like, I'll just tag her on something and be like, this is probably good for the book too. Yeah. Like, I literally did this yesterday. I, I tested a sentence and I was like, this is probably a good book, something, something for the book. 
Mm-hmm. Anyway, sorry, Nick, you were. No, no, that's that's great. I mean, uh, the the thing about the the debriefing is the other thing that I wanted to say. You've actually just been talking about it and taking it a, a second, another step further. Like a a lot of these things that I that I just put in the comments. If you're watching on YouTube, is um, uh, these are all things that you can kind of do on your own, right? Um, you know, doing your homework, you can do that on your own. Make the best plan you can. It would be great if you could collaborate with other people. You could do that by yourself. Do it. Take notes. You can do that by yourself. But then at the end, when you debrief, it is so important. I mean, oh my gosh, at least debrief by yourself, right? But if you... Uh oh, Nick froze. Frozen. <laughs> well, I'm gonna just carry on on this. Yeah. Because, like, one of the things about <laughs> debriefing. Can someone who oh, is goes. is a proven expert at whatever it is that you're doing, and hire them for an hour or two or three, and say, "Hey, I did this thing, a Kickstarter launch, or I did this Amazon ad campaign, or whatever thing it is that you did. I did this thing, and here's how it worked out, and um, you know." Help me make sense of this. I, I kind of think that this is, I think that this is why this part went well. And I think this is why this part didn't go so well and see what someone who ha- really has proven experience has to say about it. Debriefing with, uh, with a seasoned uh, expert um, is, oh my gosh, that is golden. If you can work with a seasoned expert for the whole process, oh, that's great. Not all of us have those resources. But at least debrief with someone who can who can help you debrief accurately. And yeah. you can do that in our sprint with you two <laughs> at hundred dollars. We're gonna go through well, all the campaigns. I but was hoping that, that was, you would bring that up. <laughs> yeah, so like for a hundred dollars, like you get the book and you get the sprint with us tier for 150, you get also access to the course immediately. You have access to the to the uh to the um, Facebook group immediately. We'll send you a link to the Facebook yeah. group. But one thing that I will say about debriefing is like the way that I debrief, not just with Monica, but like with RJ, for instance, like here's uh, uh, my friend Demelza, like all of these people, like I just am texting them not to say what is this, but just like, damn, that was really good. Like that was a real good like launch. Like what? Like that was so much better than every other launch you've ever done. What happened? Like or just congratulating them. And like you build this trust with the people, the, like the cohort, I mean, the cohort that you come up with is like so important, not beca- because it trains you to be able to talk with someone like Monica, because like me and Monica didn't come up together. Like I didn't start re- releasing books in 2015, but like, you know, I had a kind of cohort of like creators who I worked with and like, we sort of built each other up and like, you know, some of them are working on webtoon, and some of them are like editors and some of them are this, that, and the other thing. But like, you know, you don't need a huge cohort, like five, 10 people, but like the more success that you can all funnel into each other by, you know, often the failure is not my failure anymore. It'll be like Monica's failure. And you'll be like, no, we don't, you don't, don't do a, don't do fussy librarian or like, sorry, not, not to call a fussy librarian. Like <laughs> they're great, but like, yeah. I did the first one, like, no, no, no. Like, like, they, 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 like their, their read through of the past five series I did with them, like has been down like 30%. And like, often you get like the, 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 the leading edge of stuff that hasn't even made it out yet by just literally debriefing or offering things to people, not when they don't want it, but like, you know, like if they're asking questions, like offering real tangible advice that works and then letting them do it. Like it's, it's this like the vibe of like being helpful, but not, but, but also, um, but also like accurate. Cause like Monica said earlier, like if I had said a bunch of stuff that was like stupid and didn't work, like we may not be doing this book right now. Like uh, yeah. maybe like, this is, if this is the advice that you give, we're not making this thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like Russell, uh, well, it's 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 like I knew Russell knew what he was talking about because he has the success. Like like you can't, it's like you can't um, skirt the truth of things. You know, like Russell, he's got the truth on. Like the truth is right there, and then like at every step, um, 
yeah, just the marketing was solid. And um, we, we, you know, we followed. So, so I can't say I did everything that Russell would do. I wanted to do everything that Russell would do, though. And I hope to do everything that Russell would do the next time. And then with this debrief stuff, you know, we have like Russell's been doing some debriefs actually of um, friends of ours, uh, including RJ, including Krishan, um, their Kickstarter projects. Um, he's done some debriefs of successful ones. We're starting to do some debriefs of unsuccessful ones that we've gotten permission for. And we actually got permission for all of them. Just, just, you know, but like that is cool too. So like, if you maybe like Russell, you can't get Russell, um, for budgetary reasons or whatever right now, there are some videos on the YouTube playlist that we've been talking about. So it's kickstartyournovel.youtube.com slash YouTube, uh, where you'll be able to see like how Russell thinks about this stuff and then mm -hmm. it'll be in the book and all that stuff. So, you know, obviously it's good to have Russell kind of on your project um, yeah. specifically. That is yeah. extremely, there's like massive value around that. Having oh, yeah. it privately, you know, he has a consulting tier that's um, $500. And we, you know, we have people taking it because it's like, you can make back that money um, like oh, significantly yeah. more than that in a Kickstarter campaign. So it's like, oh, yeah. wait, how, how much money like do you want to lose? Sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how much money do you want to lose if you don't consult an expert first? Yeah. Well, spend the money up front and do it right and earn the money mm -hmm. back. Well, one and, of the you hardest know, things about um, the, one of the hardest things about this is knowing what to look for. So, like, not mm. just going to, through campaigns. But like you look through Brandon Sanderson's campaign, like you're not going to learn anything from it. He's Brandon Sanderson. Like, yeah. you, I mean, you will learn Completely something. Completely like cl different because, situation. Like, he clearly, like probably paid like fifty thousand dollars for a marketing company, or someone did it. Like, did the campaign well, no, for him no, to do no, it? Well, but like, maybe it really, you know, who's can you know who can learn from a Brandon Sanderson campaign? John Scalzi. Yeah. But if you're cool. not John someone Scalzi level, yeah. with five million books already in print. Mm -hmm it's it's you know comparing apples and 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 table grapes you know yeah, i mean we did we just looked at rj's campaign earlier and like she says like if you look at rj's campaign and just follow it you're not gonna do well because yeah, yeah like she did her <laughs> campaign she's like selling like hundreds Crazy. of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. worth of books and she made that campaign specifically for for fan for like existing fans and did not promote it at all. So like if that is if you look at that campaign, like you'll say, oh well, I can just do this. And you're like, no, no, like yeah. you're not RJ. Well, like you're no, not. No, if if your like, situation is the same as RJ, then go mm -hmm. ahead. Yeah. But if your okay. situation is different, your campaign has to be different. This mm -hmm. is why it's so important to understand the principles that we've been talking about for the past three hours. Because yeah. the principles can translate to your particular uh, personal idiosyncratic individual situation. But if you just if you just blindly copy and paste what someone is doing who's completely different from you, it don't be surprised if it doesn't work. Yeah, I'm, 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 let's get to some of the questions. But one of yes, the things, yes. before we do that, I just want to say, like, for instance, the three questions that I ask at the beginning of a campaign, like, if you don't know why I ask them. Or, or like the, the 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 psychology behind that, like it doesn't make any sense. Like it worked. Like Monica knew it immediately because like this is our this is our world. It's like but, it's so genius. You know, but like it's a small thing. But like you can't just ask, do you want potatoes? Are you a, are, 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 are you friends with a Tom? Like like it's not three questions. It's three very specific it's, kinds it's of questions. Very, yeah. And so like having not like having the base knowledge is so important to know why like I bold it, why like it works, and all of those things mm -hmm. and the reason i think that me and monica worked so well especially with this campaign was yeah. just like we all we both speak marketing yeah we're like, just marketing like, people you know yeah. like, like like at the beginning of this thing where she did the we need a glossary and, guys like, i've been taking like, notes of words that you guys have been using that i'm like you gotta define me she said like three b uh, th uh, yeah, five, five b, b. Th yeah. three v and i was like oh yeah of course like yeah. <laughs> so we just speak that language okay so uh karen uh 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 Probably got the question that most people have, uh, which is exactly. she missed some things because, like, of course, like this has been long and uh, and uh, and 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 packed full of stuff. But like, how do you have a successful Kickstarter without a fan base? I think RJ and Krishan answer that. But also, like, how do you build a fan base? I will yeah. take the the former. If you are working in the comics category, 
Um, I think it's a lot easier to make a successful Kickstarter without any fan base because there are people that are there. Like there's a community. One of the things we're trying to do, like more than really anything for me, the most important part of this campaign is to try and foster a community on Kickstarter in the publishing category that is like the novel category so that people like are on like people consider this a part of their launch they come back to it they nurture it they have fans and the and the and the fans are searching for other campaigns which is not a thing that generally happens in the publishing category so um if you're if you're working in board games or comics this is this is not so much your thing because you have real slamming categories as far as like ha- finding people with no fan base um uh, but uh, uh, Monica, I'd love for you to talk about that or yeah. Nick. And and also like, then we can move on to the thing that is more important, which is like building the fan base before the campaign and mm-hmm. the most, which is the most important part of this. And not, and if you have a campaign, how to build interest in this book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think like, you know, building a fan base before the campaign, whether you launch on Kickstarter or a retailer, you need to do like, some basic things like and i think one of the most for a fiction campaign anyway one of the most important things is you need some sort of sample of your work and so yes you can use like first 10 chapters that has worked really well for russell i think that works really well for really any book but um you know another thing that authors do is they do like the prequel novella or the prequel short story and so it's something that they the series is not you know it's not something that they're selling it's something that they're going to do for free and so if you have that then all of a sudden your marketing is just like getting traffic to that and making sure it's interesting enough that people will like sign up to an email list or something similar so like in the publishing industry Book funnel is book fun like book funnel. There's another company called Story Origin. There's a couple of them, and like authors do group promos. I put a prequel novella in one of those in in many of them actually. In I think it was August, um, so kind of like a slower publishing month anyway. I mean, I got like 1,500 emails. Like, not even kidding. I, and it's it's just like. You got to, you got to, um, you mean you, you know, had 1500 people sign up for your email, 1500 right? people sign up because sign up. of the cross promos. And that was only for one month. You do it for three months, for five, four months, six months, like whatever your lead time is like, it, it really is kind of this numbers thing. Um, and so then once you have those emails, well, now I can make them an audience on Facebook. And so what, what kind of ad does well on Facebook? Honestly, it's again, the sample. It's literally just an excerpt of the first chapter is one of the best things that you can do on Facebook. It's the thing that Radish uses right now. Um, And and so you can do like something shorter, of course, and you can do like the book description, you can do a bunch of stuff like that. But like, that is going to work if you do it as a Facebook ad, and you can do like a dollar the right audience. Right, right. Yes. Target. (laughs) target Finding your audience. Like the most important thing. But yeah, like, and same with uh, what Russell said with the viral giveaways. And so, so it's like, just you, I I would say like sample plus email list. Mm -hmm. That's how you build. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, um, yeah. Oh, Oh, well, uh, so let me, let me just throw something in real quick about finding your audience. It's, it's, um, so, and I'm, I'm looking at Karen McCarthy's question here. So I'm imagining you're an author. You say you do not have an existing fan base. Okay. So when you know you don't have a fan base, your first step is to figure out who your fans could be. So what is it that's great about your work, about the things that you write, whatever it is that you write, genre, topic, whatever. So like, what is that thing that's in your writing that is going to be valuable to other people? And then figure out who likes that thing and then figure out where those people hang out. Now, the easiest place to look for them is online, but that's absolutely not the only place to look for them. This is one reason why it is so great to go to cons and go to book festivals, or maybe it's not that. Maybe it's a a professional convention, like whatever it is that you're writing about. Figure out where people like that who who are into that kind of thing, figure out where they go and go. And don't, don't just buy a table right away. 
just go as a participant and check it out and see what it's like. Sign up for the Facebook groups or sign up for the Goodreads discussions or whatever, and just participate as a, a fellow fan because you love this stuff too, right? Or you wouldn't be writing about it. And figure out like, like how they how people communicate. If someone were to launch, not you, but someone else were to launch something, how does that community talk about it? How do they get excited about it? Do they share links or like what 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 did what do they do? What works there? But you have to if you if you say you don't have a fan base, it sounds as if you're not part of your own fan base yet. So step one is to find your fans and become part of whatever that is. And then step two is to start appealing to them, letting them know, well, as you know, as a matter of fact, I I write, you know, I write vampire romance too. Um, and oh really you do? Well you're an instant micro micro celebrity just by saying, oh yeah, I write I write that too, because that's what they want. They want vampire romance or or whatever it is. Um, so, um, you also find I, out in that thing, like what kind of covers work, what kind of books they exactly. like, exactly all of that stuff. But here's the thing, um, take notes. The, the first thing that you have to do is like make a thing, like all of this stuff is great. But like the thing that we don't talk about ever is like, you got to make the thing, Karen, you got to make a book. Yeah. Like, you got to make a thing. Like you've got to make a thing and like, yeah, it has to be At least exciting one and good to prove so, that you like, really are a creator. You have to create well, like, and, a, and a yeah. creator that people should care about, like not just as a friend. Like I don't care. Like like being a creator or like buying my books is not a condition of friendship for me. Or like <laughs> liking like uh, but like like if you want someone to to sign up for your mailing list or build a fan base, like you've got to have something for them to be a fan of, like and like exactly. what kind of stuff you're into, and not just like. And I talk a lot about like making a blog, like I use haunted houses. Like if you're going to make a, 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 a book about a haunted house, like having a blog about different haunted houses in the world and driving traffic to it and joining haunted houses things is like a great way to like build a, a excitement about like your haunted house book. But like you gotta, you gotta have the haunted house book. Like you gotta make the book, like, because that is how you make the fan base and you, you yeah. can't join book funnel if you don't have a, a book, like you, you, like you have to, in order to join a promo, you've got to have a book and it's got to be done and it's got to be edited. And it's got to be like a thing that is like that not just exists, but like exists and is of a quality that people will vouch for you, will want to join promos with you, that they will want to sign up for your email list. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And like on some level, you got to be an, an, an entertaining enough person, like not extroverted like me or like Monica or like Nick, but like, like interesting in a way that people will find you compelling enough that they want to read something that came out of your head. Because this is the thing, like you're trying, even if you're writing nonfiction, like this stuff is coming out of your head, your head, like, and people have to be like, yes, I want to read this random thing out of your head and trust that it's going to be good. Because even if you've written 20 books, like they're still buying a book without knowing what's inside the book. Right. Like this, so there's exactly. a trust that comes there. So you have mm -hmm. to have the thing, at yeah. least one thing. And really the more things you have, the reason, one of the reasons why people are more successful, the more books they come out is a, like people that, that aren't successful tend to not write the second book or the third book or the fourth book or the eighth book or the 10th book. But also it's like, Oh, you've written 10 books. Like, I'm finally going to take you seriously. Like, you're not going anywhere. Like, I got to check this out. And some of those people who check it out will be like, yes, I like this. And some of them will not be. I mean, mm -hmm. I have a series that is 11 books. It's going to be 11 books when we, when we do the next launch. And like, I have people saying, you wrote 11 books in a series? Like, just like out of novelty of how many 11 book <laughs> series there are, people are or like my next book is going to be, my next series is, that the Obsidian Spindle one is going to be 16 books, probably between 12 and 16 books. And like, yeah. eventually someone's just like, you were excited about this enough to write 16 of these things? Like, all right. But you like, didn't get bored of your own idea. Like, sure, like, like, yeah. But like, people expect it to be this massive thing when you've got one book. And like, it's probably yeah. not going to be unless you're like, uh, yeah. uh, unless you're like uh, 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 um, Melissa Albert or like somebody mm -hmm. who like wrote the one book and it just blew up. Um, yeah. but once, you, once you have the thing, then... Uh, 
the first hundred people are probably going to come from your exist and your mailing list or 50 people because you, you can't just join a, a book funnel promo unless you've got like a list you've got to have a list because you part of this is like you sending you it have to have your a newsletter list. yeah so yeah like, that's fair and, and so you've got to then you've got to like build either yeah. through like a viral giveaway like i do mm. we talked about like we talked about that earlier how to set that up um uh, through King Sumo or something and drive people to sign up that way. And then you have a list or ask your friends and family to do so if they want to, because like some of your friends and family are people who will like your books. Like mm -hmm. they are people who will enjoy your work. Some of them may just do it to shut you up, but like <laughs> there are people that are in your friend group who will like your books. And that is because yeah. you all have the same taste. Like you have the same, that's why you're friends. On that's some why level. you're friends. Yeah. Like you have taste that is similar. And so you have to do like, you will find some people that are on your mailing list. And a lot of people aren't like many of my friends, many, 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 the vast majority of my friends are not on my mailing list or they have yeah. unsubscribed from my mailing list or they never back my books or they've stopped backing my books. But like mm -hmm. there are some people and it's going to be weird. It's going to be weird. It's weird because like some people that buy, <laughs> sell, buy my books, like I don't understand how, like why that they are the ones, because like they're often friends of mine from high school or friends from mine from college or someone who I rarely saw. And like they bought my, but like there are people that are going to be on your list and then uh, you can join the book funnel promos or the viral giveaways and like build and build and build and build and build. And for a long time, because then the next thing is like a fan base is, by definition, a fanatic about your thing. And if you stop doing things, they're going to stop or that you're, you make things that aren't good or not to their taste. They're going to turn away or something else. So you have to keep making stuff, but you also have to keep doing marketing. You have yeah. to keep your email list up. You can't uh -huh. just do yeah. it for like two promos mm -mm. and then like it's done. Like you've got to be consistently doing it. Like, yeah. you know, Monica and I do, she just talked about like doing one in a bunch in August. Like mm -hmm. that's, she's been doing this for 10 years, oh, for 12 years now. And like, she's still doing them. Uh, mm -hmm. I still do them. The people that are succeeding are mm -hmm. doing them more and more and more and more and more and more and more over time. Mo Molly yeah. was talking about it. RJ was talking about it. Like all the people are consistent, consistently doing market. Yeah. I mean, I think like one thing to keep in mind, because like I know some people are like, well, but I'm not interesting. So I just want to <laughs> say like, um, I think everybody has that thing where they are interesting um, but they have, it's like, you have to like get to know yourself. And I think that's, um, really important as a creator anyway, is to like, get to know yourself better and be like, well, what is really interesting about me? And like, what is interesting about my books? And like, it took, you know, for me, it took me, like, it just took me a long time to figure that out. So I think like, give yourself time for that to, uh, figure out what that is. Um, I, I definitely know like what my little like fiction niche is. Like, here's why people buy this from me. And there's a book called uh, Universal Fantasy that is like topping the charts right now. It's by Theodora Taylor. And it's, I think, it, I think she's like T Taylor or something like that. Um, I highly recommend it if you are writing fiction because she really explains this. Uh, and, and like, I started like rewriting some of my stuff cause I was like, oh, I, I totally get that. Like people are coming to my books for this scene. And like, for me, the scene was these three guys who are like the, the hottest guys in this high school, basically they run the school. Um, and they're like also main characters in the series. They come up on motorcycles. There's, um, like they're the one of the guys, little sisters also is like part of this. And then there's like paparazzi behind them. And it sounds like totally ridiculous. It's like this hyped up, like popularity scene. That's like from the nineties, basically like any um, teen movie in the nineties, like this high school, like everybody staring at like, the hot people scene um, it's kind of like yeah. but I was like oh like I can just like add in motorcycles I can add in this I can, and I was like oh like, everything's I, I better with motorcycles <laughs> yeah like I get like what this is now which is like people are coming for like this thing of like feeling you know feeling 
like the popular kid from high school, basically. And uh, other people, that's not their, that's not your thing that you're writing. Like maybe you're writing the underdog. Like one of my best friends, she loves to write the underdog. Um, like we talk all the time, like upstairs, downstairs, like I'm writing like the Baroness and she's writing like the kitchen maid or whatever. And like, both of those have huge audiences and that's great. But yeah. like, you need to know what your thing is and it takes some time to get that. So. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, I will mention that like, you're writing a thing from your head, like on some level you have to think you're interesting. Like you have to, <laughs> like you have to think you're interesting. Otherwise you yeah. wouldn't write a book. Like it's a, it's a bunch of words from your head, like the yeah. and balls on us to do this. Like, You've got to think you're interesting, like just to do it. And even if you don't meant to, like in the front of your head, think you're interesting, like on some level, you think that it's interesting enough that you've written 60,000, 80,000, 100,000 words. Even if you don't think exactly. you're interesting, you think yeah. the world that you're writing in is interesting. Otherwise, you just wouldn't do it. Like, because mm -hmm. you think it's interesting to make it. And so someone <laughs> yeah. else has to think it's interesting as well. Yeah. Um, okay. yeah. So Ideally, a, I mean, you, and you can need to also figure out who that person is. is. Yeah, yeah. And anyway, I sorry. I, right, no, I'm going to beat the beat the audience thing to death because so okay, one more thing about the audience thing. Um you're right. Russell, you're not going to like make friends with everybody in your audience. However, um there is a like you you need to um I don't know how much people have already heard this, but it has to be said We've talked so much about marketing and I know that you guys are able to talk about marketing in sort of a, a systems kind of way without losing, uh, without losing sight of the, the, the humans that you're connecting with. The problem is that, and the reason why marketing has a bad reputation is that most people, when they start thinking marketing and you know conversions and click-through rates and stuff like that, they lose track of the humans in the process and they're just trying to maximize the dollars. And you cannot lose track of the humans in the process because the dollars do not have any agency. Dollars are not clicking purchase now buttons humans click purchase now buttons. So you, in, in all of your, going back to that original question, Karen, you know, how do I build a fan base? You, you've got to keep your focus on the humans who want the value that you are selling. And you've got to keep your, 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 all your marketing and your PR and everything. It's not really about your book. It's about what your book promises to humans who want that thing. So just, just keep, the humans in mind and and don't worry so much about the dollars and because if you can win if you can if you can win the attention and the interest and the curiosity and eventually the the loyalty and the enthusiasm of humans the dollars will follow don't worry about them monica you had something to add oh, i'm good that, that's that's it yeah i mean one of the things i say <laughs> ever uh, one of the most important things in my uh, i've ever said is treat people like more than a 20 dollar bill this is a amen, so brother. They, they live in 20. Like, yes. Uh, so we have another, one more question. Um, trying to scroll through to find we it. have so many questions. I'm no, sorry. No, we've, we've done a good we job. Have been we've done a good job. We've only got like one question that we haven't answered yet. Uh, we've got a lot of comments, but like I only got one question <laughs> that we haven't answered yet, which is a long one. So I believe oh, this was okay. kind of answered earlier, but for advertising oh, and yeah. PR for comics. I hear that podcasts are generally, and he said uh, novels too in the previous one. This, this mm -hmm, is proof. Mm -hmm. eh, novels too, of course. Yeah. Uh, uh, here, uh, what what is what do you do when one schedule isn't favorable to being on podcasts? I'm going to assume being on podcasts, uh, and you wouldn't be able to advertise through them very often. What are the next best best avenues to push through, Monica? Um, I mean, I think you know podcasts like is it the best tool or is it just a tool? Like, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, I've done a lot of podcasts and I, I know Russell's, Russell's done like even more podcasts than me. Um, yeah, I think it's a great tool. If you, if your schedule doesn't work for podcasts, there's like 20 other things you could do instead um, that will probably work better for your schedule. Um, every podcast I've ever done almost has been recorded basically, unless you count something like this. But like most podcasts are recorded, you just need to find a time with the podcast recorder, um, the person who's doing it. And if they really want you on on the thing, they're going to or if they like need somebody for that slot and like you're here, um, then they're going to 
work with your schedule. And I will say like a lot of podcast interviews that I've gotten. So you can wait for people to come to you or you can be like me and I think Russell and like maybe Nick as well, where like you start to pitch people and say like, Hey, like I'm talking about this. Can I be on your podcast? And like, Mm -hmm. Some of them will say yes. And a lot of podcasts I've been on have been me pitching them, um, including like uh, Russell and I did an interview years ago, years and years and years ago for his podcast. And I pitched him and he said yes. And then we kind of hit it off on the podcast. Um, And and like there were a lot of things I admired about him on the podcast. So then we became friends after that. Um, Mm -hmm. Or, you know, maybe we like kind of knew each other before that. But it was I, I had like asked him to be on his podcast. So, yeah, but I, I don't think I, I can't say podcasts are particularly like, you know, like the golden. I, I think that's the problem is like we're all looking for like the golden goose and yeah. it doesn't exist. Like you just well, you need to do podcasts, yeah. do some other stuff, too. <laughs> and and honestly, if you know, I totally understand not having time to do a podcast. Or, but but if you're just going to be a guest on someone else's podcast. But I don't understand what you don't have time for. I mean, that's like the one of the most time flexible things in the entire world of marketing. You know, just schedule it whenever it works for you and record it, you know, months in advance. Or like, I mean, it's just, it's so easy to be a guest on a podcast. It's kind of like, it's harder to be a guest on radio. The, the only times I've been a guest on radio, this will betray like, how unpopular I am on radio has been, I've had to get to this stupid radio station at like four 30 in the morning. And, yeah. um, yeah, you I've know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And fortunately they record those for later, but mm-hmm. no one ever listened to them. You know, if you didn't catch me live on the radio, you didn't hear me. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, how convenient is it for, for podcast? I mean, I okay, just so I don't know. Can, can we talk Go about ahead. the elephant in the room about podcasts? Because like it's the same with like publishers and the same as everything. It's like yeah. mm-hmm. oh. they don't want you unless you have newsiness. Like you have to pitch them in a way that like shows that they are going to get something. And like I have been on a right. on, on like for instance, comics launch, uh this podcast. I've been on it feels like a hundred times. Uh, it's not a hundred times, but it's like, it's like seven or eight times. And my friends, uh, same thing with my friends at, uh, at uh, fan base press, fan base weekly that I've been on a bunch of times as well. Like I, I talked to Tyler a couple of months ago and he said, what's the pitch? I was like, hey, I'm thinking about the show. Like, and he's like, what are we going to talk about? And I had a thing and like, we didn't talk about that thing, but like, I uh, talked about a different thing that was relevant to the thing we talked about, but like he wanted to know if I'm bringing you on my show, like what are you going to talk about? And like, it's gotta be more than just your book. Cause like everyone's got a book and like Brian, um, I think I'm not sure. I don't think you have many books out if you've got a comic yet out. And like, so like you can book any, like there's 150 Kickstarters going on 200, 300 Kickstarters going on. Like if your only news in this is like, I have a Kickstarter. It's like, cool. Uh, so do, like so does uh so does russell so yeah. does monica like so yeah. do all of these people that have way more experience like it has to be yeah um, it's good it's going to be the thing that makes you unique and interesting that's going to be interesting for the podcast and so whatever be, the value uh, proposition is for the book that you're writing yeah so and my, if, um, if they don't value that then they won't have you on and that's fine go to the next person yeah so my friend uh so me i've I, one of my books is on the moon or, or like and on Mars or one of the places like there was a thing that was like put your book on the moon like Monica you guys Nick you guys probably yeah like have at least heard of this and I was like yeah, yeah. that's yep. so stupid like I have to do it so like I buy <laughs> and like I paid like whatever the 10 20 dollars yeah. so like my book's on the moon now like to yeah. get my like one five, 10 megabytes of file and I was like that's stupid and I moved on uh it's fun like it's like it's like not stupid but it's like fun it's like a fun thing that i can be like hey like i'm on the moon like it's like a thing it's just starter of conversation and like it's a good marketing thing and like i thought it was funny and fun so i did it but like my friend tina i think it was tina uh uh she like got a whole spread in the local in her local paper like about author it was like author on the moon and like what we often don't think about with like podcasts or any of this marketing is like yeah, 
literally all of us in the publishing community knew about this thing. But like nobody outside of publishing knew that like they were sending a probe to the moon and were putting books on it. And like, well, and most people that, just like, put their names on it. You put a whole book on there. Most people just sent up their names. It, I mean, you can put anything you want in the text field. Most people put their names or like a, a wish for the future. But no, no, these, these were specifically like uploading books to the Oh, page. okay. It was a whole thing. It was a okay. whole thing. It was a, a, thing, thing. Yeah. Yeah, it was a, mm -hmm. it was a whole thing. And it was like a fun thing. Like so much in publishing is for like, like the news is dominated by horrible things that people have done. And for like one beautiful week or month, it was like, I'm going to the moon. Yeah. You know, like, that's, <laughs> I was like, really that's was. so silly. Like what a great so nice. week. Yeah. Yeah, it was so nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but like, you know, those are things that you can do like local news. You can do, uh, you can do uh, medium blog posts, get interviewed. Uh, we talked to, uh, Desiree about listicles about like the top 10 comics right now. I've been listed in some of them. Like I was listed like, like the bleeding cool did like the best horror comics and like Ichabod was number one of that list. And I was so wow. like flipped out over the moon for that. But like all of that is still stuff, but like the, they're not going to do much. They're just not going to do much. Cumulatively they matter over time and over years and over doing it and like i wouldn't be nowhere today without like my podcast and like having monica on and nick found me from that podcast and i met so many great mm -hmm. friendships from having that podcast and, like having your own podcast is another thing that you can do is like bring people on to your show on your terms i will do mm -hmm. your show brian if you have a show like like uh, everyone wants to do a podcast. No one wants to host a podcast. So this exactly. is exactly this is the secret for all marketing. Hundred like, <laughs> percent. Like, like if I could boil down marketing mm -hmm. to one thing, it's people mm. want to be part of things. They do not they want to lead things. They don't want make Always. the things. Yeah, yes. it's the and chicken. Yeah. It's a chicken little thing or the it's, little red hen or whatever it is. It's the you know yeah. Like yeah. everybody wants to eat the cake, but nobody wants to make the cake. If you're willing to make the cake, people will line up and pitch mm. you. They will pitch to you. You know, one of the great uh, suggestions, I, I can't remember who I heard this from, but it was a great suggestion. They said, look, if if you're an, an author starting out um, and you want to be on a podcast and nobody wants, you know, nobody accepts you on their podcast, start your own podcast and invite as guests all the people that you need to learn from and just make your learning curve public. It was just, it's probably it takes a lot know. of it was, courage. It was well, you did that podcast. also. It was, no, it you did that also. Like, like, that's what I did like that. But that is what I did. Yeah. I said, yeah. I don't know what I'm doing and I can't die an hour of everyone's time. So like, I'll do the podcast and then like, yeah. I'll record it on my terms and like, I'll do it until I don't want to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. And all, so all of those things are really like, if you don't, if, you, if, if no one is willing to make time for you, like like make do it yourself but yeah. like do it with intention this is the last thing yeah. that i will say because i know we're way over time and like oh, monica's gosh, got I'm a kid sorry. and, and like <laughs> no nick's way. got a beer to take care of uh, <laughs> but like i forget what i was going to say the last thing that i was going to say it was going to be so important it, it, oh it's with intention because yes. like i know so many people that have a podcast or have a, a review site or have a uh, medium page or like whatever and like they don't tie it with intention to any outcome mm -hmm. and so they move and kind of list listlessly like do it and they don't grow and like yeah maybe they get a press badge the shows or whatever and like you know you may only have 50 people listen to your podcast or less but like if you can get ben templesmith and monica and like Nick and all of these people, me and and uh, friggin Scott Snyder or whatever on your show, which you can. And there's a secret yeah. to it, which is if they are going to launch something within yeah, the next three go. months, <laughs> yeah. they will be on your podcast. They'll do it. Yeah, yeah. 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 they will do you it. You could have it's five because... listeners and they'll be on your podcast. Um, and I know because yeah. when I they that, show like, up, there'll be more than that. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and every time I'm like about to launch something, I'm like, I need to book a podcast. Oh my God. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. But I don't think about it until I want to launch something. So like you could literally, <laughs> you could literally be cool by association. You can call mm -hmm. Zenoscope or Boom and say, "Can I get on your review list?" And like, they may not all do it, but like some of them will do it. And and that is how you control when you record what you do and what you say. And yes, you then have to promote that and market that. But like, I my friend David Pepos became a writer at. Uh, became a writer at, I think, CBR for reviews. And like he used those reviews to build a network of PR and of, 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 of creators. And then he launched Spencer and Locke, which went bananas. And then he launched his next series, which went crazy. And he went to launch his next series and like it like went even more than that. And then he did a Kickstarter that like raised like $50,000. And but it started wow. with like he wanted to write for Marvel and like DC and he's like, maybe if I review those books, I can then make books and I will have a network. And so if you're doing any of this stuff, no matter what the, whatever the marketing is, like it has to be with intention, intention yeah. to meet people, intention to grow an audience, intention to just like have more backlinks, whatever it is, there must be intention behind it. An intention to create value and to add value, not to constantly take from other people, because they can tell. People can tell when you're when you're a vampire, and and when you're trying to help out. And people are very open to helping out. I'll be on your podcast. Uh, yeah, just pitch me. Um, if it's relevant, I'll I'll do it. Um, because all of us would like to help out people who are are you know coming up. It's just that. We, we don't want to waste our time, honestly, with people who are, are, are just going to, you know, try to take advantage of us. We want to help you out. We don't want you to take advantage of us. I'm just being vulnerable right here. Sorry. <laughs> no, I get it. Yeah. 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 yeah I would say I, I, most podcasts are, just to answer this thing, most podcasts are recorded way ahead of time, months ahead or days Most ahead. of them we are. Have, we have some recorded from months ago that we're going to drop mm -hmm. in the next That's couple of weeks. That's dropping now. Yeah. Sorry, Monica. Yeah. You, I didn't want to interrupt. Oh, you. yeah. I just wanted to like kind of extend that to say, um, so like, yeah, that's great for a podcast, but it's also like the actual book you're doing. Um, it's kind of the same thing that applies. Like this book that we're doing, it's the first, it's like the first and only one in this category. Um, and I like, I've told people like, yeah, the reason like, like anybody could, could like master Kickstarter and write this book, but like, Russell is the one who did that, right? Like, <laughs> so it's like, like, um, there's so many little spaces where it's like, yeah, somebody would love to like figure, you know, so I, I think it's really important to just, you know, figure something out, like, um, like Nick was saying that has value. And then like, people are going to come to you. So if you're doing, mm -hmm. the, it's just like doing the work. Um, and, and Russell didn't set out to like master Kickstarter. Um, for to like explain it to all these other people he set out to master kickstarter because he needed to for his own stuff and that was his motivation but then it's like now we have this book and literally nobody else is doing this like nobody else is doing the book um and so that you know i think that's that can apply to a podcast it can also just apply to like the comic book that you're doing so it's like those types of projects they stand out on their own like um, so, so I, one thing I wouldn't advise is like to start a podcast so that, that you hope that it like promotes your book. Um, mm. it's like, like Russell said, it's gotta be tied very closely together. Um, so, you know, you don't, do you want to be a podcast creator? Um, or do you want to like make a comic or a novel or whatever? And it's like, you can do the same thing with the, with just like writing the novel. <laughs> it's like, you can make yeah. it like a big thing too. Um, oh my so, God. That is the best marketing. <laughs> it is. Like, but, the best like, marketing is absolutely the next book. <laughs> yeah. Yep. The, there's an old saying in the publishing industry, the best way to sell your current book is to write another book. It's absolutely true. Yeah. Uh, I mean, with, with, with Kickstarter, for instance, like I would go like people like, how did you get into all these conventions and conferences and stuff? And I was like, well, like everyone was talking about craft. I'm like, I can't talk about craft, but nobody was talking about the business part of it. So I figured if I just pitched these conferences that like I knew Kickstarter, I could come in and talk about X, Y, and Z I'd raised, like I could do the hard cost of breaking a graphic novel or crushing it on Kickstarter or whatever that nobody wanted to talk about. 
because like everyone wants to master Kickstarter. No one wants to train other people to do Kickstarter. If I right. did that, then mm -hmm. I could get invited to conferences yeah. and be on panels. And like, that would boost my, 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 mm -hmm. my like esteem around all of that stuff. But again, it, it's in, in intentionality. Um, yep. So I, uh, yep. I think we are way over time. Intentionality I, is a good place to stop. <laughs> it is because this we are intentionally stopping. <laughs> this conference was done with intentionality. Yes. To promote our book. Uh, Yay, and Nick, book. Thank you so much, uh, Nick, for, oh, for coming pleasure. on and helping us out. But hey, can I drop Monica's a couple links book? into the into the chat? Yeah, please. Okay. Do. Um, I just. Uh, wanted to, I'm just going to copy and paste this into the chat here. Oh, except my cursor is going to disappear. So, yep. That always so, happens. So Monica, how about, I talked about it at the yeah, open. Go ahead. Let's, how about you talk about this book, Monica, a little bit, yeah. just as we leave, go out of here. Yeah. So uh, the book is called Get Your Book Selling on Kickstarter. It's um, currently, so we planned it out to be 21 chapters. As we've been doing the campaign, we've found more things that we want to add, mostly that I want to add, um, because this is really my first uh kickstarter campaign i i did one in like 2011 with just like friends and family but um this is the first like real one for me so there's a ton of stuff that i've learned from this and we're adding that so you can actually see uh all the chapters that we're going to be doing um and some of them are really good like if you were interested in the launch stuff that i was talking ab about at the beginning like that's going to be in the book if you're interested in like you know, we have this thing, the five pillars of a Kickstarter campaign. That's going to be in the book. We're going to talk about the buyer psychology and the psychological triggers thing that we were talking about at the beginning. Um, why is Russell's system so great? And why was I able to recognize it so easily? Well, it's because it's founded in buyer psychology. And Kickstarter has a lot of really unique ways that it uses buyer psychology that uh, retailers don't. And so that's why it's a great opportunity for uh, authors and whoever. Um, yeah, so we got this little rocket ship. <laughs> come, come learn what all this means. You know, I gave you the five B's and you can see it on the page. But if you have more questions, get the book. The book explains it all in real detail. And so this is not, you know, like, this is this is like, probably, um, and we don't write books this long, like most of the books are not this long, but this one, I, I can see it being 250, 300, you know, 350 pages, it's going to be substantial. And it's, it's just going to be really worth it. I think you're going to come away really understanding, um, first of all, Russell's system for launching a Kickstarter, uh, his Kickstarter's launch at 10K um, most of the time now. So uh, 10K and over, I should say. And that's for a novel. Um, and, you know, he's basically given me that system. And now this project is, you know, most likely going to most likely going to hit 10K and probably go over as well. Um, we won't count our chickens before they hatch, but we're on track for that. And so it's like, yeah, like you should get this book if you want to do that. Because I think, you know, Russell's also taken like a failed campaign um, and he's turned it, you know, he's done a little bit of consulting with the person and then they have a successful campaign that raised a third more. Um, and so he's, he's just really great at this stuff. Um, so we hope that you'll, you know, get the book. We hope that you will do our early bird perks as Russell. Russell is clearly telling me to talk about this. So it's a <laughs> Facebook advertising workshop. Um, Facebook advertising is an, um, it, it can be a, an element of your Kickstarter. We're going to use some out. We don't have ads running now, but we'll use a little bit of advertising for our Kickstarter. And so we're going to tell you like, how, how are we doing that for this campaign? Um, and, and I will be the person telling you all this, but Russell's, you know, Moving the moving the lever behind the scenes. <laughs> you, well, you guys are working together surviving. on all this. Yeah, 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 we're working together on all this. Um, but yeah, there's there's a couple of really cool tiers that I personally like. The first one is the hundred dollar tier, which is the Kickstarter sprint with us. You can launch a Kickstarter project in January 2022. Um, 
side by side with Russell and myself. And so we're both launching uh, novel projects um, in January and we're, we will be taking you through the entire process. We'll be recording what we're doing. You'll be able to set up stuff with us. We have the Facebook group is already started. There's already people asking and planning their Kickstarters in the group. We had questions today um, and there are at least 15 people. There will probably be more people who are joining that tier. And it's just, it's just a really great tier. You get so much stuff with it. Um, you can upgrade that tier for $50. You can get Russell's full course you can get it now. Um, so you can start preparing and like getting a handle on Kickstarter before we even like officially start our sprint with us. And then I also think that the consulting tier, which is $500. Yes, it's a, you know, it's an investment. Um, it's a business investment though, because we think you can make, um, more than five hundred dollars on Kickstarter, basically, but, and, and you get the sprint, and you get the course yeah. also, along with three hours of our time. Mm -hmm. Either Monica and my time, neither of us like. We don't do. Well, that. I was gonna say I want. I didn't <laughs> want to say like doing consulting, but like <laughs> we, we just don't, don't offer, offer it regularly. We don't offer consulting yeah. regularly. Like Monica, I think doesn't offer it at all. I offer it very, very uh, sporadically mm -hmm. and like under the radar. Um, so you get not just the sprint and the course and the book, but you get like three hours of our time, which is like a really good deal because you could then like do the sprint. Mm -hmm. You can then like take the course. And yeah. then when you're doing the sprint, you could say, Hey, can you spend an hour looking at our cam this campaign in X, yeah. Y, and Z way? And oh my gosh, that is so valuable. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I mean, to me, that's like to me, this is like the the, the one that mm -hmm. like if I had to tell if you had to say one thing, just because it's so unique. Like I yeah. don't know. Like I want I want an hour of Monica's time. Mm -hmm. Like I can get it, and like I know how valuable it is. And like I want more. I, I, I like I know how valuable it is. I know how valuable the sprint is going to be because like we've been literally answering questions. Right yeah. before we came on about this, I know how valuable my course is because literally someone mm -hmm. this morning they went through me, it, yeah, telling <laughs> me how great it was. Uh, so um, yeah, uh, so all of this sort of combination of stuff, learning about buyer psychology in the course, but also in in the in the the book, the course, and then being able for me to say this or Monica say this is why this is wrong, and this is why this is right, this is what you yeah. should be doing differently, um, is like just so much more valuable because even if you only make $500 the next campaign, which I highly doubt, uh, like, yeah. <laughs> like we're trying to make Kickstarter a thing, a, a piece yeah. of your launch plan forever. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. every time it will be additive to each other. And if you're doing, if you're spending $500 now, like over the course of your Kickstarter career, you might launch 20, 30, 50, 500 campaigns. That's going to be so, so beneficial to you. Yeah. yeah. And you will learn every time that you do it, mm -hmm. especially if you're learning and doing, you know, together with other people who can give you valuable feedback and help you not miss the lessons that you could be learning. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it's really a chance to accelerate your learning. So, you know, you can kind of like, I, I hate to say this, but it's like you can take the way of DIY, like you're going to do it all yourself, or you can get the support you need um, to do this well and to like not have to do like four campaigns before you figure out something like like i would have had to do that myself even you know even being like a pretty good marketer and you know having published a lot but i had russell and so russell helped me avoid like thousand dollar mistakes like all along the way basically mm -hmm. so it's like I, I don't know. Like I personally would like to get support for the thing I'm doing. <laughs> well, and as a person who spent a hundred thousand dollars before, like they started making any money back of that hundred thousand dollars. Like I would absolutely take that time. Like again, especially if to have it laid out for, for yeah. you. Like, yeah. I mean, even if it's not this course, but like some course on marketing and like some support in the way that like we're offering support is going to be like the key. Cause I, mm -hmm. I know because like the keys always came from like masterminds and courses and like Facebook group and like private Facebook groups that like no one else yeah. had access to. And like mm -hmm. all of that stuff were like where all of the good things and all of the good connections because suddenly if you're in the sprint suddenly you're like oh these 16 other people are like real serious and like you know immediately that like they spent 
a not inconsiderable amount of money. So like they have to be serious. And I remember we when I would do the the I mean, both RJ and Krishan were people that I found. And Melissa ran these like builders. And so like three of the people were people that I did marketing with. And the reason that I became friends with them is because like, oh, like you're serious. Like you're yeah. serious yeah. and like you're taking this seriously and you're learning things I'm not and I'm learning things you're not. And you're mm -hmm. learning and like you're they're pulling stuff in together, all together. And and instead of just being in some like freak free group not that they're not great but the problem with the free group is like you never know mm. the quality of the responses like someone <laughs> yeah like some like i am always giving advice on them and it's like one piece of advice that's opposite all of the other advice and i'm like but, right like this is and, at least 20 yeah. times more valuable because none yeah. of these people have ever launched a book so <laughs> right, being in a right. group, oh, it's, yes. it's hard to say that in the group like guys you don't know what you're talking about I mean, there are ways of saying that, but but if you're part of that group, how can you tell which of these different voices is more valuable than the other ones? And it's not always going to be, you know, which person writes their comment most eloquently, you know, and it, it just, yeah, it's just, it's very, very helpful to be, I mean, all those groups that you talked about are, are helpful and they're free. Um, and it just requires a lot of, discernment to figure out which of the voices and which of the advice is is really smart and and which of it how how you can apply it to your own situation like what would be the wise way it's that kind of wisdom that you you only get through um being mentored being apprenticed and you know what this this whole Kickstarter your novel campaign is offering is an opportunity to be mentored and to be apprenticed and to work together with Monica and Russell and 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 benefit from their impact from their in in their insight and their input into uh, your own process personally. I don't know so why you wouldn't take advantage of that. So we're going to say bye to Monica. Uh, Nick, cool. I'd love to just do a little bit of a wrap up to you with you. But, yeah, no uh, problem. Uh, but Monica, I'll see you on the interwebs. And hopefully all, right. all of Thank us will see you me. in the Facebook group. Yes, Thanks for hanging out group. so long with us, yeah. Monica. I appreciate it. <laughs> it's great to meet you. All right. Take care. All right. Wow. So what a day. Got, oh my God. <laughs> Yay. Uh, we, uh, we, we, I, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised. I'm much more amped than I was for the WannaCon. Like, I don't know what it was about like this group, but like the three hours, maybe it's just, I had like four times the caffeine this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my! Um, but but yeah, Nick. I mean, if you'd like to join, uh, I'll 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 uh, I'll uh, give you a, uh, access to the Facebook group if you'd like to uh, for oh, yes. your help today. Uh, Thank then you. you. Maybe maybe you'll see Nick in there also, and uh, he can answer questions about like yep. other things, uh, and 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 probably not Kickstarter, but other book things. He's a very good. He's a good book human to know. Yes. I, I can't help you with Kickstarter. I'm just going to keep pointing you to 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 Russell. So, um, but and and my participation in the Kickstarter group, and I'm sorry, in the Facebook group, uh, is going to be sporadic because I'm actually leaving the country in a couple of days, and I'm oh. going to be completely off of Facebook and media and all things that require electrons uh, for about nice. a week. So nice. I'm really looking forward to that. I'm, I'm going I to come... Cabo at the end of next week. So I get Oh, it. yay. How exciting. Okay. That's great. I, yeah. you know what? I could introduce you to a couple people in Cabo. I actually, my, my dad used to live there for about 11 oh, years, I'm but um, I'm listening. We'll talk later. We'll talk later right. privately. Right. So Nick, <laughs> you, you love to do, uh, you love to do sort of these wrap ups. I'm like, what was the thing you've been listening all day? Like what were the yeah. key takeaways for you? Like, what have you been taking notes on while I was chit-chatting away? Yeah. So um, I actually did uh, miss the the second hour there because I had to go. That's why I wasn't able to be with you all day. I had to go and take care of some things. Um, but, uh, but I'm going to watch that second hour uh, later and take notes on it. But some of the things that just stuck out to me through all three of the hours that I have been here for are the... It just seems like there's so much wealth of experience that we have all just benefited from in these four hours. And there's so much personal experience, which has been turned into practical wisdom.
And this does not happen automatically. Um, there's an, uh, so I've been a teacher for a long time and one of the sort of little sayings or, or jokes or whatever in the teaching world is, um, you know, this young teacher, uh, you know, a promotion uh, comes up and this young teacher is promoted over an old teacher and the old teacher is upset and he goes to the administration and says, you know, I've been teaching here for 20 years and I've, and he's only been here for four years. And why does he get promoted over me? And the administrator says, well, we're promoting him because he has four years of experience. You have one year of experience 20 times. And so we've got to avoid that trap of being the writer who has one Kickstarter worth of experience five times. And no wonder it keeps failing because you're not learning from it. And so there's there's two levels here that we're that we're learning on in in this four hour mini conference that we've just had. The first level is super helpful, and that's just take notes on what everybody has said, and and it's just all the the wisdom and the insight and the understanding and and like how to like fit all the pieces together. What even are all the pieces? Just having all of the 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 different pieces spread out on the 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 table so to speak so that we can just see them all and then see how they've been put together at different times that's one level the next level the deeper level of learning that i don't want you guys to miss is how all of our guests they all started out uh, inexperienced they all started out not knowing a thing about these things that they're all expert on and pay attention to how they got to where they are. It's because they, um, when they tried to do things, they actually took notes on what they were doing and how it worked out. They they debriefed uh, them themselves and they debriefed with other people who had more experience. Um, and then when they went to do it a second time, they didn't do the same thing over and over again. And they didn't just find uh, another uh, guru to copy an entire um you know to copy an entire template without changing it again everyone who's who we've talked to today was able to uh give specific examples but they were all telling us about principles that we need to understand and in order for you to move from seeing like all this data, having the experience that you've had already and trying to market your book, the way to learn from that is to uh, to not just charge blindly onto the next thing, but take some time and think through what it is that has worked well and what hasn't worked. And, and if you're not clear on that, you've got to talk to someone who is clear. Uh, you've you've got to take advantage of the the mentoring and the um, the apprenticeship that Russell and Monica are offering you, almost as like an ancillary benefit of this. Oh, for goodness sake, buy the book! But but take advantage of the time that they're offering you to go through this sprint with them, uh, with their feedback, their input. And and to to take advantage of the coaching opportunities they're offering you, um, because I coach all the time, but I can't help you with this. Like you can you can schedule a coaching session with me you know, with one click on my website, and if you start asking me about how to launch your book on Kickstarter, I'm just going to tell you to to talk to Russell and 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 Monica and to buy this book and take Russell's course. That's what I'm going to tell you. So I do this coaching all the time and they don't. This is an opportunity I don't want you to miss. So let me ask you a question and thank you for that. Uh, let me ask you a question, uh, uh, Nick. You're not a marketing guy. You're I'm a book not. guy. Yes. Does it seem like <laughs> after listening to three of the four hours, does this all seem doable? Like, does this seem like a thing that like is less scary to you than it did, did four hours ago? So uh I'm going to tell you something that I have not talked about publicly on my blog or anything like that. Uh, so when I was, feels like a, another life before so many other things happened, uh, I wanted to be a novelist. And that dream has gotten lost over the past, oh my goodness, 30, 
three years. And um, I've done many other worthwhile things in my life and I have not published a novel. And um, I'm not gonna tell the story right now, but there is a story to be told here about how I sat down and started actually writing my novel. And, uh, and you feature in that story, Russell. Um, but uh, uh, so I've had this in the back of my mind um, uh, as, as you know, we were planning this, I was thinking about my clients, but I was also thinking about myself. And so uh, just hearing all these things and, and all these notes that I've, I've taken for myself. Um, yeah, sure. There are notes for, for my clients and, and just, you know, for my own sake, but uh, some of these things I'm laying out my own, uh, my own ideas for my own book launch. And uh, it's going to be on Kickstarter. And I was, I had not made that decision until this four hour time. So oh, this funny. has actually been very personally uh, encouraging for me. So uh, I am, I personally am sold on launching my book on Kickstarter. Now oh, I need to finish writing the book first, um, which is kind of funny. You know, I feel like the, the, you know, the cobbler who's going shoeless, you know, to another cobbler, you know, and saying, yeah, I'm a book coach. I'm a writing coach. Let's talk. I need another coach to coach me, you know, but, um, but yeah, so that's, that's what's happening. So uh, I couldn't be more excited uh, about all the stuff that you guys have shared. Um, well, I know Katrina believe, as well as professionally. Katrina mm -hmm. believes in you and I believe in you too, Nick. I can't Yay, wait, thank I can't you, wait Katrina. To see, <laughs> I can't wait to see the, how the campaign goes and, uh, and, and what your book is like. And I think on that note, that's a wonderful note to end on and just say, I hope uh, you check out kickstartyournovel.com find me on the interwebs go to kickstartyournovel.com forward slash youtube and find all of the other material that we've done and everything we're going to launch for this campaign but i do hope to see you behind the backer wall and nick Yay. want to say bye. take care man it's been an honor being here with you thanks for everything day. thanks Have everybody thanks for tuning in everyone